I'm Jim Sayers. I'm a hydrologist at Yale University, and I'm a member of the Committee on Independent Scientific Review of Everglades Restoration Progress. Um, looking out in the crowd now, it's a bit of a crowd. It's a pleasure seeing a lot of you here in person. Um, it's been a long haul since we've gathered together um, in reality. The last time, the last round of the CISRP committee, we did all this virtually. So it's good to have everyone in the room. So we're working now on the 10th biennial review of CISRP. And today's assembly is the second of five meetings in this cycle. Uh, the committee intends to complete its review in uh, fall 2024. So we have a lot to do and a lot to learn from all of you. Uh, within that vein of learning, um, I'd like to uh, extend a special thanks to the Miccosukee tribe and in particular, um, uh, Chairman Cypress and Michael Frank for leading a small group of our committee on a tour of water conservation area 3A yesterday and meeting with uh, a number of Seminole staff. Before I introduce today's first session, I'd like to give the committee an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, most of us are here in person. I think we have a few joining virtually. Um, and so maybe Matt, we'll start with you and go around the room. Sure, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Harwell. I'm a landscape ecologist. Good morning, everybody. I'm Margaret Guitar. I'm Professor of Agricultural and Biological Engineering at Purdue University, work on water resources. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Hopkins. I'm a professor in the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation at Virginia Tech, uh, and my expertise is in ecotoxicology and wildlife physiology. Good morning. My name is Tracy Quirk, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences at LSU, and I'm a coastal wetland ecologist. Good morning, my name is Wendy Graham. I'm director of the University of Florida Water Institute, and I'm a hydrologist. I'm John Calloway. I'm at the University of San Francisco, a wetland plant and soil ecologist. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Johnson, study director with the National Academy of Sciences. Good morning, I'm Jeff Walters. I'm in the Department of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. I'm a behavioral ecologist, and, and I've worked a lot with endangered birds. <laughs> Hi there, my name's Helen Regan. I'm a professor in the Evolution, Ecology and Organismal Biology Department at University of California, Riverside, and I'm an ecological modeler. Uh, good morning, I'm Charlie Driscoll. I'm uh, an environmental engineer in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Syracuse University. Uh, good morning, my name's Dave Wegner. I work with Wolpert Engineering. Um, my expertise, I guess, if I have one, it's working on complex ecosystem management and particularly through adaptive management. Morning, my name is Marla Emery and I am a retired research re geographer for the United States Forest Service, currently a scientific advisor to the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research and I'm a specialist in human environment interactions. Um, I'm Emily Bermudez. I'm a senior program assistant at the National Academies of Sciences. I think we have a few people virtually. I'm Al Steinman, a research professor at the Annis Water Resources Institute at Grand Valley State University. Philip Dixon. I'm an ecological statistician in the statistics department at Iowa State University. And for those associated with Norway, my son and daughter, and we are now in Oslo. Good morning, everyone. I'm Casey Brown, and I'm a professor of hydrology and water resources systems analysis at the University of Massachusetts. Okay, thanks, everyone. So today we have three sessions. Uh, the first session, um, we're going to learn more about combined operations plan and the status of its performance. Then we're going to talk about SERP-related and SERP-adjacent climate change science. And we'll finish up with SERP adaptive management and science to inform decision-making. Um, each session, we'll start off with uh, at least one speaker. Um, sometimes they'll be virtual, sometimes they'll be here. Um, and then we'll end with uh, each session with a committee Q&A. 
Uh, we'll close the day with public comments. Um, if there are members of the, of the public out there who would like to address the committee in three minutes or left, less, uh, there's a sign up sheet, I think outside um, that you should sign up for. And Stephanie, there's something about free parking. Well, there's discounted parking. So <laughs> if, instead of $24, it's $5 but you have to bring your ticket to the front desk and tell them you're with the meeting. And I think you pay for it there and they can get that. So make sure you do that. Sometimes there's a very long line at the checkout. So try to hit them at a calm window. Thank you. Okay, so we'll get started now. And to lead off the first session, uh, Malus and Masudi will provide an overview of the combined operations plan. And I think this is virtual. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Just want to do, do a sound check. And Emily, you'll be um, running the slides from down there. Maybe there's a delay on my part because I'm virtual. So she's uh, pulling that up. Good morning, everybody. My name's Melissa Nasuti. I'm a biologist with the Army Corps of Engineers in the Jacksonville District. Um, and I'm just going to provide a brief overview of the combined operational plan or COP. And then the remaining presenters um, in our session today will provide an overview of monitoring results um, to address hydrological, ecological, and water quality performance of the current water control plan uh, for the Water Conservation Area 3, Everglades National Park, and the South Dade Conveyance System. Next slide, please. So some, some project background first. So the Central and Southern Florida Project, or CNSF project, was authorized to function as a multi-purpose water management system the congressionally authorized purposes include flood control, water supply, regional groundwater control, prevention of saltwater intrusion, enhancement of fish and wildlife, and recreation. However, to improve hydrologic conditions in Everglades National Park, the southern portion of that project was subsequently altered through the authorization of the Modified Water Deliveries Project and the C-111 South Day Project. The Modified Water Deliveries Project was designed to provide a system of water deliveries to the park through Shark River Slough, and the C-111 South Day Project was designed to control seepage out of the park and to reduce damaging freshwater discharges to Manatee Bay and Barn Sound while also maintaining flood protection for agricultural lands located east of the C-111 Canal. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the combined operational plan was basically to define operations for the constructed features of the modified water deliveries in C-111 South Dade projects. Um, which are foundation projects for the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. And a map of the project features is shown on the right hand side of the slide. So what COP does is it redistributes the existing water budget and water conservation area three and Everglades National Park to meet the project projects objectives and constraints. Development of COP was informed by a series of incremental field tests that incrementally raised the maximum operating limit in the L29 canal along Tamiami Trail, which allows you to move more water south. And uh, environmental impact statement was written to support COP and COP was implemented in 2020 and it serves as the current water control plan for the project area, and it replaced the prior water control plan that was developed in, in 2012. Next slide, please. 
So objectives considered during the development of COP are listed um, on this slide, um, but just very briefly, um, the objectives include taking steps to restore natural hydrologic conditions in the park, maximizing progress toward restoring hydrologic conditions in Taylor Slough, the Rocky Glades, and the Eastern Panhandle of the park, protecting the ecological values associated with those areas, minimizing damaging freshwater flows to Manatee Bay and Barn Sound through S197, which is a water management control structure at the bottom of the system. And then it also included consideration of, of cultural value and tribal interests within the project area. Next slide. Several operational constraints were also considered during the development of COP, which included the project purposes of the CNSF project. Um, we also had to maintain the upper limit of the regulation schedule for water conservation area three, known as zone A. And zone A basically um, defines the stage at which releases are made from water conservation area three for the purpose of flood control. And then we couldn't raise the maximum operating limit in the L29 canal more than 8.5 feet, given that that was the limit identified in the original project authorization um, for which really COP was developed. Um, and then lastly, we also had to maintain authorized levels of flood mitigation for eight and a half square mile area and flood damage reduction for the C-111 South Dade Basin, which are shown as insets on the right-hand side of the slide. These areas are often affected based on um, the, the amount of water within the park. Next slide. So several of the presenters today will be going over uh, performance results. So I have two slides in this presentation just to sort of um, give you an overview of what was expected. Um, so this slide describes the expected benefits of COP as documented in the final environmental impact statement. So the two graphics on the lower right hand of the screen show the difference in average annual hydro period and average annual stage as a result of implementing the water control plan relative to the baseline conditions that were assumed during planning. And really the, the, the coloration on the graphics just shows areas that were expected to be a little bit wetter and areas that were expected to be a little bit drier with gray representing relatively no change. But the takeaway from this slide is that the, the modeling produced to support COP showed an expected increase of inflow to the park, um, as well as an increase in the proportion of water that enters the park east of S333, um, which is a water control structure on Tamiami Trail. So an increase in the proportion of water that enters Northeast Shark River Slough in particular within the park. Next slide. And then also, um, as I said early in the presentation to align with the project objectives, um, we wanted to reduce discharges to Manatee Bay and Barn Sound, as well as increase flows to Taylor Slough. Next slide, please. So the final environmental impact statement that supported that supports um, the current water control plan includes an adaptive management and monitoring plan. And that identifies monitoring information needed to document progress towards the project's goals and objectives, as well as uncertainties. And there are four components of the adaptive management um, and monitoring plan, which are listed on the slide. Um, and one thing that the Adaptive Management and Monitoring Plan also does is it outlines a, a structure um, for which feedback can be provided. And the number of forums um, that we use to gain feedback from various members of the public as well as interagency staff um, are listed there. So we largely try to utilize existing forums for discussions related to um, water management 
operations and gain feedback on a day-to-day -day basis or weekly basis. Next slide, please. And then um, the adaptive management and monitoring plan also um, committed that the core, the water management district and the Everglade, Everglades National Park would produce a biennial report. And that biennial report um, was just released in early 2023 with a poster presentation presented at GEAR. And the intent of that report is to provide a summary of operations monitoring the results and the status of the system to basically try and ask the question, is COP achieving its project objectives and are adjustments recommended? Next slide. So the presenters today are going to touch base on some of the information that's seen within the report. And you'll see this slide through some of their presentations as well, but just to basically it's included in the introduction for this session because it sort of provides the framework for how the biennial report was written. So we started by trying to understand currently what the context of the system was. Was it above average, below average in terms of rainfall? We then evaluated um, hydrologic metrics and then how those hydrologic metrics could have potential ecological effects on the system. Next slide. And then I said that the intent of the COP biennial report was to basically ask that fundamental question, is COP working as expected and are there recommendations? So I think in short, the poster and the report um, states that yes, COP is working in terms of improving the volume of water sent to Everglades National Park, but we did have some recommendations from this first report. Um, those are listed here on the slide as sort of a bottom line up front, but three that I want to touch base on are that operations should continue to be flexible um, to accommodate ongoing construction contracts, as well as coordination should continue to occur with water managers um, to inform how to operate the system based on current system conditions. What came out of the report also was that there was some potential concerns about um, Northern Water Conservation Area 3A and in particular stages um, in supporting the Alligator Alley North Colony, which is a large wading bird colony in Northern Water Conservation Area 3, what the potential effects of COP are on wading birds in particular in that area. And then we should continue to have discussions on how you prioritize flow to the park or the east-west spatial distribution, um, meaning how much of that flow should be prioritized to Northeast Shark River Slough, um, east of the L67 Extension Canal, and how much should be prioritized west um, when system conditions need it. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Dan to go over um, hydrologic effects. Good morning, Mike and uh, Emily. Can you confirm my audio is coming through clear? Yes, it's coming through. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, good morning. Yeah, I'm Dan Crawford. I am uh, Everglades team lead and senior water resources engineer for our hydrology and hydrologic engineering branch in Jacksonville for the Corps of Engineers. Next slide. So as Melissa Melissa alluded to, the, the the development of the combined operational plan was developed over multiple years, and we took uh, adaptive management approach in terms of of kind of phased implementation. Our goal was trying to, as construction components of the modified water deliveries and C111 projects were completed, we wanted to accrue interim benefits along the way. And so that was the goal of our incremental field test between 2015 and 2020. Uh, I just include this, this slide as, as one of the challenges that we realized with our biennial report is as you can see, we had phase increments, increment one, increment 1.1, 1 1.2, and increment two that were on the order of 
uh, 12 to 18 months each in duration. But you'll see intermittently with those planned normal operations. We also had curveballs thrown to us through Mother Nature, uh, through tropical events and hurricanes that led us to have unseasonal high water and have to take emergency operations within the system. And so the inclusion of those atypical events and abnormal operations within the the pre-COP period of record makes it more of a challenge to isolate the effects of implementation of the COP in 2020 from some of the antecedent conditions prior to that, because we moved, we would move a lot more water under these emergencies than we would have under our quote unquote normal operation. And then as par for the course, of course, after we implemented COP, we promptly experienced tropical storm Ada, which set um, record high water levels in our water conservation areas and Everglades National Park, uh, which of course had nothing to do with our, our underlying COP operations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just kind of the big picture, Melissa touched on it, but the, the key changes with the combined operating plan, you can see in the top left panel was the change to the conservation area 3A regulation schedule where we implemented the TMME trail flow formula. So when water levels are below the seasonal range of nine and a half to 10 and a half feet and DVD, we have a formula that uh, aims to deliver water to Everglades National Park based on uh, upstream consideration of water levels, rainfall, evapotranspiration, and recent flow time series in order to kind of mimic a pre-drainage pre -drainage condition to Everglades National Park based on the the water budget that we have at this point in time prior to implementing all of the CERT projects. Uh, so just along, orient yourself along Tamimi Trail, that 20 mile section from S12 Alpha over to the 356 pump station. That's what I'll, that's the area of inflows to Everglades National Park that I'll touch on on the next couple of slides. Um, just highlighting that the big, Big arrow indicating the inflows into the eastern side of Shark River Slough in Everglades National Park. That as we put more and more water into the eastern side of Shark River Slough, we have to be cognizant of our flood risk management obligations along the eastern flank of Everglades National Park, which includes the eight and a half square mile area Las Palmas community, as well as the southern C111 project system. Uh, our goal in COP and, and to be superseded in future SERP implementation is to maximize deliveries into Everglades National Park so that the water can spill over the, the rocky glades and have an overland flow connection to Taylor Slough. So as COP is a stepping stone to SERP, one of the things COP is able to do is increase the surface water flow deliveries to Taylor Slough and have intermittent periods of connectivity between Shark River Slough and Taylor Slough across that rocky glades area. Next slide, please. So just to orient you to this table, this is, is, is total water deliveries into Everglades National Park uh, going back to the prior regulation schedule prior to COP, so the ERTP schedule in 2012. Uh, everything is color coded by the governing operational regime from the core water control plan and the items that are not black that are highlighted indicated indicate the conditions where we were operating under those, those temporary or emergency deviations. Uh, I'll just highlight, we, we do see the, the long-term trend of increasing deliveries to Everglades, Everglades National Park as we went through the progression of the Mod Waters incremental field test and into implementation of COP in 2020, which is the, the pink rose at the, at the bottom of the table. Uh, again, it's hard to isolate the effects uh, due to the the significant hydrologic variability and the emergency deviations we had prior to COP. But you can see the long-term trend that we are achieving the benefits that we expected in COP, which is you know more than 30% of an increase in total flow volumes to Everglades National Park on an average annual basis. Of this period of record, the, the three of the highest four years have been experienced since we implemented COP and the one year back in 2017, where we also had similar high magnitude flows to the park, that was a, a byproduct of a very extreme wet season and Hurricane Irma hitting in September. So we were operating under uh, flood fighting mode for the majority of that year. And so those operations are, are more representative of COP than they are of what the, the incremental 
permit 1.2 field test that was in place at that point in time. Uh, one of the key things with COP uh, that's different from those earlier years is, is we also have been able to, while delivering all this water to Everglades National Park, we're able to keep it in Everglades National Park. And we haven't had to open the structure on the east side of Shark River Slough to have emergency bypass of that water down to South Dade and out to Barnstown through the S197 structure at the bottom of the system. Uh, next slide. Uh, zooming in only and looking at the same graphic, same format, but only looking at the eastern side of Shark River Slough, you again, you see the much the marked increase in annual deliveries to Northeast Shark River Slough as we've been able to gradually re remove the canal, L29 canal constraints at the northern end of Northeast Shark River Slough. Uh, I will highlight the little carrot, sig carrot symbols that are indicated under the the COP period, those are periods where because of the direct connectivity of groundwater between Northeast Shark River Slough and the adjacent eight and a half per mile area, federal flood mitigation projects, those are the periods where we actually had to scale back inflows into Northeast Shark River Slough because of downstream flooding concerns. Uh, you can see those are very prevalent um, in 2020 and 2021. I'll touch on it in a couple slides. One of the major changes that we've seen is working with our state partners at the South Florida Water Management District. We've been able to effectively alleviate that constraint uh, through working um, them on the first increment and in partnership under SERP for a second increment to build a seepage cutoff wall around the perimeter of eight and a half square mile area. And you'll see that since that wall was effectively completed in about July of 2022, that we have not had any reason to have to dial back those inflows to the park. And so we expect to continue to set uh, maximum annual amounts of delivery into the northeastern side of Shark River Slough as we continue to move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, the, these graphics just indicate our tracking of the Tamiami Trail flow formula. Again, when we're above the top of our regulation schedule, we maximize deliveries out of Conservation Area 3 to Everglades National Park, subject to only the downstream constraints, uh, either seasonal closures of the S12 Alpha Bravo, the L29 canal constraint of 8.5 that Melissa alluded to, or the 8.5 square mile area. You see the times when we've been below schedule, we have the blue line, which tracks the, the weekly Tamiami Trail flow targets. And what you see here is this nice seasonal variability, wet season, dry season patterning consistent with the, the pre-drainage Everglades that we've, we've realized the, the one challenge, and I know Raj will touch on it uh, briefly later on, is that we have seen that when we get to lower water levels in Conservation Area 3A at the, the, the nadirs of these tracker diagrams, you'll see we've had challenges with being able to deliver the full volume that the TMME trail flow formula would estimate. And that's strictly because of limitations with, with gravity and the resistance of the, the downstream marsh in Everglades National Park. And the graphic on the right, again, it's, it's difficult to account for the effects of some of these deviations. But one, one way we included it in the COP biannual report is looked at the Unit the, the unit equivalency of how much water went to Shark River Slough as a function of rainfall. Uh, so rainfall is on the, the x-axis, total volume to Everglades National Parks on the vertical axis. And what you see is that per unit rainfall, we've consistently been able to deliver on the order of 300 to 400,000 acre feet of additional, four, three, three to 400,000 acre feet of additional flow to Everglades National Park on an annual basis for the three years since we implemented the, the COP in 2020. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the key uncertainties that we identified in the, the development of the COP water control plan was the effects of raising water levels in the L29 canal and how that would affect both the stability of the Tamiami Trail roadway and the downstream flood mitigation requirements for the eight and a half per mile area. Next slide, please. And in what I would characterize as a, a very highly effective partnership between the core of the South Florida Water Management District, the National Park Service, and the Florida Department of Transportation, we developed a, a monitoring plan along this section of roadway, which uh, if, you've, if you've been out there for some of the, the pr prior returning panelists, that section of roadway is being reconstructed to accommodate 
uh, roadway standards for FDOT and to allow full maximum water levels that we want in Everglades National Park under the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. But in the interim, before those roadway modifications are completed, the existing roadway has limitations, uh, only allowing up to eight and a half feet. Our water control plan for COP only allowed us to, to maintain those water levels above 8.3 for 90 days per year because of concerns about the integrity of the roadway and the capillary action effects of the groundwater from the adjacent canal. So we had an extensive monitoring plan that's been worked in partnership with the Park Service. Park Service actually installed soil moisture probes and piezometers along the roadway at, at four different transects. The park is collecting that data for us, and we're actively communicating that data with Florida Department of Transportation. And in the bottom right is the success story, is, is how, many year, how many days per year per water year from May to April that we've been able to maintain the L29 Canal above that 8.3 to 8.5 range. And so since we implemented COP, in water year 21, you see we almost experienced 150 days, and in all years, we've exceeded 120 days. Uh, we actually were able, through this monitoring program, to get written concurrence from the Florida Department of Transportation to permanently change the COP water control plan to allow us to hold these water levels at these higher end of the range for up to four months per year. Again, when the completion of the roadway is done, implementation of the, the SERP will allow us to raise those water levels above eight and a half feet all the way up to 9.7. Next slide, please. And, and the other piece is the eight and a half square mile area. And again, I highlight that as we put more water into the eastern side of Shark River Slough, we have a, a perimeter levee and inter internal pump station and canal for the eight and a half square mile area. As we increase water levels in the park, we get more groundwater seepage under that levee because the, the regional groundwater flow direction in this area is, is easterly. And so in the water management district, seeing some of those limitations on flows into Everglades National Park under COP, they proactively embarked on constructing of a, a, a 60 foot deep perimeter cutoff wall around that southwest quadrant of eight and a half square mile area which was our highest vulnerable area with respect to flood mitigation. So that wall, 2.3 miles, was uh, constructed between April 2021 and December of 2022, was functionally complete in July of 2022. Again, since that time, we've not had any need to dial back our inflows to the northeastern side of Shark River Sloop. And then in a continuing partnership under SERP, uh, the SEP new water phase is actually going to extend that wall an additional five miles. The, the black portion of the line will complete the perimeter cutoff wall within that levee all the way to the L31 North levee. And that work started December of last year and is expected to be completed in November of 2024. And that completion of that work will facilitate further increase in flows and water levels under the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. Next slide. Um, one of the things we want to be very clear on is, is as what's next. Uh, so COP was implemented in 2020. Uh, we plan the core and the water management district could plan to continue our, our paradigm shift of trying to maximize ecosystem benefits as we continue construction of the Everglades restoration plan components, uh, notably the central Everglades planning project. Uh, so at, we've actually embarked on our next operational planning study to look at SEP operations, increment one. We expect that work to be completed in late 2025 or early 2026. Uh, our goal is to go from the, the system you see at the left, which is what was represented in the COP in 2020, to the system at the right, which is full completion of the Central Everglades planning project, including the Blue Shanty Flowway and the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir in 2030. The first increment of that is the SEP increment one effort starting in starting this year, continuing through 2025. Uh, that is, it's, it's different from COP. It's not COP 2.0. It is indeed step 1.0 because we are working with a different set of infrastructure that is being completed under the state federal partnership to implement SERP, whereas the COP project represents infrastructure that was completed under the pre-SERP foundational projects for modified water deliveries in C-111 South Dade. Next slide. 
Uh, and this is our, our current plan for progression of those operations under SEP. Our, our first increment, again, started this year. That's an opportunity to, uh, to immediately raise water levels in northeastern Shark River Slough when the National Park Service's roadway modification project is completed in 2025. It's an opportunity to incorporate the, the new inflows to the system from the, the LACO system operating manual that the Corps expects to implement at the end of this year or very early in 2024, and to incorporate all of the lessons we've learned from the COP implementation, as Melissa alluded to. Uh, to immediately follow, we'll have completion of the SEP North features that will redistribute water into the northern northwest corner of Conservation Area 3A, and the Blue Shanty Flowway will be completed. Uh, that's another stepping stone opportunity to relook at the water control plan and realize more benefits. And then in or around 2030 with completion of the EA reservoir, uh, we'll plan to do another relook at system-wide operations to include linkages between Lake Okeechobee and the greater Everglades all the way down to Florida Bay. And with that, I would like to pass it my, on to my colleague Raj Padel at Everglades National Park to provide some of their observations immediately downstream of our COP water control plan. The microphone's on the floor. So good morning, uh, I'm Rajendra Podel. Uh, I'm a hydrologist modeler, uh, South Florida uh, Natural Resource Center, National Park Service. So I'm going to continue today the hydrologic performance of combined operation plan. And uh, Dan already touched on uh, volume and distribution of the flows. So I will pretty much focus on the performance measures today. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, Melissa, let me touch about the strategy for accessing the COP performance, but I'll go quickly here. So, we are looking at the different time frame and uh, evaluating this observation data. The COP implemented in September 2020. So, we look at the three you know, water years data. Water years mean it starts from uh, uh, May 1 and ends in April 30th. So we have a three years data and the COP biennial report doesn't have that because we recently updated water year 2023. So the, we also compare with the real world baseline that uh, includes water year data from 2002 to 2015 and also separately compares with uh, modified water deliveries, the incremental testing period, uh, 16 to 20 and also compare with uh, uh, COP paper alternative. That was our expectation and that was modeled during the planning process. So we compare with that too. Next slide, please. So there are several performance measures. So I'm going to focus on these four highlighted. Those are related to hydrology. And at the end, I will touch a little bit about the near cost forecasting as well. Next slide. So uh, the first one is inundation duration. So inundation duration was uh, expressed as a discontinuous hydro period. So the hydro period means, so number of days water labels uh, above ground uh, in a year. So here we use water year. So this map shows uh, discontinuous hydro period that developed using uh, Eden uh, observed data. And the left-hand side figure shows the median hydro period for the baseline and the uh, race trees for uh, individual water year uh, after COP implementation. So in general, what we saw is, so there is a, uh, you know, uh, increased hydro period in uh, uh, Northeast Arc River Slough and Taylor Slough of Everglades National Park. As Dan mentioned, like uh, there is an increased flow volume uh, in that area that raised the hydro period uh, in, in uh, Everglades National Park. And those are pretty much consistent with our COP expectation. And we also see some reduction in hydro period 
uh, in water conservation at 3.8. So we can look at more, uh, more closely in a different map. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, these are the hydrocreate difference uh, in its wa water year after COP implementation uh, that's compared to the baseline. Uh, and you can see the red color, which is drier than the baseline and uh, uh, blue, uh, which is wetter than the baseline. Uh, in the ENP there, you can see not the sharp river slough, it's, uh, it's more blue color there. Uh, and uh, uh, you see some red color there in the water conservation area three years. So we see your reduction in, in, in uh, uh, hydro period there. So there is also interannual variability uh, in these three years. Uh, in water year 2022, uh, we saw no reduction in hydro period, particularly in Western Mall Priory, up uh, Everglades National Park, and also uh, Northeastern region of water conservation area 3A. We did not see much change uh, uh, in southern and southeastern area of water conservation at 3A, uh, Northeast South River Slough, and some part of the water conservation area 3B as well, uh, because these areas were characterized by a uh, longer hydro period even uh, before the implementation of COP. But we see a little bit, you know, blue color there in the uh, northern boundary of the water conservation area 3A. So. Uh, in that area, some supportive flows that directed to water conservation at 3A uh, of, uh, from north that helped to uh, make this area a little bit wetter than the baseline. Next slide, please. So this uh, figure compares the uh, uh, hydro period uh, for different time frame. This also includes the comparison with the model output data uh, that's the alt q run uh, and also incremental testing period uh, in in multiple locations of the water conservation area 3a so i would like to point a few things here first of all in northwest uh, water conservation area 3a we saw uh, longer hydro periods there compared to the baseline uh, but in the eastern side of the water conservation at 3a uh, in, in northeastern side uh, we see very short hydro period there in water uh, water year 2022, but uh, those are pretty much in line with the baseline in water year 2021 and 2023. And we didn't see uh, big impacts uh, in uh, all the restations. As I mentioned before, those areas were already uh, have a longer hydro period. So we see uh, the very marginal effect there. Next slide, please. So we also look at the frequency of duration of dry down events. So this is a, a station, uh, Gates, um, Northeast South River Slough. And uh, we compare this uh, dry down events for all these different time periods. Dry down events, I mean, this is a distinct event when the water levels are below ground and for per day or a more consecutive days. So I would like to focus on those two columns there. Let's so look at the dry down events per year and also the duration. So if you compare with the baseline in the COP, we could, we could see it's you know decreased dry down events and also the duration, but we have just three years of data. Uh, so it may not be very meaningful for this comparison, but yeah, just one dry down event. Uh, we saw that some improvement in the COP period. Next slide, please. So cumulative drought intensity uh, was used to evaluate the soil oxidation potential and uh, it was expressed using an index. And that index was calculated at the sum of the below ground water depths uh, during each day of dry down over water year. So the unit is four days. You can see in the upper panel, you can see uh, soil oxidation index. The left, the most left one is the median index for the baseline period and for individual water year. And these regions are, uh, we see the very similar pattern with like a, a hydro period here. Uh, you see the changes in the Everglades National Park compared to the baseline. So less red there. Uh, so 
the bottom panel uh, shows the difference between individual water year and the baseline. So we can clearly see the differences. The blue color is lower than the baseline period and the red is higher values than the baseline. So you can see there is a reduction in oxidation potential, mostly in uh, Everglades National Park, but we also saw some uh, uh, increase uh, in uh, oxidation potential in water conservation area uh, 3A. So next slide, please. So this figure compares soil oxidation potential uh, in some of the gauges of Everglades National Park. Uh, and uh, so I would like to point a few things here. So what we saw uh, generally in this uh, COP water years, the results are very consistent with our expectation when you compare with this uh, model output. And we also saw a large reduction in areas where there was already high oxidation potential during the baseline. And we also saw some very small or very marginal changes in areas where there was oxidation potential was low. Next slide, please. So tree island conditions was represented also by the discontinuous hydro period. So this figure shows the distributions of the hydro period uh, for tree islands in water conservation area three and Everglades National Park. So you can see at the bottom of the figure, that's the metric we use a percent of island that is greater than 10 percent of the period of record. We use a yearly, so 36.5 days. So that compares the, you know, the inundation of these three islands. So when you look at these results, uh, water year 22 and 23, they are pretty much compared with, with Alt-Q and also very close to baseline. Uh, but we see the big difference here in water year 2021. And so uh, there was a, a longer hydro period uh, in a more proportion of the three islands there. So that's because of the Ada uh, tropical storm. You could see the difference between not water conservation area three and ENP as well. ENP, they have a shorter hydro period three islands compared to uh, the water conservation area three. Next slide, please. So not all the three islands have the same level of inundation. So we categorize these three islands in three different groups using 1992 to 2020 data. We use a cluster analysis and separated them uh, in dry, intermediate, and wet islands in three different compartments, water conservation at 3A, 3B, and Everglades National Park. What you observe here is really the impacts is uh, a higher in particularly in intermediate and wet island relative to uh, to dry island. So uh, you barely see any changes there in, in, in the Everglades National Park um, uh, tree islands. Only we see some impacts there in water year 2021. Next slide, please. So, uh, so the near cost modeling. So we, we use uh, near cost um, modeling output as an input uh, in, in ecosystem based management calls. Uh, it's conducted weekly and bi weekly uh, for water management recommendations. And those recommendations are not binding, but we have found very useful and to look at these conditions and the chances where we will remain in, in coming, coming months. So we use our forecast tool and it's a hydrologic and multi-species management tool. And this simulates near-term water level uh, using the precipitation forecast. So this is a very versatile tool and can be initialized with uh, observed EDIN uh, data or uh, output from the regional simulation model. Next slide, please. So here is an example of the near cost modeling uh, we use. So, uh, so here we use Alt-Q, that's a COP preferred alternative, uh, water levels and uh, forecasted for six months using NOAA's uh, Climate Prediction Center's uh, precipitation forecast data. And these data are regularly updated. We update at the beginning of every month. So in the left-hand side figure, you can see the, the uh, water conservation at 3A. We have a three gauge average there. 
The black line represents the observed data, the desk line, which is a regulation schedule, and those five color line are the water label uh, percentiles. So there is a criteria. EBM recommends like a tree island, that criteria, which is a 10.3 feet. So that label should remain below uh, 10.8 feet at the peak of the wet season uh, to reduce for the degradation of the tree island vegetation by flooding. So we look at our position. Currently, we are at 50 percentile there. We we'll look at the position and also uh, uh, look at the chances of meeting that target. And that has been helpful for the water managers to, to understand and, uh, and the chances what, what's happening in the future. So, so the second is uh, uh, another example for the water conservation area too. So we, we look at in a multiple compartment and multiple stations. So uh, uh, that's the way uh, we, we we have been utilizing the uh, near cost uh, uh, modeling output. So this is my last slide. So uh, I would like to turn it over to Andrea Atkinson for the ecological PMs. Thanks, Raj. Um, my name is Andrea Atkinson. I'm a quantitative ecologist with the National Park Service South Florida Natural Resources Center. Um, I've worked on the COP Adaptive Management and Monitoring Plan, as well as the Recovery Executive Committee and team lead for BBC. -er. Um, the slides should just continue from Raj's slides. Okay. I'm gonna be talking about the ecological performance measures for COP as a big picture um, understanding. Basically, we have less than two years of COP implementation. So expecting to see an ecological response is really, really, really early. Um, but that being said, we decided to give it a try. So we're looking at, um, you know, Raj covered what was happening in terms of hydrology effects in the uh, marshes. And I'm gonna be looking at what uh, effects we're starting to see with the birds, the fish and the vegetation. Next slide. Um, so we have 12 performance measures and the three I'm gonna be focusing on uh, with actual ecological data is the slew vegetation suitability, wood storks and wading birds and freshwater fish. Next slide. Um, so we have a project uh, uh, basically conducted by FIU, Florida International University, uh, where there's vegetation monitoring at 65 sites in Northeast Shark River Slough. Um, and what they did at each of these sites while they were collecting the vegetation data is they also collected water depths. And then you can use Eden to calculate what the hydro period and water depth should, history should be at that site by using, uh, you know, correlating it up with Eden. Um, and extracting uh, and, and using that to extract the hydrology. Uh, we, really in order to be able to see the differences, you have to go back into the incremental testing period. So you saw in Dan Crawford's talks where we were actually increasing the water volume and turning it on and turning it off and so forth during the incremental testing period from 2015 on through 2020. Um, and uh, so if you look back through that time period and into the uh, early COP years, we are seeing an increase in average water depth at these sites. And we're also seeing an increase in the time since dry down at these sites. Uh, again, these are all just sites in Northeast Shark River Slough. Next slide. So they were taking vegetation data in 2015, 2018, and 2021 at these same 65 sites. And we are actually starting to see a uh, increase in longer hydro period species, such as sawgrass, spike rush, and cattails, and a decrease in the shorter hydro period sites, species, sorry, if you look all the way back since the beginning of the incremental testing period. Next slide. Next, there we go, waiting birds, what everybody wants to see. Um, so we had super colony events that happened in 2018 and 2021, but it's important to understand these were tied to um, storm events. So post hurricane Irma, post tropical storm Eta, which basically really filled up the system. And this does show that we uh, are able to have these super colony events occur again when the water is right. And so the lower uh, left-hand um, graph shows white ibis, which was the, the 
the main bird that was happening in these super colony events. And we had a spike that went all the way up to about 90,000 uh, deaths in 2018 and over 60,000 deaths in 2021. Um, but the flip side of this is that in those uh, other years, we ha had repeated concerns expressed about overdrying in Northern Water Conservation Area 3A. So let's, uh, next slide. Looking at freshwater fish, again, we have fortunately these long data sets funded by modified water deliveries funding. Um, going all the way back, uh, actually into the 1990s, is really too early to say what is an effective COP and what isn't. What we can say is that looking in that uh, top left uh, graph, which is those, those small fish that the birds love to eat, um, uh, we might be seeing an, an uptick in fish density in Shark River Slough and Taylor Slough if you look all the way back to the beginning of the incremental testing, but some might. We really need to look at this longer term to really try and look at, at the, the trends. Big picture, though, you can see we are still well depressed below the densities that were seen in the late 1990s. On the flip side, though, in uh, D, which is non-native fish, we have the emergence of the Asian swamp eel that is uh, start, uh, made a, a big splash in um, Taylor Slough and the Everglades panhandle at this time. And so at the same time, we're seeing a crash in the, in the crayfish populations that's showing up in those same areas in, that is the, the B plot up above in Taylor Slough and the Everglades panhandle. So this is a case of an invasive species coming in and really, interfering with our ability to see if the hydro, changing the hydrology is having our desired effect. Next slide. So some of our big picture lessons learned using the hydrologic performance measures that were developed during the modeling, um, a lot of them could be translated over into real world monitoring in order to be able to report on results. Not all of them though, because some of the, the, the metrics like frequency of occurrence um, with only two years of COP implementation is really hard to make a comparison. But the nice thing about it is it allows very quick reporting and so the report feels current. So we actually finished up um, you know, data collection in uh, April of 2022 and by February of 2023, the report was out the door. Um, Using the real world baseline and the incremental testing years for comparison purposes worked, but comparison with the whole 41 years of the period of record of the modeling um, was kind of clunky. It, you really couldn't tell whether you, you know, so that, that whole aspect of it needs further work. Next slide. The ecological side of the picture, um, first of all, uh, we did not, directly compare indicators to the GEM model results. Um, it, we just decided it was, it was too hard. We had too little data to really be able to do it. Um, we just looked at, are things trending in the direction that we want? Um, some of the challenges that we had is that the baselines you know, differ from project to project. And you'll notice both the, the, the uh, fish data and the vegetation data were lagging a year behind in terms of the reporting. So we didn't even get to 2022 in the reporting. Um, it may take multiple years for you before you can see an ecological response. And so that's just the reality. And uh, new species like invasive species coming in may you know, disrupt your ability to you know, detect a response. Uh, so it's much more variable in approach, but ultimately this is what people care about. Are we getting more birds? Are we getting more fish? Are, is the vegetation improving? So we have to show a benefit with these endpoint indicators in order to show benefits of the project. Next slide. So looking at this overall connect the dots concept, um, it basically uh, seemed to work very well for our report. Um, I, we probably could have been clearer in the report. We we're very aware the report is long, needed more bottom line up front, um, but you know, it was a good you know, first <laughs> attempt. Um, the target was members of our PDT plus. This is the involved agencies, the uh, non-governmental organizations, the tribes, the area scientists, and we welcome feedback. We didn't get a lot of feedback on this report, so we would welcome feedback. Next slide. 
So you asked the question about near casting. We did not use our ecological models for near-term forecasting. Instead, we used um, near real-time monitoring for the wading bird nesting and foraging, um, you know, uh, basically throughout, especially the, throughout the, the breeding season, the dry season. We also use hydrologic surrogates, water depths, recession rates, ascension rates, and, and specific uh, hydrological needs for species such as the sparrow, the snail kites, apple snails, alligators. And these are reported weekly to biweekly in the ecosystem based management calls. These are interagency calls um, that uh, bring agency researchers and water managers together to discuss the state of the system. They are not decision making, this is just making recommendations and, you know, and, and helping understanding. This is also reported to the periodic scientists call on approximately a monthly basis. Next slide. So this is, I'm gonna give you some examples of what's reported in these calls. So our wonderful waiting bird people, um, uh, especially Mark Cook from uh, South Florida Water Management District brings reports um, of location of colonies, uh, has, has nesting initiated, are, is nest abandonment occurring? How many nests are there? Where are the wading birds foraging? Approximate numbers throughout the system. This is a nice figure from our banner year of 2021. So this looks really good. But um, next slide. And what this ends up doing is, um, this is an example of the adaptive management feedback loop. Concerns were raised during these calls that about overdrying in Northern Water Conservation Area 3A, uh, which is one of the largest colonies. Uh, uh, the Alley North colony is one of the largest in the US. It was identified as a potential issue in the COP modeling. The water managers heard they flexed the operations within what they could to try and bring in additional water from Northern Water Conservation Area 3A during the dry season. It definitely helped, but it's still not quite, it's still not enough to resolve the issue. So we're continuing to monitor and watch. And this issue is then communicated forward into the SEP Water Control Plan update team. Um, we really need more water coming in from the north. So implementation of LOSIM, implementation of SEP, bringing in water from the EA reservoir will be critical for ultimately resolving this problem. Next slide. Very quickly, we have additional tools such as the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow Viewer, which gives hydrological target statistics, and you can do this on a daily basis. This is used every every during each of the EBM calls to show the status of these call of these uh, subpopulation areas. Next slide. And then we've got additional tools that are in development. So we're looking at trying to develop a tool for apple snails and one for alligator nest flooding risk. And with that, I'm going to hand it off. Good morning. I am Bonnie Irving. I'm the Everglades supervisor. Oh, you could keep that up. And actually, if you could go back to the last slide, I thought that was really good, um, the slide before last. I'm Bonnie Irving with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm the Everglades Program Supervisor. Um, and I'm just gonna speak on um, the, the question that was asked specifically towards Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. So if you could bring up the last slide and then the one before that. I like to have a visual. Thank you. Um, so as Andrea said, this is you know really showing the Eden viewer and it, it shows the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow habitats. Um, so the question was asked, do the system responses in Marl Prairie raise concerns about the viability of populations in Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow in responses to COP? Um, really, the, the overarching question is, are we concerned about the sparrow? And yes, we're concerned about the populations of the sparrow because they have been declining over time. However, it's not um, as a result of COP, it's just as a result of the, the altered system. And so we're trying to bring about a restored ecosystem. So we're, we're still in the process. And as Andrea and others have said, this is really early um, for us to be able to make those kind of determinations. Um, so we're really focused on the vegetation and um, the vegetation transitioning um, to, a, to a wetter system takes a lot less time than it does to to transition back towards a drier system. So um, 
as it's been said before, it's it's really too early to expect to see the changes based on COP itself. Um, and over the last series of operational plans, including ERTP and COP, we've seen wetter conditions in Shark River Slough. And as a result, we have seen some declines in marl prairie habitat along the western edge of E, southern and western B and F. And those are indicated on this slide. Additionally, modeling of sea level rise scenarios indicates that many Cape Sable seaside sparrow populations will be adversely impacted over the next 50 years. So that's something that we're taking into consideration. I will say that the service supports conditions-based operations, and that's what we're looking as we're moving into SEP and the other incremental um, conditions projects. Um, well, we're also encouraging um, projects and operations which promote a flow through system. And that would mimic a restored hydrologic regime. A flow through system would reduce impacts due to impounding water in areas such as Southern WCA3A, and it would support tree islands, marsh, and marl prairie. So that's what we're, we're really looking for. In addition, the service is evaluating the habitat changes to determine where suitable habitat for Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow may exist in the future and evaluating the potential for translocation. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to, I think, Melissa, if she, oh, okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Gauthier. I'm with the National Park Service. And um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity of presenting here today. I'll be going over the implementation of water management options that address COP adaptive management on certain T16B. And before we jump head first into that, uh, I wanna give a, you can go to the next slide. I wanna give a quick, overlook of what preceded COP, which is the Everglades Restoration Transition Plan. And I wanna specifically talk about the water regulation schedule changes that happened in 2012, because they, some of them carried over to COP. Um, the modification of water conservation area 3A zone A, ranging from 9. feet to 10.5 feet, which we see here in the figure. I think this pointer works, yes. Well, maybe not. <laughs> At the very top. All right, here we see that the bottom of that zone is 9.5 feet. Um, changes also included dropping zone B and C. And these changes resulted in approximately a quarter foot water level reduction in water conservation area 3A over the year. So fast forward to the implementation of COP in September of 2020. Uh, and it COP retains the ERTP zone A parameters, 9.5 9 to 10.5 feet. That range, it adds an extreme high water line for flood control that we can see here, the dashed line above zone A. It simplifies all zones below A, and we see zone C here uh, in the bottom line at 7.5 feet. You can go. Um, at this time, we, there's also adoption of the Tamiami Trail Full Formula, which maximizes flows to the Northeast Shark River Slough, and it keeps the same prioritization order as before from east to west, going from S333, S333N, and then the S12s, S12, S12D, C, B, and A. And the water deliveries are made according to rainfall, evotranspiration, upstream and downstream water levels. Also, um, it develops adaptive management options for uncertainty 16B. And these aim to improve water quality that's delivered to the park. Now, how did the adaptive management options come to be? And we can go to the next slide. We use the historic data, well, a historic data set was used from 1998 to 2017 to do some analysis that revealed that a 9.2 uh, feet stage at S333 is the threshold for TP concentrations, because below that stage, TP concentrations delivered to the park rarely decline to the park's protective target, which is eight parts per billion. The data also revealed that when flowing, the 12C, S12C concentrations for TP were generally lower than S12D. 
and that water conservation area water levels below 10 feet occurring on December 1st were linked to higher TP concentrations to the park in the upcoming wet season. So based on these observations, management measures were developed and an interagency or multi-agency team meets when these conditions are triggered to then determine what adaptive management strategy will be used. So next slide. And then these are the management options. Uh, the first bullet here is to maintain discharges that are combined between S12D and S12 and S333 below 150 cubic feet per second when the headwater at S333 state when the stage of the S333 headwater is below 9.2, which as I mentioned before, is associated with elevated phosphorus concentrations. And this flow restriction stops when the S333 headwater stage increases above 9.2 feet or increases one foot above the May 15th stage. The second management option is to shift a portion or a fraction of the S12 discharges through S12C and reducing recession rates by reducing outflow in water conservation area 3A um, through the S12s and S333 between December and May when the stage is lower than 10 feet to maintain the higher stages in the canal coming out of the dry season and then reduce the frequency of low stage conditions which are associated with the total phosphorus, higher total phosphorus concentrations. You can go on to the next slide. You can go on to the next slide. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> So for our evaluation, uh, we determined flow volumes when the stage was less than 9.2 feet as the, at the S333 headwater. We saw how flow splits between S12C and S12D uh, when they were made. And we looked at the frequency of water conservation area 3A stage being below 10 feet in the, on December 1st. So a change point analysis uh, was conducted and two change points were observed. You can go to the next slide. In 2016 and 2018. And as you can see here in the top figure, uh, we're looking at mean water year percentage for the flows and 12.5% of the mean flow for the period between 2010 to th through 2015 was discharged one S333 stage was less than 9.2 feet. For the period between 2016 and 2017, that's 11.1% 11 .1 of the flows being discharged at lower than that stage. And for the mean water year flows for the period of 2018 to 2022, 24.7% uh, of the flows were discharged below the 9.2 feet stage level. Now as for volume, we're seeing uh, in the bottom figure in the bar chart, we're seeing that 76,000 acre feet were delivered between the period of 2010 to 2015, 155 between the period of 2016 and 2017. And for the period of 2018 to 2022, that's 216,000 acre feet. So we see that more water is being delivered at lower stages. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the second point in our evaluation is to look at the flow splits between S12C and S12D. And we looked at TP concentrations between October 2009 and June of 2023. That's a, the, the, our data set. And his, over that historical period, we see that S12C concentrations are slower than S12D um, for uh, 10 micrograms per liter and 12 micrograms per liter at S12D when the stage is lower than 9.2. However, uh, we see that these are similar, but statistically different. So they yielded a p-value that was 10 to the negative six uh, at a magnitude of 10 to the negative six, six, which makes them significantly different from each other. So they're close, but they're significantly different. And next slide. Now in March of 2023, and we did get low stage triggers. So in response to that, flows were split between these two structures to deliver lower TP concentrations. And we saw three sampling events over the month of March, and there was no statistical difference in TP concentrations between S12C and S12D 
for March for that event in 2023. So we did see that S12C um, TP concentrations were one to six micrograms per liter higher than S12D for the sample events that occurred during that month. And flow weighted mean differences range from one to three micrograms per liter. Next slide. However, we observed that that was not a significant change in concentrations for this event in March where we did split uh, some of the flows. Next slide, please. And now uh, for the last one in our evaluation is that what frequency have we seen the water conservation area 3A, 3A stage go below 10 feet on December 1st? And we saw three events since 2009. All of them were prior to COP. So we're seeing the last event in 2019 with this black box over the two figures. Uh, where we see here in the top figure, we see a dashed green line that represents the 150 cubic feet per second flow. And we see that when the flow, which is the blue line and the average stage both drop, which is yellow, uh, sorry, orange line, we see that there is a increase in concentrations in the bottom. However, we see that there is a cyclical pattern. So we can't really say um, that uh, that's what triggered. So we do have a cyclical pattern that when there's a declining stage, there's an increase in concentrations. However, under COP, we haven't seen this happen. And final slide. So uh, the COP adaptive management on certain T16B aims to reduce the TP concentrations of the waters being delivered to the park. And under its operations, there have been very few hydraulic um, uh, conditions that have triggered the implementation of the adaptive management options. So since we didn't get to implement these adaptive management options, we weren't able to really see system responses that indicated a need for adaptive management changes. Now, interagency deliberations and data sharing have been happening uh, under COP, and they've proven very valuable for water quality considerations during real time. Continuing data collection through uh, the multiple agencies that are involved and collaborative evaluation are necessary to continue to further implement AM strategies, adaptive management strategies. And work is underway to inform potential solutions that may reduce high TP coming out of the dry seasons into the park. And one example is a sediment characterization study that was carried out to understand how flock and sediment affect TP concentrations at the Shark River Slough inflow. So there is continuing work being performed to further improve uh, concentrations in the park. And with that, that is my presentation today. I will pass it on to the next presenter, Kevin. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kevin Kniff. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. And I'm extremely pleased to be here today uh, to meet and speak with you. Um, and I do want to acknowledge um, that we did have a great time out in the field on Miccosukee Tribal lands yesterday with Marla and Stephanie. I'd also like to further acknowledge that uh, Reverend Houston Cypress, is here today in the audience. He is a tribal member, and he is also a member of the Everglades Advisory Committee, which is a committee of four tribal elders. I don't know that uh, Reverend Cypress yet quite qualifies as a tribal elder, but nevertheless, um, who seek to work with the Miccosukee Environmental Protection Agency that I help to bring, uh, bring leadership to. And together we work um, to be facilitators of knowledge, and information and data, both from the tribal community, as well as the science community, in order to help the Miccosukee Business Council uh, formulate policy and make informed decisions that are data-driven and information-based. That all being said, I don't have a uh, particular slide presentation, which I hope you'll all find refreshing. Um, and I'm, I'm also doing this in a way that um, it's much more culturally relevant to actually speak to each other and look each other in the eyes to be able to have these conversations about very, very important topics here that we're talking about. I'm gonna ask you a question first. You got it all? 
<laughs> do you understand exactly everything that went through here? Do you see how A and B and C and D and E and F all relate and how it's all simple and clean? I don't think so. We have a very, very complicated system. We have a very, very complicated set of challenges and constraints and needs within the greater Everglades system all throughout South Florida. Um, there is a veritable army of engineers and scientists, policymakers, not-for-profits, the general public, all you all who are an extremely important body here that have a stake in Everglades restoration for one reason or another, and who are all in their own ways, very well-intentioned and genuine in wanting to see good things done. I want to take the opportunity, of course, to remind everybody that amongst these stakeholders are two indigenous tribes that have inhabited the Everglades for millennia, who have been instrumental in the evolution of the Everglades as a wetland system over the last 6,000 years or so, since we had the ocean rise up enough to make that hydrostatic pressure to create wetlands that we now see today and that have taken shape over this time. And so as I serve the Miccosukee tribe, I'm going to be speaking um, from the perspective of the Miccosukee interests with respect to Everglades restoration. And while we're here talking about COP, um, I guess there were two maybe particular questions that were posed um, for me to maybe give some input on here is how has COP implementation affected the tribe and how has the COP biennial report been received as a good thing or not by the tribe? I'll start with the easy one first, and that's the, the COP biennial report, which is replete with as much data as you'd ever want to see and to consider. That's great. I think we can all agree that as a water control plan and strategy, it represents a very, very small snapshot of time. It is contingent upon baseline conditions of a system that were already highly impacted and compartmentalized to begin with. And so, a lot of the figures you saw here today, looking at um, uh, various periods of, of inundation, um, hydro periods, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to make the suggestion here that we are considerate of the fact that um, what COP is seeking to do here is to compare to an already altered baseline. It is not a natural baseline. And to be fair, it's not attempting to try and compare to a natural baseline. Nevertheless, the Miccosukee tribe, for all of you who may not be aware, um, makes its home in the Florida Everglades and has done so um, for a lot longer than any of us have been here or our families have been here. And it has been the place where the tribe's culture has continued to thrive and for which the tribe has endured um, quite a lot here in particular over the last 150 years in particular. Um, the Everglades were a place that the tribe took refuge from the United States Army in its campaign to eradicate indigenous peoples from Florida in order to make way for Everglades drainage and for farming. To be sure, Everglades drainage was actually a key strategy with which and how to accomplish this as military campaigns continue to prove um, unable to eradicate indigenous peoples. The Miccosukee tribe took refuge in the tree islands throughout the Everglades and for which are an important um, manner with which to assess how well Everglades restoration is being planned and implemented. Everglades tree islands 
are of primary importance and their health uh, two of those tree islands are of primary importance to the Miccosukee tribe because this is where the tribe lived. This is where the tribe raised their families. This is where culture and medicine were shared and taught. This is where food was gathered, cultivated, hunted. And this is where the tribal members were laid to rest in order to return to the next place that they go to. I'm going to use Miss Betty Osceola, who is uh, another Miccosukee tribal member. She is a, another member of the Everglades Advisory Committee, and she's an extremely uh, active woman within the community here of Everglades Restoration. And when she says that her DNA and that of her people are intertwined explicitly and intricately within the Everglades, that's 100% true. Those tribal members who lived on the islands, who died on the islands, and who were resorbed back into the islands come up as trees. And they live as trees. And the members of the tribe view them as such. Where we've seen, um, in particular, uh, degradation of tree islands, um, degradation that is caused by a number of factors. Most importantly, the Tamiami Trail as being such a dam and impediment to north-south flow of water. While Everglades National Park uh, has been prioritized in COP, the trade-off has been Water Conservation Area 3, where water is stacked up unnaturally, which has high inundation periods, which are very deleterious to tree islands. We have seen a precipitous decline in the diversity of tree islands. We've seen soil loss through constant inundation. We've seen outright death, out, outright death of trees within tree islands throughout Conservation Area 3 as a result of water management. The idea that COP is a good step forward, I would agree. I would agree, and I think the tribe is happy to see that there are strides being made and there are thoughtful ways on how we can better have water moving across the landscape in a complicated web of many different CERP projects, all of which have different timelines of when they expect to come online. A tremendous amount of engineering to unengineer a highly engineered system. I'll let that sit for a second on the logic. We have a compartmentalized system. Everglades restoration at its most basic seeks to decompartmentalize the system. And how are we decompartmentalizing the system through more construction of hard engineering features, pump stations, levees, seepage walls, so on and so on. The tribe has seen a lot of changes through the Everglades in its time in the Everglades. And here over the last hundred or so years since drainage has really proceeded in earnest has seen a tremendous amount of change. It's not been a positive experience, but it is one that the tribe is seeking to take in stride because it has been their lives uh, spent understanding changes and adapting to those changes. And these man-made changes are one more in that, in that long litany of impact and change that the tribe is seeking to adapt to. What I'd like to put forward here is that while we are going to be very considerate as we watch um, COP move forward and as we engage on SEP South planning and a new water control plan, um, there are a couple of things that I think the Miccosukee tribe would like to see um, better focused attention being given to. In particular, um, the health of tree islands throughout the conservation area. You saw a couple of uh, figures there that showed um, 
some snapshots of, of Tree Island health data um, that I think Raj had presented. And you'll note that the islands in Everglades National Park were all red, but that's actually a pretty good thing because they're receiving the proper hydrology. They receive their proper wet season hydrology uh, heights of water levels. And then those water levels come down appropriately through the dry season. What we're seeing in the conservation area is very different. We're seeing overly high water levels that are overtopping and drowning tree islands for way too long. And we're seeing the death of those islands. We're seeing the continued erosion of those islands. And we're seeing um, drastic changes in the communities of those tree islands and the wetland uh, um, fauna and flora that are dependent upon these tree islands and for which are important resources to the Miccosukee tribe. How do we do this? How can we, how can we kind of uh, resolve this issue of making sure we get the right amount of water at the right time into Everglades National Park and not sacrifice the rest of the system? Well, um, you're going to hear uh, later um, some discussion about adaptive management. Dr. Craig Vanderheiden from the Miccosukee Tribe, Fisheries and Wildlife Director will be part of that panel to help address these issues. But I'd put forward here that we need a better degree of flexibility. We need a better degree of thoughtfulness on some of the novel approaches we might take that are more conditions and stage based rather than strict schedules of constraints. I'm going to point to the S12, A and B um, structures in particular along Tamiami Trail that have a specific operational schedule in order to be um, accommodating of the US Fish and Wildlife Service's biological opinion on the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow and for which the Army Corps of Engineers is now compelled to uphold. The tribe for decades has been advocating to um, have these gates open, open throughout the year in a way that is conditions based to allow for flow. Subpopulation A of, of the sparrow has been devoid of birds for quite a long time. And the habitat that these birds are, are, are that we're seeking to protect by way of this operational schedule is really not at all good habitat to begin with for the birds. It's degraded. Why is it degraded? Well, in large part because much of the Everglades is degraded. And we've seen negative changes because of hydrologic impact. You're all scientists. My background is coastal and estuary in ecology and nutrient biogeochemistry. Uh, so I'm not saying this from a place of, of pulling this out of nowhere. But isn't it logical to maybe suspect that if we can engender a better degree of natural flow across the system, even in the areas that we see today, which are impacted and are not baseline, could we not maybe expect a different um, outcome? I think we can. And I think we have the ability to test this in a scientific manner, okay? I'm not suggesting throw the gates open and walk away. I'm saying, let's look at ways to bring about good things um, with the tools that we have and to be more thoughtful in thinking outside of the box with those same tools. I will note that the, one of the key performance metrics here for Everglades restoration is wading bird success. Well, wading birds are successful when they have a good prey base and they have the right water levels to actually exploit that prey base. Now, you also saw some of the data about super colonies uh, following our tropical storm and hurricane events in 2018 and 2021. I will also note those are the same years where S12 A and B were kept open as an emergency deviation for flooding purposes within the conservation area. So let's think about that. Let's think we've got some pilot information that might suggest there might be some merit to this. I'll also close here. I know I'm, I'm at the end of my time to speak with you and I appreciate it. I look forward to answering any questions. 
but the Miccosukee tribe is advocating for a holistic view of restoration, a holistic view of the Everglades. And while we are so in the weeds, literally and figuratively, on the minutia of modeling and data, we need to think about these things in the broader scheme where we've got a complicated web of projects and infrastructure and engineering solutions to be brought forward. What is at the heart of this is to decompartmentalize a compartmentalized system and provide an opportunity for water to flow from the Kissimmee River and the chain of lakes through Lake Okeechobee, which don't even get me started on that here, but down through the Everglades, we have more constraints on this, on achieving this, than we, than we do um, anything else. And so the Miccosukee tribe would be strongly advocating to reprioritize efforts to move water south from its historic upper watersheds down to the coastal estuaries and bays. And I appreciate that you've all let me say these few things. I think from the tribe's perspective, COP is a mixed bag, but is still subject to be, um, um, to be evaluated at a later time. And we'll be certainly working very closely with the Corps and the district and our partners on where SEP water control plans are going to be set going forward. Thank you. Yeah, could we have all the speakers up um, for the panel Q&A, please? And for the committee, um, indicate that you have a question just by raising your card. And for those of you that are um, on Zoom, uh, Stephanie and I will keep track of the, your virtual hands as you raise them. So we're going to extend our session a little bit, go to 1025, so we have time for questions. And we're going to start with uh, Jeff Walters. So part of the committee's charge is to identify challenges that could uh, meet restoration progress. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, well, part of the charge of the committee is to uh, identify challenges that could um, restoration progress and constraints fall under those challenges and I'll start off by saying hearing Dan Crawford say that um, since the seepage barrier has been put in um, the flood constraints from the 8.5 square mile area which have compromised to some extent every restoration effort in northeast Shark River Slough since experimental water deliveries in the 1980s through uh, water year 21 under COP was thrilling. I got goosebumps just hearing that. <laughs> that. That might actually finally be overcome or close to it. Um, and the report, the biannual report's full of good news in the sense that things are happening that were anticipated represent restoration success. But the one section that alarmed me a bit was the biological opinion section, and because there are incidental take thresholds in there, and mm -hmm. for kites, storks, and sparrows, and some things weren't met that were supposed to in water year 21. I know it was a wet year, but for storks and kites, it requires two consecutive years to maybe have to consult again. But the sparrows, by my math, if they'd have gone out on the survey and found five fewer sparrows, they would have exceeded the threshold and maybe had to consult again. So um, there's only one year in there, water year 21. So I'm curious what happened in water year 22 and 23 which were different, were things better with endangered species then? And if not, are there plans underway to find ways around these issues so that endangered species don't become a real constraint on progress, on constraint on operations? Full disclosure, I've been 
in this. I have to be here. I have to be here. I've been here a year, um, so I've been uh, drinking fire hose and learning as much as I can. Um, but it's hard for me to you know, get all the information that I need to be able to answer every question um, to a certain amount of detail. Um, that being said, that, um, we're trying to look forward. We're trying to be as adaptable and um, work with our partners and listen. Our, our charge is obviously to um, really keep foremost in mind uh, the ecosystems that the species inhabit. That's a part of the, of the Endangered Species Act. What I would say is we're really trying to focus on a paradigm shift in the future with um, SEP and the new water control plans. And um, such as what Kevin just mentioned, we're, we're looking at the landscape level and we're looking holistically. That doesn't mean that we're ignoring the species impacts. We're evaluating each one of those. Um, that's why we attend the PDT meetings. That's why we attend um, the EBM meetings. We're there um, every step of the way to try to evaluate and um, be very thoughtful about how to provide input that tries to create a balance and um, keep in mind all the different species and the habitats in which they interact. And it's tough. It, there's no denying it. It's a complex system. Um, but in terms of identifying constraints, it, there are so many different constraints. And I use the word with a little C, not a big C that the engineers use. Um, obviously it's something that we have to take into consideration. That's what I would say. Um, but we're trying to focus on conditions-based operations. We're trying to look at the landscape level and we're trying to provide input and evaluate um, the best hydro periods that um, work for a host and a mosaic of the Everglades system. And so that includes tree islands, that includes the, the Ridge and Slough systems, and that includes Marl Prairie. And with that, then we look at um, the changes in the vegetation and how the species um, will live within those vegetative habitats. Hey, Charlie and Bill and then Marla. Well, thank you all for that presentation. Uh, I had a question or two questions actually on the water quality presentation. So I wanted to, uh, I guess, specifically talk to you, Christina. So I appreciate the presentation. It's quite interesting. So the first question is, do you have a good handle on what is the mechanism driving these changes in phosphorus? And then I guess related to that is, you talk about total phosphorus, but have you looked at the various forms of phosphorus that would provide insight in terms of what's going on and, and driving those changes? Yes, so not unlike Bonnie, <laughs> I have been with the National Park Service since June. Um, but I have, uh, we have looked at the different types of phosphorus that uh, are part of the mechanism. And um, we have seen uh, that some, of course, total phosphorus is kind of the, the main measure that we're looking at, not looking at inorganic and organic and going down that rabbit hole. And that's what the um, COP is addressing, right? So that's what it, we stuck to. Um, but there are mechanisms in, in place that do affect these phosphorus concentrations. So aside from the stage and the flow, there's also mechanisms where, and I, I mentioned the sediment characterization study where sediment uh, may have phosphorus as well. And, you know, there's other conditions that may be affecting and bringing phosphorus into the park. Um, for, I have Donato Surratt on the line. He's virtually uh, available to answer more specifics on this question, given that I've been here since June. Um, but there definitely, yes, uh, total phosphorus is not the, the, the only measure that we're looking at. So I don't know, Donato, if you're online and you'd like to add anything to that response, please feel free to chime in. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. 
I apologize, but I'm dual task at this point and working on work at the same time. I only heard the part about the TP and as a part of the study that uh, Christina was mentioning at the end, we have started investigating some other components of the total phosphorus to try to have a better understanding of the actual drivers uh, that we're seeing for these cyclical spikes that we're getting, uh, particularly down at the S333 structures and the S12D that are contributing to the exceedances that we're experiencing for, 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 for water quality going to Everglades National Park. So we are looking at, um, we, we looked at some of the uh, soluble reactive phosphorus and total dissolved phosphorus as a part of that study. And, and that type of information will be coming out in the near future um, as we continue to finalize this investigation. Was there more to the question? And did I answer that portion of the question? Uh, yeah, this, so this is Charlie, uh, Charlie Driscoll. And uh, I guess the other part of this is, do you have a good handle on the mechanisms or what are the mechanisms that you're you're evaluating that could be driving these changes? So right now, the biggest um, driver that we've been focusing most heavily on is the stage dynamics. And that was why she spent a little time focusing on the 9.2 feet stage threshold. And that came out through our evaluation going way back, starting in the Everglades restoration transition plan process. And we, we started noticing that, you know, below some different stages, we could see that concentrations were starting to increase above that, that desired or, or protective concentration of eight parts per billion. And um, as a result of those evaluations, we did some serious in-depth uh, sensitivity analysis um, to ultimately formulate those recommendations that, that Christina laid out earlier in the presentation. So right now, the biggest driver we're looking at is this stage reduction, and particularly when we're starting to disconnect from the marsh and getting that good, clean rainwater driven marsh concentrations that would normally help feed the canal and help reduce those stages. I mean, concentrations, we're, we're, we're seeing that, that stage difference when we drop below that threshold, we're seeing that in concentration increase. So we're looking right now to try to find solutions for uh, managing that type of dynamic. Did that help? Yes, thank you. All right, thanks. So first, I want to say thank you uh, as a first timer on this committee. I, I'm sympathetic to drinking through the fire hose, and <laughs> um, but this was really informative. I learned a lot. Uh, so my question is oriented towards the ecological side of things. So I think this might be from Andrea. Um, so uh, I heard mention of crayfish and I heard mention of apple snails. Um, I'm curious how much attention is being given to invertebrate responses, uh, given their sensitivity to both ephemerality as well as water quality. Are those the only two invertebrates or are there, is there actually community-based uh, analyses that are also occurring? Um, it depends on what part of the system you're looking at. I think in the main part of the Everglades, our main indicators um, are our fish and crayfish, but and we're not looking at the in, in, invertebrate community other than like, you know, one-off studies. Um, within the northern estuaries, oysters are a key indicator, and benthic in fauna is an up-and-coming indicator that we're working to develop. Um, in the southern coastal systems, um, looking at pink shrimp and um, uh, epi, epi, epifauna on the on the seagrass and, and uh, those as indicators. So it depends on which part of the system you're looking at. Um, but uh, in the main part of the Everglades, in Laura, if you know of any, but yeah, we, we it's basically the, we got two main types of crayfish that um, uh, have uh, proven to be important and that respond differently to the hydrology and uh, uh, end up being very important for some of these super quality events. Right. Thank you. I want to echo everyone's thanks to you all for your presentations and, and Bill's note that I too am a first timer on this committee and yeah, that fire hose, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Um, my question is relative to the cultural values and tribal interests uh, objective of the COP. And uh, I wonder if you could perhaps provide us with a little more detail 
on on how that was operationalized and uh, what metrics have been used to monitor and assess the effects uh, on cultural resources and tribal interests. And um, I confess that I did skim the COP biennial report for the data, but it didn't jump right out at me. So uh, any help you could provide in pointing us toward those sections of the report would be greatly appreciated. So th this is um, Melissa Nasuti. I can take that one unless, um, Kevin, you were about to speak. Go ahead, Melissa. Thank you. OK. Um, yes, yeah, so in the report, as you mentioned, and as Raj um, presented, we did look at a metric with respect to tree islands, tree islands being culturally significant um, to the tribe. Um, Chris Altez, um, who isn't on the panel today, he's our archaeologist for the Corps for this project. Um, he puts out um, additional reports, I believe, on a monthly basis um, that also talk about changes in water levels. So we also have um, that reporting um, mechanism as well. But I think tree islands are, are the one that we've sort of uh, keyed in on. And I'll stop there if, if Kevin like would like to provide any uh, feedback or anything else. Marla, thank you for the question. It's uh, uh, one that I feel is important and I feel that um, deserves a little bit better discussion. Now, you all saw that tree islands were considered as part of the ecological performance me me measures. And so um, I think a, a, a fair answer to your question is, is that there isn't a specific cultural resource or um, other related type of a performance metric included. It's not being tracked uh, by recover, for example. Now, that's not all the fault of, of, of any you know, one uh, effort or not. To be sure, the Miccosukee tribe very closely guards um, the species and, and the particular resources that have cultural or medicinal value. Um, and so where we are now in, in 2023 is what I hope is a, a really great opportunity um, to actually build in some performance measures that are culturally based, but that will be proxies Proxies for um, resources that are important um, culturally or traditionally to the tribe, but for which the tribe seeks to want to retain um, as being private and protected that way. So uh, to this end, um, on the and it's not necessarily related to COP, but um, where the science monitoring and assessment component of Everglades restoration by way of recover. Um, so that's uh, restoration, coordination, and verification. It is the um, entity here that is supposed to be providing the data-driven science to help folks like yourselves, to help the um, South Florida Ecosystem um, uh, Restoration Task Force to make recommendations and, and data-driven decisions on Everglades restoration. Recover has a new module called the Southwest Florida module that uh, the tribes were um, helping to advocate for in order to provide a framework for science, for monitoring and assessment to be done in a way ahead of the Western Everglades restoration project. Um, I know this is outside of COP discussion, but there is a relation. And as part of that, we're going to seek to try and actually develop these proxy uh, performance measures so that um, as a key partner and a stated uh, stakeholder in Everglades restoration, the tribe will have that opportunity to provide um, a basis of quantitative empirical science and or monitoring and assessment in order that we who serve the tribe can be the um, intermediaries with the rest of the agencies uh, who are performing this important work and to be part of that work and helping to design that work 
so that we can be in position um, to report back to the tribal community how the important resources are trending um, and also be able to protect those resources um, in the very specific manner that we are charged to do. So I guess more to come. Okay, Matt. Um, and then uh, if we will have then have a, a little bit of an opportunity to give um, feedback on the COP report um, after we hear from Matt. So that was actually where I was going to go. Perfect. So I think it was you, Melissa, that asked the question about feedback on the effectiveness of the report. And I'm interested in it from sort of two types of perspectives. The first is on documentation of the process, and the second is on communicating the results of the, of the effectiveness and the out, results effectiveness and the outcome effectiveness. So my first question is on the documentation parts. So uh, we've heard that the periodic scientist calls were valuable. Uh, and while the formal adaptive management uh, thresholds were not particularly triggered in those first two years of COP, um, there was a lot done in this operational space, right, with the feedback and input from the periodic scientist calls. The COP report didn't go into this very much, and I'm curious as to why that is. Um, this is Melissa. So we produce a lot of reports. <laughs> um, so in addition to the biennial report that we talked about today, the core is responsible for producing a biannual assessment report to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a requirement of the 2020 COP biological opinion. And within those reports, um, which I believe were appendices to the biennial report, our water manager um, Basin Manager for Water Conservation Area 3 and Everglades National Park does produce a table to try and summarize the feedback that we've received from the periodic scientist calls. Um, so it is it is there, but I concur that um, it's a it's a bit buried, and it, there may be a, a better way to communicate um, what occurs at those calls and how it feeds back into operations and in future reports. Yeah, I believe you're referring to Appendix C uh, for the COP report, which is actually the second part of my question. We can go there. So uh, reporting on outputs, what happened, and outcomes, what does it mean, are two different things. Uh, one is in a conversation space of sort of the why and the what, and the other is in a conversation of space of the therefore. Uh, and so we see this challenge in, in lots of uh, reports, uh, including this, the system status reports. So. I'm curious from a report planning, designing, and writing perspective, can you sort of speak to the why the report didn't go to the therefore aspects? And the example I want to give is from Appendix C. And so this is a table that describes the, the conversation space for those periodic scientists. Calls. And on the left-hand column is a column that describes somewhere in the order of 10 to 15 kinds of recommendations from the different entities that participate in the periodic scientists call. And on the far right column of that table is a description of sort of the decisions that were made as a, as a functional result. Um, however, what's missing is the therefore part. Right? So I look at that far right column and I look at the far left column and of the 15 on the far left column, I can only actually understand maybe what happened to three of those recommendations because the therefore is not sort of there. And so I was curious as to some feedback as to, as to why, you, why you think that, whether you think that there might be a, an opportunity to add that therefore part to those descriptions. I think that's um, good feedback that could be taken back to the team in terms of producing the biennial report or the biannual assessment on reports. I don't think that it was um, done on, on purpose. Um, we just used sort of a, a standard template to produce those reports. Um, for several years. Um, so really, like Andrea said, I think we're just, you know, welcoming any, um, any feedback for potential improvements. Thank you. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I just wanted to say as one of the committee members who's read the whole entire report, looked at the appendices that um, I did feel like for an audience like us, it communicates well what has happened, I found like I got a clear picture of the changes that have happened under a COP and what has happened in those particular water years. Um, 
I did have one question though, just to make sure I understand it right. My understanding of the the modeling, the model predictions that um, uh, things are compared against is what would have been expected under COP during each year in the period of record of that 40 years. Is that correct? Um, if you're talking about the hydrologic performance yeah. Uh, reporting, yeah, um, it was our first uh, attempt to try and do something of this type. So it took the entire 41 year period of record and was graphing it, for example, like the hydro periods, you know, um, and, and comparing it with the, you know, real world, you know, baseline years and the uh, comp imp implementation years. Um, Troy Hill, who did some of the initial of this uh, modeling, he then took another job. And, but one of the ideas he had before he left was to try and subset uh, the COP uh, modeling years to the ones that were most similar in terms of rainfall to the, uh, the actual implemented, you know, real world years and see if that might be a way of going forward, but we just haven't had a chance to try it out yet. Okay, that's where I was going to go, whether there were efforts underway to try to compare to like conditions in this year, not some, you know, um, to what actually, what is predicted to have happened to what actually happened um, using, using like current years instead of past years. Yeah. And I guess the best where you're going with that is like the most similar past year, but not yet going to trying to model. Yeah. We, we won't be rerunning the, the models with this year's rainfall. The idea would be going back and looking at, say, uh, like, like I said, the five or 10 most similar years in terms of rainfall from that all Q data set and seeing and being able to do a comparison because rerunning the models, uh, will, uh, it takes a lot to get in line with the IMC in order to rerun these models. Um, <laughs> And so that's the constraint that prevents you from trying to like take the actual water year 24 and yes. run that through the model. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I can I add uh, uh, on this question? So yeah, we 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 look at uh, like a, a COP model output, like a very close, for example, 25 percent very closest rainfall years, and we compare for different time period. For example, weekly basis or in a dry season, in a wet season, how that compares with that 25% of the closest rainfall years. Sometimes we also look at the, try to match the antecedent conditions. So sometimes I present in the EBMs called that type of information. Uh, uh, so we, just to tell you that, we, we also uh, explore those uh, between the model and the current observations. So and one last thing, of course, not everybody's going to read that whole report. So do you have, uh, do you, have you worked on like some little Jeff, synopsis? Just hold that part of your question. Did, Dan, did you want to follow up on this? And then you can ask. Uh, I, I did. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to just acknowledge a couple other, you know, again, Jeff, we're very much welcome to feedback, but a couple, couple other limitations to be aware of. And one reason we didn't take the tact of trying to compare model to real world with this initial report is that we only have two years of data. And we know the front end of that two year cycle was influenced heavily by tropical storm Ada that kind of surcharged the system. And you know that storm would have happened whether we were under COP or whether we were under the predecessor operations plan. And so as we look at the effects of COP, COP is also affected by areas outside of our you know, area of responsibility, if you will, you know, Lake Okeechobee operations, operations of the state stormwater treatment areas, operations of water conservation areas one and two inflows from mullet slough from the west side of conservation area three, all of those areas also have an effect on the water that makes it into the COP water control plan area being conservation area three A in the park. And so we felt like after only two years of data, there wasn't enough statistical rigor to warrant going back and comparing back to the the modeling data but I think it is something as as Raj alluded to that we're we're open to exploring in more depth as we move up to the next biennial report and certainly we'd we'd welcome any any feedback yeah so the last thing I was going to say is uh, I was just wondering if you have some um, synopsis of 
this report or some shorter thing to share with the more general public about um, just as a way to demonstrate, uh, communicate restoration success you've had under COP? Because I know you want to write more reports and things like that. Um, uh, this is Andrea Atkinson. Um, at this time, no, and uh, which is why we handed you the COP poster as a way to try and give you a kind of synopsis of some of the big things that were going on, but we did not do that for this report. And that might be something we should think about for the future. Okay, I think we'll end there. Um, thanks very much to the panel for your presentations and your other contributions. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we're a little behind schedule, and so we'll have a bit of an abbreviated break. We'll resume at 10.50. Chirp adjacent climate change science and planning. And Tom Frazier has us starting off, and he's going to give us an overview of Florida Flood Hub and sea level rise guidance. Thanks, Tom. All right, thanks, James. So, um, yeah, so Stephanie asked me if I might come and chat a little bit about the Florida Flood Hub for Applied Research and Innovation, some of the work that we're doing, excuse me, with regard to climate change, sea level rise. I have to be really close. All right, this is going to be fun. So I'm going to talk closely into a mic and read very small print. <laughs> so anyways, we'll get moving along because there's a couple of uh, folks in this session. I think Obi's got a number of slides and I'm gonna to try to save him a little bit of time. Um, so the, the flood hub um, is really a, a center for flood data, right? It was created by statute uh, with base funding from the state of Florida. And it's really intended to, this, uh, to serve um, as a thought leader, right? On flooding research, helping Florida really to, to prepare for the impacts. Oops. I need to see next slide too, don't I? Sorry about that. We got all kinds of technological challenges here. Um, you know, but they the, the, the hub's mission really is to prepare uh, Floridians and stakeholders in the state for the impacts of uh, rising sea levels, uh, stronger, uh, more economically um, kind of uh, important storms uh, and extreme rainfall events. Next slide. All right, so in order to, to serve that mission, the, the Flood Hub actually leverages uh, work groups and its partnerships really to aid community-based programs designed to address uh, flooding uh, and sea level rise in Florida. So, and the work groups, I mean, many of the folks probably on this panel are aware of how NC, sort of National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis works. Uh, it's, it's modeled after that particular program. And so the work groups are really the heart of uh, the Florida Hub. Uh, the flat hub, excuse me. And so there are scientists and other subject matter experts. They convene on a regular basis uh, to address issues related to sea level rise, high tide flooding events, storm surge, and extreme rainfall events. I'm not going to talk about that. Obi's going to incorporate that into his uh, uh, talk next. But the work groups really concentrate that expertise to fill gaps in data. Uh, evaluate models. In some cases, they create new models where appropriate. Um, they solve and address scientific problems and advance our understanding of the risks that are associated with flooding that can obviously occur as a result of multiple factors. And the issue of compound flooding is really top of mind for this group, you know, and, and something that we think about as we move forward. So right now we have three working groups. Uh, I've indicated them up here. We have a sea level rise work group. Um, a rainfall working group, and we're establishing or putting together our comprehensive modeling group, again, to start to get a handle on that compound flooding issue. Um, the, the hub is really collaborative by design, and it relies on the strength not only of its work group members, but its partnerships, right, to ensure that the work and the findings uh, and the products have real world impact. And the partners include academics, um, but it's not limited, obviously, to academics water management district scientists and, and, and other professionals there, people that work for utilities, regional planning organizations, resiliency uh, coalitions, and a number of folks from the agencies at both at the local state and federal level. So, and of course we work very, very closely with 
uh, the Resilient Florida program, which is uh, a major initiative in the state uh, at this last couple of legislative sessions. Next slide. So I'm gonna give you just a little bit of an overview of what we are doing right now, particularly with regard to sea level rise. Um, you know, and again, as I said before, Obi is going to talk a little bit about uh, the rainfall efforts, and I think John Stamps on the line as well, and they might be able to answer any questions that they have in that regard moving forward. Next slide. All right, so as I indicated earlier, um, these work groups are comprised of uh, leading scientists and subject matter experts from around the world, nation. Um, with regard to this particular group, Gary Mitchum, who's a physical oceanographer at the University of South Florida, College of Marine Science, serves as the chair. But other members on this group, you know, they've contributed to the IPCC reports, the national assessments, either as authors and or reviewers. And all of them are uh, well-recognized experts in the field. And the ex officio members are uh, Wes Brooks, who's the chief resiliency officer for the state, Mark Raines, who's the chief science officer for the state, and myself. Next slide. All right, so rather than get way into the weeds, I'll give you kind of the conclusions up front. Um, essentially what the, the work group did was they took a look at the most recent national assessment, which was released in February, 2022. Um, they re-analyzed the data, they essentially acquired the data, took a peek at it, and they found um, that the Sea level, sea level rise projection for Florida, regardless of the time horizon that you're interested in, right? Whether it's 2040, 2050, 2070, or beyond, are remarkably uniform across the state. And that's in contrast to what the national assessment said. And we can talk about that a little later, perhaps during the panel discussion. <clears throat> the group also found that the results for Florida agree very well or align with the global projections. Um, and as a consequence of those findings, right? a single set of projections can be used, right, or can, is justified regardless of the time horizon employed. So uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you three slides of methodology, again, at a very high level. What did the group do? They, they looked, they didn't actually collect new data. They acquired the data that was used in the national assessment, right? They, they re-aggregated the data, and they looked at essentially the one degree by one degree gridded data set um, and they created a smooth coastline all the way from the, the regions considered in the national report, the Eastern Gulf region, all the way up through the, the, the South Atlantic region. Next slide, please. All right. So then, so what they did is they essentially took that smooth coastline and those gridded data, and they extended it in a linear way. So that's a, a representation of that um, kind of linearly extended um, coastline. And the, the vertical black lines represent kind of the Gulf uh, margin of Florida, Pensacola. Um, the black line on the right is uh, the north coast of uh, the east coast of Florida, so that'd be Jacksonville. And so what you see, as I said earlier, is when you look at total sea level rise and the projection given here is the 2040 uh, time horizon, is that um, the, the sea level rise is remarkably uniform, right? The blue line is the total. Um, the orange, dark orange line is the ocean components. That's the thermal element and the stereodynamic components. Um, the yellow line is the vertical land motion. And the kind of purple line is essentially the mass components. That's uh, freshwater storage in the form of glaciers um, and, and land storage, et cetera. And the, the total obviously is the sum of those component parts. So next slide. So again, this slide looks very much like the last one, but it bears on that conclusion or deals with that conclusion that the projections for, for Florida are remarkably similar or align well with the, the global projections. And essentially what it's saying is that anywhere in Florida that the, um, the main elements of the global projections, which are essentially the thermal elements, right? Um, when you couple those with the vertical land motion, that that's what you see in Florida. So they align quite well. Um, the analysis though, implies that there's no regional dynamics here, right? Or they're not important. And the alternative, of course, is that they are important, right? And 
they are not captured by the global models in the national assessment. And that's important to know moving forward. And certainly it's gonna be um, an effort of this group, um, both the sea level rise group and the rainfall group. And again, I'm not gonna steal OB's thunder. I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about that. So next slide, please. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Again, this is just supporting data that says that, um, that the deviations at any point along the coastline um, are, are relatively small relative to the average. It justifies using that single value for any of the projections moving forward. Next slide, please. All right, so these are the confidence intervals for the projections um, for 2040, 2015 to 2070 time horizons from left to right. They represent the low, intermediate, low, intermediate, intermediate, high, and high uh, sea level rise projections. And there's, these are things that everybody in this room has seen, right? It's not surprising as you move further out and extend the time horizon that the, the variation around those median values, which are the black dots, increase and you get greater separation because of left confidence in what's gonna happen as we move out in time. Um, I think what's important here, and people probably should pay less attention to the variance per se, but the median val values, which are the black dots, because that's what the exceedance probabilities are based on, right, moving forward. And, really are the basis for the decisions that planners make um, moving uh, in their work, excuse me. So next slide, please. All right, so what does all of this mean? Um, you know, we're again, trying to put it in a risk-based uh, framework. And so I'm gonna probably read some of these because I think they're important. Um, you know, the, the national report and essentially this work group really assessed the national assessment and kind of made it applicable to Florida. And, um, and there, the, the exceedance probabilities given in that report um, are for uh, various uh, emission scenarios, right? This particular work group focused on the three degrees temperature uh, increase scenario based on the emission um, mitigation efforts that are in place by 2020. That's the most likely pathway. Um, but regardless, if you're going to use these data, right, you have to make a decision, right? We can't tell everybody what to do, and that's going to depend on your degree of risk tolerance moving forward. So in, in, in short, the group really, and I'm going to go to bullets two and six here, um, I, I think that the group didn't uh, spent a lot of time considering those. They thought that they weren't of, of much value. Um, but if you look that uh, for the intermediate low projection, uh, it has an 82% chance of being exceeded. And that could certainly be appropriate for applications where there's a very high risk tolerance. Um, again, if you go to the intermediate projection, it only has a 5% 5 5 chance of being exceeded. And again, that's a moderately risk-based decision. And then finally, the immediate, intermediate high projection uh, has less than 1% chance of being exceeded. And so uh, folks that are fairly risk averse might be considering that and things in the decisions that they're trying to make moving forward. Next slide. All right, so again, I just wanted to show people some numbers, right? And this is again, is based on the most likely scenario. The projections are given on the left or excuse me, the time horizons are given on the left, the 2040, 2015, 2070 time horizons, various uh, scenarios, sea level rise scenarios of low through high or on the upper part. The values are in millimeters and inches. And so what you can see here, and I'll go just for the moderate risk tolerance thing. In, in 2040, we're looking potentially at 10, 10 inches of sea level rise, right? And 2070, we're looking at 22 inches of sea level rise. I think it's important to note that all of these um, projections um, are um, the benchmark year is 2020 or 20, 2000, excuse me, right? And so they have to incorporate sea level rise that's taken place for the last 20 years. And in Florida's case, it's probably just a little less than four inches, depending on the projection in the scenario that you're looking at. Next slide. All right, so next steps. Um, um, I think 
there was a lot of discussion given the um, the interest in the probability of exceeding any particular uh, scenario, right? Um, I think the group felt that they can do a better job at uh, characterizing those exceedance probabilities at shorter time horizons um, and for various emission pathways, not tying them specifically to temperature. Again, it's important to note in the national assessment, everything is based on 2100, right? And so you have to take with some confidence that the, the nature of, the, of sea level rise is not changing, right? And, and again, that's something else that, that people don't quite understand. When you actually look at the, the projections for any particular time horizon, um, that's a discrete time period, right? So you're not actually getting smooth curves. People look at these and they, they tend to refer to them as sea level rise rates, right? I wouldn't look at them that way. And maybe that'll come up in the, in the panel moving forward. Uh, the group also recognized that there's probably some biases in the vertical land motion estimates that are provided in the national report. So they'll examine those, but they're relatively small and they'll certainly get swamped out as you extend further along in the time horizon. Um, there's a, a strong interest in exploring the regional ocean atmospheric processes. Again, not only by the sea level rise group, but by the rainfall group. Um, and then they're going to continue to look at some of these other things as well. Um, they're going to look at the, the, reg the regional tide gauge analyses, some of the satellite altimetry data to kind of validate the gauge data so we can see if we can use that empirical data right in some decision making process it's moving forward. Right now, I don't think the group is very comfortable using that tide gauge data for that purpose. And then uh, finally, we're going to look at uh, the impact of run upon flooding risk. It's more of a problem on the West Coast. Um, we don't expect it to be one on the East Coast per se, but something that we're going to look into. So thank you for your time, and I'll yield my time to Obi. The tricky situation. All right. Not sure, this is, I'll hold it. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see some familiar faces. Uh, I know some of you are new to the committee, so I'll try to set the stage for why this talk might be relevant to what you're talking about. So if you can bring up the first slide. Uh, um, I'm the, I have a long name, Jant Obeysekara. They call me Obe for obvious reasons, I guess. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I'm, the direct, uh, I'm a research professor and a director of the Sea Level Solutions Center in the Institute of Environment at FIO. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of topics today. Uh, I'll try to, I'll try not to get into too much detail, uh, but stay at a higher level, but in the panel discussion we can have. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned, I will cover two topics. Um, in, in, in the agenda, uh, first sit on the scenario development. You know, basically the idea is we are planning for future condition. If the climate change is relevant, will the hydrology be the same in the future? So can we come up with some scenarios for regional model development? And I've done some work uh, sponsored by the Florida Water Management District. And also I was asked to look at these uh, teleconnections, you know, basically global phenomena affecting the rainfall patterns in Florida, revisiting this concept of uh, particularly Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. I'll talk about that very quickly. And then uh, picking back on what Tom mentioned on Florida flood hub work, particularly on rainfall extremes. And we have a, a two-pronged approach, uh, what I call short-term and long-term. Um, and then uh, the relevance to this is uh, we had a workshop in 2019, I think some of you attended that in FIU, we kind of set the stage for this short-term and long-term approach in that meeting. Next slide, please. So why is it important? As you heard, there is a lot of regional models being used. I won't go into detail on that, but I think the concept here is like, team here is uh, we are planning for future condition. Can we use the historical hydrology 
for planning for major projects like what we are talking about. Um, and, and this concept of stationarity, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but the, I think the idea is to have a paradigm shift to non-stationarity. These are a couple of regional models. Next slide, please. And this is the only animation that I have. So th there was this paper in 2008 that kind of raised a lot of interest in the concept of non-stationarity. Um, so I think pursuing that a lot of people have been working on this. What are these scenarios into the future that we should be using? Next slide, please. So we have followed pretty much what is being done in California. You see on the left-hand side, I won't go into a lot of detail on this. Um, you see these yellow boxes, sorry if we're colorblind, but the leftmost um, boxes. You know, first step is to look at the observed climate data and see, are we seeing any evidence of climate change already? That's the first step. And I think Carolina might be talking about trend analysis. And obviously under future condition, we start with the general circulation models. And we all know that they're very coarse. Um, some of the models have a Florida is underwater, uh, but we need to use some uh, dynamically that was a downscale data set. But we look at those so two periods. One is a, what we call a retrospective simulations for the past century and uh, 21st century of the current century projection. And, and we look at the downscale data sets, statistical and dynamical uh, downscale data sets. And we look at how well are they representing these teleconnections and also how can we use them for future planning? Next slide, please. So we have been looking at two um, suites of models uh, at the global level, um, what they call Earth System Model Database. Um, one is uh, CME5 or Climate Model Intercomparison Project version 5 or CME5. And then we have started looking at um, CME6 uh, suites of data that I will be um, talking a little bit about both. Next slide, please. So for the downscale data sets, uh, we have looked at, um, you know, these are a lot of acronyms is, that we have been using called LOCA, MACA, Codex, and Jupyter Verb. These are basically different versions of downscale data set. You know, first two are about six kilometer statistically downscale data sets. The Codex is a dynamically downscale data set using regional climate models. Uh, and then Jupyter Verb is something that was used here in the region sort of an hybrid approach uh, for looking at extremes and also for uh, long-term averages. Next slide, please. So this is the approach we use for scenarios. You see on the left-hand side, the local data said, the idea was, can we come up with scenarios for regional modeling into the future? You see on the base condition on the left, um, you see that um, the historical data set is like you know variability, and the other ones are more smooth data sets, kind of look at the, if you take out the natural variability, are we seeing any trends? And, and the idea is looking at base and future under future conditions, which is in this case, 2050 to uh, somewhere around 2080, what are the scenarios we should be looking at? We have about 27 models and large number of um, ensembles of these models. So the idea was, that, that was proposed was to do, come up with like five to 10 scenarios of climate model output that could be used for regional modeling because it's not practical to run all the models with the regional models that you heard about. And so this is what, uh, and what you see here is there are more drier conditions in the future compared to the historical um, data. So we picked like five scenarios that could be used under future condition. And you see that in the same kind of pattern in, in, in the other data set called MACA. Next slide, please. So the other interesting um, aspect we need to be thinking about is the seasonality change. And so you see that um, the, the, the solid blue lines are the the 1950 to 1999, these are the retrospective simulations for the historical period. And then the, the box and whisker plots are more for the future condition. So we wanted to look at, is there a seasonality change in the, 
in the uh, in the rainfall patterns. And what you see here is actually a reduction in summer rainfall and increase in um, early dry season rainfall. This is very significant if it is uh, accurate, right? So, because I think we are trying to plan for future conditions. So this is some, uh, something we have found. Uh, next slide, please. We, we also look at the new um, data set CMIP6, and you see the similar kind of pattern, maybe not as much drying in the scenarios, but seasonality change is very similar. So kind of two models data sets showing a similar type of patterns for both seasonality and long-term rainfall. I think that's significant that needs to be looked into. Next slide, please. So the other aspect we look at is this teleconnection. The idea is that the remote um, global phenomena like El Nino, um, La Nina, or Enso, and Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation has an impact on Florida rainfall. You see this, this graphic showing the periods of rainfall and its variability fairly well aligned with this AMO cycle. Now, they, they don't like to use AMO anymore. It's called Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation because it's not a regular cycle. These are multi-decadal cycles. So now they prefer to call it Atlantic multi-decadal variability. So the question is, what, what is the latest thinking on this? It used to be considered as a natural cycle. So we organized a panel of experts recently, this year actually in May, to kind of get the recent research input on AMO. And I'll give you one slide showing what the outcome of that is. Next slide, please. So what they came up with was the, the AMO or AMB has a fairly strong influence on the, on, from the external forcing which means volcanic eruption, aerosols, but more importantly, greenhouse gases. So if this is true, that future rainfall might also be influenced by this external forcing, not a natural cycle. And, and, and when you look at AME variability, in, it's supposed to be increasing beyond up to 2100. And this could be significant for that teleconnection to Florida rainfall. And precipitation in the summertime is also projected to be increasing in this analysis that was done. Next slide, please. So I'll get into the Florida flood hub part. And that was on the you know, averages and scenarios for rainfall. This one is more on the extreme rainfall. I think Tom gave a nice uh, outline of what Florida Flood Hub is doing. So we have a short-term strategy, basically based on statistical approach to look at climate model output to compute what, uh, what is known as a change factor. In other words, is my 100-year rainfall, how much is it going to increase, like percentage increase? So this work was initiated with the help of um, US Geological Survey. And, and I think in this part, um, John Stamm, who is on the line, may be able to provide some answers to some of the questions may, you may have. So the short-term part to produce these statewide change factors for extreme rainfall, using the statistical approach, is pretty complete now. If, and then it's only the report is pending, and this data has been released. The, interestingly, you know, we wanted to use a physics-based approach to look at extreme because I think the concern is that maybe that physics of what's happening in climate in Florida might be important for extreme, particularly at sub-daily scale, not only the thermodynamics part, but also the storm dynamics might be changing. If you hear about what happened in April 12th in Fort Lauderdale, you know, 25 inches of rainfall in, you know, within a short period of time. So, the idea is to use a long-term climate modeling approach using a weather research forecasting model, uh, a sequence of other models that I will explain real quick, to look at the long-term changes in extreme rainfall using physically blaze based climate models on a long-term basis. Next slide, please. I want to explain, uh, I want to go into the detail of these change factors. This is the statistical approach that was used. Um, this was published. It's a nice report, um, well peer reviewed by USGS, and, but it only covers South Florida. 
but now the work has been completed by Michel Irisari and others at USGS and the statewide data available. And we are looking at that data to see, can we, how can we um, you know, assess that data and release for statewide use. Next slide, please. So let me talk about the long-term effort. Long-term strategy is to tie some of these scenarios to temperature changes, like I think Tom mentioned for sea level rise. Can we come up with um, scenarios for two degree, three degree, three degree mean global warming? but use the relative to the historical scenarios. In other words, if you have a simulation for historical period, how would they change if you have a warming scenario with the two degree or three degree? And so this is what they call a pseudo global warming approach. And, but the timing of when that warming might happen might change from one um, greenhouse gas pathways to another. Next slide, please. So it, Real quickly, this is kind of showing when the two degree might occur by 2100 is one scenario in this particular case, maybe SSP 4.5. Um, and three degree might be another higher scenario. Instead of following a path where the idea is can we tie these scenarios to a warming level? Next slide, please. So I won't go into the detail, but three levels of modeling. We have a global scale model to coupling of ocean and land uh, by, you know, proposed to be done by University of Miami using their model, uh, 50 kilometer scale, 10 kilometer scale on the ocean. Then we will use a regional atmosphere ocean model to kind of zoom into with a 10 kilometer scale within the regions. Um, that will be done, uh, that's proposed to be done by FSU. And then finally, USGS will do the weather research and forecasting model work, one kilometer scale and hourly output. And there's a lot of research to say that, show that you really need kilometer scale modeling to get the dynamics of storms happening. Next slide, please. Uh, so the idea is to, and these are very expensive runs, so we only will run 2011 to 2020 uh, historical scenario and then sort of like, um, you know, using a delta approach to run some warming scenarios. These are 10 year simulations and hopefully we'll have 50 years of simulated data at a very high resolution for the state of Florida. I think that may be all what I have. Next slide, please. Okay, I think I did okay on time, right? Okay, good. So you may have a lot of questions, but uh, I don't know what, the, are we having question and answer later or? Yeah, we'll hold until after um, okay. the panel's sure. finished. The rest of Carolina speaks. Okay, so. Carolina Moran is speaking next, um, coming to us virtually, and she's going to talk about South Florida water management state trend analysis for predicting extreme weather conditions. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, you can. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, the invitation to be here. Uh, I think I'm going to tie in uh, straight to some of the points already presented by both Tom and, and Abby. Um, please uh, go to the next slide. Um, so yes, I'm here as the South Florida Water Management District and I think that slides helps us to contextualize how we are approaching this question. Uh, so we do have a system, the Central and South Florida project uh, that we manage. So it was built in the 50s to respond to those extreme events that occur we had both significant drought and um, hurricanes and, and flood events that happened in the past. And uh, it was understood that we needed a system to be able to manage water in this region. Uh, next one, please. So the system is started to be built. And um, um, I would say it may, uh, at the same time the system was being built, um, those unintended consequences were, were already being um, detected and were already being reported. Um, and so, the significant effort of really addressing some of those unintended consequences of the system uh, started and we have um, significant efforts through the comprehensive Everglades plan to really um, work on the side of the 
restoring uh, ecological functions that were lost because of this, the way the system was built and also ensuring that we have um, a way that we can preserve, maintain, conserve all those available um, ecological functions in the system. Next one, please. And then we have just the yellow book that I'm showing here that have those significant projects. And I know I don't need to talk about this with you all because you're all really experts, but uh, I think it's important to make the point here of, yes, we have a system that was built and that, yes, we have the significant efforts right now happening to be able to address those unintended consequences. Next one, please. And um, the, the other statement that we want, it's important to make here is, when we think about the water management district, the, the functions that we do in terms of water management and the role of like looking at resiliency, uh, we have to recognize that ecosystem restoration supports the mitigation against sea level rise and other impacts from a changing climate. We don't have a lot of publications on that topic yet. We are making progress on BBC uh, on the way that we look at that, but there is evidence. It's, it's very obvious that the work that is being done by, by Everglades restoration is already providing significant resilience when we talk about what are the types of metrics, resilience metrics that we wanna look at in the region. We have already made some progress just with the projects that we have been implemented and all the efforts done here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about those metrics next, but uh, anyway, just to reinforce that CERP goals in general are aligned with adaptation strategies needed to build resilience in South Florida. Next one, please. So um, as we look at that, as we look at the system that was built seven years ago, as we look at all the significant progress that was made to serve to restore ecological functions, we also need to be looking at other changing conditions that we have in the region, um, including like population growth, land development, uh, and really the project itself that has been evolving. So next one, please. I think the important piece is just to, to look at that, like how much development occur how many things have changed since the project was developed and continue to change as we look at those uh, future evolving conditions from a climate perspective as well. Next one. So um, I'm gonna touch one piece of that, which is one of the, the, the major um, issues that we have in the system right now in terms of how are the limitations uh, for a system that was built to, to train the communities and what's happening today too on those um, on the areas that those communities live. So we do have coastal structures there. The system is a gravity system. We do have coastal structures that operate by gravity. And the major issue we see now in the capacity to really operate and maintain water levels in the region is that uh, with the sea level rise and between four, six inches already occurring um, in Florida, the capacity of the discharge of the system has reduced significantly. So from the design conditions to today's, we already see an, an, a significant reduction in discharge capacity, which limits our ability in general to operate the system for all the purposes, not only flood protection, but also to maintain water levels during the dry season and all the other aspects that we have uh, there in terms of water management goals. So this uh, video here, I don't know if it's gonna play, but just show what's happening in one of the, our coastal structures where we see tail water, so the ocean side, so high that is overtopping. So even the design conditions from the past did not even account for that change. So even with freeboard and all the other considerations that are done when we design a structure like that, we are already reaching overtop in, uh, in one of the, the coastal structures in, in the most vulnerable parts of the system, which is in South Miami. Um, and on the left here, what you see is the number of days when we have tail water, uh, elevations higher than headwater. So the inland cannot really discharge when the tail water on the tide side is, is, is higher. So we are here just taking an average of those, those total number of days that we have every year. Uh, next one, please. Okay, the video is playing and you can see that the, the water really overtopping the gate um, at this location. This, this is ocean water, is salt water coming inland, really defeating the purpose of the gate to be there to control saline intrusion as well. Next one, please. So yes, based on that, some of those observations and I think I'll be pointed really well, the first step we need to do is to look at data. It's look at, to look at trends. And we have this effort here uh, that we call water and climate resilience metrics. 
So we, the district already actively monitors a variety of water, climate, and ecosystem data. Uh, we understand that those changing climate and evolving conditions have a significant impact on water management operations and also in the infrastructure needs. And so we have implemented a set of initial metrics, we have 15 now, to really, to really monitor and document trends and observed data. So any shifts in trends in observed data. Uh, next one, please. Uh, on the call, I also have the, the, the person who is leading Zephyr, Nicole Cortez, she's coordinating with technical leads inside the agency to collect the data to interpret and to report on that. So here basically is a, is a glance of those 15 metrics that we have. We have climate driven, like the primary uh, drivers of change here, rainfall, ET, and tidal elevations at coastal structures. Um, and we also have what we are calling resilience metrics, which are consequences of changes, like the cascading impacts from those initial drivers of change there. And we have saltwater intrusion, we have groundwater levels, minimum flows and water levels, flooding events. Um, we have water quality uh, for uh, um, parameters there that we are uh, looking at data, salinity at the Florida Bay and Biscayne Bay, soil subsidence, and also estuarine island migration. So we say that as we operate the system and uh, we have capacity to interfere in those resilience metrics, that's what we need to be kind of tracking as well. So we will continue to monitor the climate, rainfall, ET and tidal. And we also wanted to look closely at those additional resilience metrics where the, the decisions on water management will have implications. Next one is. Uh, oh, since we started this work about three years ago, uh, we have been publishing uh, some of those results in technical analysis and the reports. We have the initial report that really lines up the plan on how we want to do this analysis and explain the 15 metrics, show the additional metrics that we might want to approach in the future. And um, this is the image on the center. And on the right, we have the, here the um, the famous South Florida Environmental Report, we have a chapter there to be, it's the third year we are publishing now, that we go metric by metric and we explain assumptions and, and do a more scientifically uh, analysis of how we have been reached to some of those initial trends, what's the significance of those trends, what's, what are the process and assumptions behind. Next one, please. We also have a hub where we publish the data. So this hub is more like public it's oriented towards public access and sharing this information, mostly with the local governments. We understand that as a regional agency, looking at this data and looking at this analysis, we provide valuable information that will be considered in planning processes, in other processes, uh, also advanced by local governments in the region. So we have designed this portal to be a way that um, all the partners in public in general can access and have readily available information on how we are looking at these trends and can download the data and can make this, the, the, the analysis, reproduce the analysis and, and really um, make the, their own interpretations on what the data is telling. Next one, please. So um, I will touch quickly on three, four of those uh, data sets. Of course, I'm not gonna have time to go into too much detail. Uh, happy to answer any other future question that we might have. But just to give you a glance of what we have now. So in terms of rainfall, observe rainfall. Next one, please. We have here three um, images. So uh, the analysis was done by region. In all the other metrics, we have uh, the data at the by station, real-time data monitor, and, and the station um, available data. For rainfall, the, um, the technical leads here uh, supporting this effort recommended that if we look at a station by station, we still have too much noise in terms of how we look at observed data. And we decided to perform the analysis at a more regional scale so we can start seeing some of those trends. Even at the regional level, we are still seeing some noise. Uh, we do have some regions like uh, when I show here the East Calusahatchee uh, region and the Southeast Florida, where we have detected significant trends, upward trends in uh, the wet season rainfall. So this is average wet season rainfall and we are detecting upward trends uh, in the more in the um, west coast. Uh, but we also have, for instance, the Everglades agricultural area where the, we detected uh, 
a lower, like a, a decreasing trend in uh, the wet season uh, rainfall here. Next one, please. Uh, the next metric that I'm touching is the tidal elevations at the coastal structures. Next one. So here, what we have is, uh, in addition to NOAA data, you might, next one, please. In addition to NOAA data, as you know, we have significant network of, um, of um, monitoring for tidal um, elevations in our coastal structures. So throughout the coast, maybe on the East Coast, but also we have some monitoring on the West Coast in our BCB system. Um, so we have uh, data that goes back to the 19, uh, early 1950s, 60s, sorry. And we have been monitoring those trends. And of course, as expected, along with the, the NOAA uh, tidal stations, we see the, we detected upward trends, significant upward trends in all those stations. And we do have now real-time data and real-time trend analysis being done in the system. So we can kind of monitor this um, additional set of data here to look at uh, a tide of elevations. Next one, please. Uh, the next one is saltwater intrusion. Um, next, next, please. Uh, this metric, uh, we look at both groundwater levels and chloride concentrations as they are related when we want to assess saltwater intrusion. Um, so what we have here is one of the locations. Uh, we also have to report some um, um, noise here in terms of areas where we see upward trends, areas where we see downward trends. Uh, specifically for this example here that we are showing in North Miami, we see um, for this chloride, we see an upward trend. This is the red line and the red dots here in the chart. So in this specific location, um, the, concentration, the concentration of chloride had already surpassed the 1,000 um, um, milligrams, milligrams per liter here for there. And we have, you know, we see a steady upward significant trend. Um, and what we see in this location in terms of groundwater, it's um, a downward trend. That's the blue line and the blue um, uh, trend there that we are seeing on this chart. So for the same locations, um, the map on the left show where we have data for both the, the chloride and the groundwater levels. And we can uh, look at those sh same charts here for all those locations along the coast, significant amount of data there. And again, the trends are automated. We can go to our DB Hydro Insights and already look at those plots for all those locations. Next one. The final one I'm going to touch today is soil subsidence in South Florida. So this is another um, metric that we are looking at. We don't have all data in DB Hydro. We don't have a fully automated uh, analysis yet here of trends, but we did look at data that has been collected in partnership with some universities in South Florida too. Next one. And what we have there is, um, those are the most, most of the locations that we have data. It's uh, in the Everglades National Park, Florida Bay. And uh, we see here some trends. I, I captured two of those examples uh, in an area that is frequently flooded, in a site that is frequently flooded. And what we can see here is um, accretion rate, the accretion rate, the elevation change in the expansion rate for this location and, and some trend being detected there. And the same occurring in a permanently flooded site, um, this TS-18 location, again, pointing to the rates that we see the elevation rate and the accretion rate. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, all those tools and especially on the hub is really um, being the designed with the purpose of communication and in, engaging public and other local uh, governments as well. So we, the goal and for this effort, and I have to applaud Nicole there is in the line here too for her big contribution in terms of really helping to translate those scientific information into a way that we can that can be easier to understand with here real time data access and really more interactive features so we can have um, a, a greater understanding of what those initial trends are saying. Next, please. And what we have here, um, I know Wabi also shared share this slide, uh, this the, the, this report in his slide. So moving from observations into projections. So yes, yeah, we look at all those trends and we also need to start thinking, okay, are we observing a trend? How are we gonna be looking at that into the future? What's happening into the future? And that's definitely not an extrapolation effort. It's a much more complex effort. So we, we need to be rigorously looking at those climate models and all those um, additional approaches. So 
we can interpret how we build those scenarios and how we look at the future conditions. So in this case of rainfall, we, we have a workshop that was um, organized um, with in partnership with FIU um, to really develop these strategies um, of short-term strategies, looking at the available downscaling data sets and then the longer term strategy, what I'll be just presented, which is really developing a regional climate model for the state of Florida that can help us capture unique occurrences from a rainfall perspective that are uh, particular to Florida. Next one, please. Uh, Obi, I, I don't need to present too much details on that, but uh, Obi already touched and uh, I think it's uh, great that we are now moving to a statewide projection, but what we have here in the same portal is the data that was developed for South Florida. So uh, we have here provided access again to users, to public and, and local governments, to the results that USGS and FIU produce uh, for South Florida. We have an interactive portal as well as part of the, the whole metrics hub where we have the whole data, the links to all the USGS reports and all the information developed for this study. So you can go by each county and by each rainfall region and you can, um, the user can get access to what is the projection there, what's the range of uncertainty and, and how to navigate on making assumptions. And just a point here that is important to make, what we have now is really looking at extreme rainfall change factors for flood resiliency planning. So we are really focusing on the extreme wet. That was the initial part of the effort. We are now again in a, a partnership with the USGS and FIU to also look on the extreme dry side. Drought was not a metric that was initially selected for the, for the hub because of the lack of uh, comprehensive data sets that we could beginning to look at. But we are definitely and certainly looking at drought. We have this partnership now with the USGS and FIU. The work has been making some initial very interesting um, progress. And we are really trying to also capture those the, 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 the extremes. I know I'll be show you when we look at those, those those scaling data sets how we are looking at average and changing in average conditions and month to month, um, but also as part of looking at future projections, we need to be able to fully capture those extremes: the frequency, the intensity, the duration, and the spatial distribution of extreme wet and extreme dry events, because this is gonna drive a lot of how we wanna ma manage water in the future. Next one, please. So we're gonna go through and uh, we can move quickly to those, but this is just the portal from the US yeah, GS data release that was produced for South Florida. Next one. Um, we also have there, next one, please. We also have there the report that the district produced on how to adopt those um, scenarios. So USGS produced the overall range of um, how the, the, the different dynamic data, dynamic and statistical those scaling data sets are showing future rainfall in South Florida. And here we produce our internal document on how we want to adopt that as part of planning efforts. So we are still on the planning arena, but we do have significant planning efforts. So we made a report on how we are adopting and, inter and interpreting those results and bringing that to future scenarios as part of the district planning efforts. Next one. We also have in that portal, uh, a glance here on what are those change factors for South Florida. Uh, what we see here is in average, I would say a 20% increase if we look at the median values for all those locations for both the 25 year one day duration and the 100 year three day duration. Uh, and it, of course, it varies a little between those, those counties. Next one, another way to see that is also plotting those, those change factors. Uh, and just quickly to, to tell you what's a change factor. The change factor is the multiplication factor that we are using, that we are deriving from the climate models to really project from the um, events from the past from, for each given return frequency, 100 year, three day, 200 year, one day, what is the multiplying factor that we wanna use when we model future conditions like 50 years from now, that, that was the horizon that we used for this study. So here you can see also that of course it increases a little bit, um, also the uncertainty range as we look to longer, um, to more intense uh, events here, the 200 year. Next one, please. Um, one thing that we are also looking with both USGS and, and FIU 
is, uh, for instance, I, I think that event from April 12 tells us a lot of stories in terms of, is this a new normal? How we wanna be able to capture those extremes? How we wanna represent that when we look at trends and shifts in our system? And also the importance of looking at refined scales if you wanna reproduce the rainfall right in Florida. Obi also touched this point. We need a, a one kilometer resolution to able to to really capture those localized processes that are significant uh, on the way that we should make decisions for water management. Next one, please. Next one, please. Uh, next steps on this effort is really, um, we are advancing this partnership with the USGS FIU and, and, and the South Florida Water Management District. I didn't touch, but when I talk about drought, that also belongs to a larger strategy that is our water supply vulnerability assessment. We are going to begin stepping into that as soon as we finish the Lower East Coast Water Supply Plan. For the first time, our groundwater models will be uh, capturing sea level rise, and we're gonna be doing variable density analysis to be able to look at future conditions of sea level rise. And we are also gonna bring the climate drivers um, in, the, in the start of the next, uh, I, I would say mid, I would say late spring 2024. So we're gonna start bringing those climate scenarios and sea level rise to a longer term water supply vulnerability assessment. We will continue to refine the analysis. I'll be touch on the sub daily data. There is significant need for us to also look at trends on sub daily data and also uh, bringing CMIP6 data to, to the analysis. We, have, we are heavily, uh, I would say, utilizing CMIP5 so far and we need to be able to see what else is being uh, said using those more recent data sets. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I, I touch on the water supply vulnerability assessment. I don't, I'm not going to try to, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to describe, but we have a whole report. It was attached to the resiliency plan this year. If you want to uh, get an understanding of how this is going to be done, this is the approach that we're going to be using to do the water supply vulnerability assessment. Next one, please. Um, I also, I, I didn't explain, but um, as we build this data and as we look at those scenarios, future scenarios, uh, I mentioned right now the water supply vulnerability assessments. We also have a program in place that is almost a decade now that is looking at the flood risks, flood conditions and into the future. That's our level of service program, flood protection level of service. So here is a glance on really what this program is looking at future conditions and assessing flood risks in Florida. We have looked at all those basins there uh, on the lower east coast. You can see Orange and reds are the ones that are underperforming already today. And even yellows are already underperforming in terms of what we want to achieve uh, in terms of flood protection level of service in those basins. And for future conditions, next one, we see a lot of reds. So 50 years from now, we see a lot of those basins will be really underperforming and really like a five year rainfall event could be certainly causing significant flood risks to all those areas that we have in right there in red there, sorry. Next one. And finally, what we, oh, we have a uh, similar effort happening right now at the core. It's the CNSF flood resiliency study. It's running in parallel to the level of service program. Of course, it's a significant effort. We're gonna be looking at flood risks and partnering with the core there to, to be able to uh, validate all those assumptions and, and um, vulnerabilities that we're identifying for that and plan for what are the, the adaptation strategies needed. Next one, please. And um, all of that is being integrated in our um, resiliency planning. So we have um, the 2023 Sea Level Rise and Food Resiliency Draft Plan here in this slide. It was published uh, on May 24. We received 20 plus comments from different agencies. We are finalizing the, the, the plan this year um, with addressing all those comments that were received. And uh, what we, this plan does is based on all those scenarios, looking at those future conditions, what are the infrastructure needs that we already have being, that uh, already were identified for South Florida in terms of really managing the system from a, to address all the, the needs that we have there. So flood protection, water supply, ecosystem restoration, ecosystem uh, ecological functions. So, we are looking at that and really highlighting key projects that we need to be able to advance to continue to, to successful manage water in this region. Next one, please. I have two more only, I believe. Uh, so those are just the visions. Uh, um, I wanna skip that one in, in terms of saving times. Next one, please. 
Um, but uh, all of that really belongs to our integrated efforts in the region to um, address those future conditions, to bring those two scenarios and to start lining up what are the infrastructure investments needed to continue to perform. Next one, please. I have one project here to highlight on the plan. This is our Everglades mangrove migration assessment. This is a project that is looking at team layer placement in some of the mangrove areas. Uh, we have a tentative site near the Florida Bay there. They're gonna be testing upon funding confirmation, really to look at what's the capacity of soil accretion. I touched the soil subsidence uh, topic in, as one of our metrics. We wanna be able to validate what kind of natural processes can be um, accelerated here to be able to give, um, provide higher uh, resiliency in the region through natural processes, to, to, to really enhancing mangrove sites. Next one, please. Uh, and the final message here is, uh, we are looking at all of those efforts. We are looking at all the SERP efforts. We are looking at the efforts done by the communities to protect themselves. We are looking at efforts done by the water management districts to manage water. Uh, in a way that will be continued to successful delivering those, those needs of the communities in the, into the future. Uh, and the big message here is that we need to be able to collaborate with everyone. There are multiple goals, there are multiple strategies, and we need to line up those, those um, resiliency strategies so we can be successful in the region. Next one. And uh, with that, I would say thank you. These are links just for you how to get involved in the resiliency program at South Florida and, and get updates from all and subscribe and get updates. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Carolina. We're going to postpone our scheduled Q&A and hold it, combine it with the last one of this session. And we'll move straight toward to Southeast Florida climate resiliency efforts. And this is with Jennifer Urardo. that the presentation that was received yes, uploaded okay. You know, okay. So, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, contribute. I, I had a chance to thank you. Whoops. Last time around and, and appreciate the opportunity to share again. Um, I'll admit, um, and if the presentation can come up, please um, admit that uh, while the uh, presentation is titled Southeast Florida and a lot of our work is integrating of all the work of Southeast Florida, I'm most familiar with what we're doing in Broward County, but it does have, um, you know, great regional relevance. Next slide, please. And so I wanted to begin by acknowledging we have a, about a 20 year history of developing our climate initiatives, strongly informed by policy and planning documents at the county level, as well as the Southeast Florida level. And when I refer to Southeast Florida, I'm referring to Palm Beach County, Broward County, Miami-Dade, and the Monroe and Keys. And we've been working with the four counties for about 15 years on coordinated climate resilient strategies, both mitigation and adaptation. And there's been a really robust foundation. Some of the tools that we're applying as it's evolved and been endorsed through the four county collaborative, which is the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact. And I want to acknowledge that that technical work is strongly supported by federal agencies, as well as academic partners. So a lot of the work that I'll reference today has been informed by uh, input by NOAA, USGS, um, Department of the Interior, I guess, larger level, um, um, South Florida Water Management District, uh, University of Miami, FIU, and there are others. And so um, because we have a history of working over the last 20 years, um, I would like to, um, I guess, uh, articulate that much of the partnership like FIU's work and, and OB's work has helped to inform what we did here in Broward County. And a lot of that work was then scaled to the regional efforts. And so you'll see a lot of overlap in terms of the data, um, because I think um, we've been able to pilot regionally so much as um, what has been needed. Uh, statewide, and it's really great to see the refinements today. I would also acknowledge that we also strongly believe that it's important to be able to have the flexibility to address regional needs within statewide frameworks. And, and again, a lot of work already being done um, that is embedded into our standards, embedded into our models, and embedded into our planning. Next slide, please. 
Um, so uh, you've heard and seen reference to sea level rise projections, of course. Um, this is the projection that we use in the four county planning area. Um, we know um, this is our third iteration. Um, we benchmark most of our planning to the NOAA intermediate high. It accounts for other scenarios. Yes, we also include the NOAA intermediate low because of state planning requirements, but we plan for NOAA intermediate high. Um, we utilize uh, data that came from not the most recent NOAA update where we know that NOAA um, had adjusted their projection downward. Um, we'd already adopted prep projections. We already have these, um, the 40 inch sea level rise scenario embedded in our planning and models. And it's really important when we're working at the local level that we're not changing projections every three to five years. And our business community really needs to have the certainty about what they need to plan for and how they design. And we need to have consistency and in infrastructure across scales of development. So uh, we felt very comfortable staying with the 40 inches uh, by 2070, uh, also benchmarked to 2000. And if we don't hit it in 2070, we know we'll hit it a couple of years later. And so that, that's where we continue to work. Next slide, please. So this was, uh, again, four counties. Um, it's used across any entity that's doing work in our communities. I also want to acknowledge that we are not stagnant in the way that we approach planning for future conditions. We are constantly in a situation of iteration. As you know, science comes, you consider the science, it's peer reviewed, provides recommendations, and then we have to go through the lengthy process of county adoption and implementation and amendment of standards, the modeling that happens at the local level. So it's it's constantly underway. And a lot of the work I shared today was informed by um, projections at the time, which were for 27 inches of sea level rise by 2060. Now we're using 40 inches by 2070. So now we have planning tools also that are crossing that decade and the projections being used. So one of the questions asked is how are we using the information? Next slide, please. And this is all the areas of progress. So we have um, embedded into our uh, land use planning requirements and it's important to know we have, as, as there's all kinds of ecological system considerations and, and so forth, I'm, I'm, I'm really focusing on the, the built environment today and I'll acknowledge that's the bulk of where um, um, our, our work is taking place. I acknowledge see, um, planning for water supplies. I'm not going to really be addressing that here, just kind of narrowly um, focusing my conversation. But we have to address issues like design standards for infrastructure, land use, infrastructure siting, level of service. So our challenge has been, how do you take a sea level rise projection and begin to embed it in all the areas of practice and importance in local government? So one of our first applications was just straight bathtub application of the sea level rise scenarios, knowing that we would bring this into our more advanced hydrologic models. But we wanted to not use the, lose the opportunity to inform smart planning in areas that we knew to be at increased risk simply because of proximity and hydrologic connection to the coast and waterways influenced by sea level. So we um, now have a tool whereby if we have projects in our, our vulnerable areas as indicated in the pink and we updated the map for 3.3 foot sea level rise, also again, 40 inches. This is how we evaluate at a very uh, high level risk and resilience requirements for infrastructure. So what does that mean? Next slide, please. Um, one of the first and early uh, efforts was focused on drainage and water management requirements. This work was very much um, undertaken and continues to be advanced in partnership with the USGS. We modeled the change in the groundwater table with sea level rise, red areas of the modeled map on the left show the one-to-one -one connection graphic in the middle shows a cut um, cross section west to east in Broward County. You can see the shift in the historic groundwater table in dash blue to future conditions groundwater table in uh, solid blue and land surface elevation in um, brown. And so we have uh, the amount of storage that's being lost in our system in the groundwater soils with rise in sea level. So we needed to account for that. 
um, as part of um, seasonal trends, as what's happening with time, what's happening in different geographic locations in the county. We adopted an updated map that now requires all drainage and surface water systems to be designed in accounting for 2.5 feet of sea level rise. This was an earlier adopted map. Next slide, please. And we're in the process of continuing to undertake that work. As we can see, there's no slowing in the, um, in the, the rate of uh, at which rise is being realized in the groundwater table. It's most prominent in the central and southern portions of Broward County. This is uh, from a well in, in Hollywood. Next slide, please. And uh, because that signal is strongest in the eastern portions of the county, we're currently undertaking an update for the eastern portion of the county that now aligns with the 3.3 uh, uh, the, the 3 .3 foot sea level rise scenario. And we're um, bringing those maps together. So we're um, in the process of stakeholder engagement. And we expect adoption of the updated map again for the 3.3 foot sea level rise scenario, 40 inches um, with implementation by the end of the calendar year. Next slide, please. Um, and we could just move on. Thank you. Old map, new map. So the next area of work um, really related to the increase in flood elevations and really needing to be able to um, integrate through our advanced hydrologic modeling, the relationship between the primary canals managed by the South Florida Water Management District, of course, constructed by the Corps that are part of the entire Everglades back from water delivery system how those interact with our secondary canals, which we have about 1,800 miles of canals in Broward County that are managed by several dozen water management entities, how that relates to all the drainage and water management infrastructure in Broward County, and how that cascades to flood elevations that uh, impact our structures and our ability to navigate in our communities, looking at different design storm events, but here the focus really being on the 100-year uh, three-day event. Um, this was significant work because it was the first time where we took our advanced hydrologic model that has been used by Broward County Water Management District, FEMA, all these entities having historically used our integrated model, but now we integrated the effects in this case of two feet of sea level rise, extreme high tides, super saturation of the groundwater table with sea level rise, and a 13% intensification of rainfall for the 100-year event. And we went through an exercise whereby we arrived at the 13%, which was an initial approach then applied regionally, but I'll talk about in a moment. And we developed a countywide updated future conditions flood elevation map with more than 350 different flood zones uh, or elevations and, and well, zones throughout the county. And today, any project that's being advanced has to conform with the highest of flood elevations that we have developed in our county. And that includes application of the FEMA map, including the coastal A zone, uh, includes our future conditions map, includes site-specific modeling or 18 inches above Crown of Road. But we do have this model, this map, and the uh, rainfall intensification that's been integrated into this uh, map adopted since and applied since 2020. We're now in the process of updating this map because subsequently we have an adjustment to the sea level rise projection and we want to be able to incorporate the, the um, 40 inches of sea level rise. We also were unable to account for the influence of storm surge in this modeling and the constraints on the primary canals and the discharge abilities, what happens with water levels in the canals and how that relates again to all the cascading of infrastructure back into the inland portions of the community. But when FEMA was doing their work and coastal liaison was just not being um, uh, modeled at that time, the data was not yet av uh, available. So we knew that we were moving forward with a map that would soon need to be updated based upon these forthcoming conditions. Next slide, please, or, or data. I just wanted to share uh, that we did go through an exercise whereby we arrived at that 13% change factor for the three-day 100-year event involving 
many of the same entities that have already spoken today and that have referenced you know, various data sets and statistical and dynamic downscaling, noting that we had to be able to move forward with rainfall intensification. We knew that it was taking place. Again, we adopted a map in 2020, but the project was a three-year project going even before that. So a lot of work already embedded in what we've been doing in Broward County. But as we got ready to undertake this map update, we also knew that there had been additional work that had taken place and that additional data sets, I think it's called MACA was the most recent one that got brought in. That wasn't part of the data here. And we knew that the district and FIU and USGS were coming up with, unfortunately, rainfall intensification even greater than the 13% that we had incorporated at this time. So next slide, please. Um, so at, it was, I'm not sure which is the next slide. We jumped through several just now. Are we sure we're on the right slide? I just want to make sure I don't, is this the right slide that moved after the flood map image? It, I'm not sure who I'm speaking to. <laughs> Stephanie is okay. So, okay. So this is okay. So we're on the right slide. Thank you. I apologize. It just moved around a bit. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that uh, we went through an exercise, our team, in evaluating the various design storms. That last modeling accounted for the three-day 100-year, but we knew that there were other design storms, especially because we look at issues of, you know, roadways, level of service. We wanted to be able to address not just um, finished floor elevations for flooding. So we looked at our data. We also looked at the updated data that came from the USGS South Florida Water Management work. And then we looked at all the data that had come from uh, FIU. And we, we, we knew that there were some ranges, but based upon this whole of change factors that was evaluated across these different analyses, we then settled on 20% as the adjustment that would be brought in as an updated change factor for the next work. So we moved from 13 to 20, and we're applying that to all the design storms, um, both shorter duration, like the one day or, or you know, several hours to the, uh, the, the three day, it seemed to be relatively consistent. Next slide, please. Okay, and so now we're in the process with our current modeling effort of undertaking combined scenarios for all of these conditions. All these uh, tidal conditions, sea level rise scenarios, both two foot, three foot, king tide, storm surge, uh, variable and saturated groundwater table, um, rainfall scenarios for the various design conditions. And so there's, I don't know, more, uh, more than 36 or three dozen different combined scenarios that are evolving from this for the purpose of then working to select scenario that can support the whole of adaptation planning, not just for uh, new and redesigned infrastructure, but for the community that already exists in Broward County and isn't going to be redeveloped immediately. Next slide, please. And so uh, where we are right now is we've uh, completed the no action analyses. Um, these are examples of the viewer that we're utilizing to um, assess or compare those scenarios and also truth these scenarios with some of the more significant recent events that have been, um, uh, that we've experienced. So just as a matter of orientation, the map on the right would represent basically what we have in place right now with our um, two foot sea level rise scenario flood map. The map on the bottom left incorporates the three, everything else being essentially the same, but three foot sea level rise plus the 20% rainfall intensification. And the map on the right, right, bottom right is worse of worse. And it includes 100 year storm surge on top of everything else. And so this isn't necessarily the condition that we plan for, but it's one that we use to reveal for ourselves what those conditions look like. And for us, it was just um, coincidental that we unveiled this map precisely at the time that we were in a conference room that looked like this, and we experienced the April 12th rainfall event with the 26 inches. And while we didn't model a one in a thousand year storm, which that ended up being, the flood elevations aligned very, very closely. Five feet of sea level rise at the air, or excuse me, flood elevation at the airport, and two to three feet of flood elevation in many of the communities that did see those water levels. So it did really reinforce 
those conditions can exist. And we were also able to look at how did that relate to some of our primary canal uh, considerations. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, and I'm gonna get to that in a moment, but one thing I did want to articulate is that um, one of the tools that's been very helpful, I think, is the uh, USGS FIU Water Management District work to uh, aid local governments with those change factors. We kind of played with the tool and we assisted some of our cities uh, through the compact. This was a compact exercise in undertaking vulnerability assessments. And so for those communities that don't have those um, massive robust models, can they assign a change factor to their planning? Because we all need to be able to move forward with infrastructure planning. We tested that tool, the exercise compared it to our hydrologic model results and they align very, very well. So our quick tools that can support um, local governments in these exercises. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through the details of our resilience planning effort, but noting that the intent is to address virtually every scale of infrastructure planning that we have control of within Broward County with support and engagement and implementation by our municipalities. We don't own all that, but we have to have compatibility of these planning scenarios with what happens with the regional system. And that's basically what we said last time when we were here. And it's been the point that we've been advocating to the core and the district for the last 10 years. The district's known the exposures um, and limitations of the primary canal network. And we know that this system needs to be reevaluated for the future conditions and upgraded to be compatible with everything else that's already taking place throughout the region and beyond. Next slide, please. And so we saw with these extreme storm events, you know, high concentration of rainfall. Next slide, please. The limitations of the primary canal system to be able to move water during these rainfall events. I won't go through the details, but the high tide signal is reducing the flows and the canals, the water levels are continuing to build. And that cascades because a lot of the communities in our region have gravity systems that have to be able to drain downhill into the primary canals. And when the canals are not moving, water is not moving anywhere else in our systems. Next slide, please. The same thing played out uh, with the April 12th rainfall event. Next slide, please. Even though this was principally coastal, if we look at the C12 canal, we saw a five foot rise in the um, elevations in that canal. We've never seen that. I think the right, right, increase before had been three to four feet exceeded anything observed previously. We have advocated and advocated for intensification of rainfall as part of the 216 or resilient study that, that Tim's going to be talking about. I know at one point in time that was still being debated. I think that that's now going to happen, rainfall intensification. We just know that it has to be part of the way that we plan and we have to have that capacity in our systems. Next slide, please. And so um, my final slide is just this, acknowledging the real critical importance of what happens with that regional system. We all rely upon it. We're planning moving forward very quickly at the local level. We need to see these updates. We need to see consistency in the way that we're viewing future conditions and be able to account for the influence of sea level rise, rainfall intensification, the increase in storage that's needed in the system. And the primary canals are part of that ability to move water and maintaining the discharge capacities that Carolina um, referenced. So we view this as an immensely critical study and hope that uh, we see that um, those kind of um, scenarios carried to the uh, broader uh, regional work that you're all interested in as well. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jason Engel and Tim Geisen of the Corps on South Florida Regional Resiliency Studies. Good morning. Um, so that's a couple of pretty amazing speakers to follow. <laughs> the density of information in my slide deck will be lower than that. Um, yeah, so a little context for the South Atlantic Coastal Study. Um, and then Tim is gonna come in and talk about the CNSF Resiliency Study. So the comprehensive um, study for Southeastern Florida or Southeastern United States started after the hurricanes of 2017. So Harvey, Irma, and Maria came through and did damage all across the Southeast. And it was inland and coastal. And it resulted in um, authorization to conduct this study starting in 2018. 
took place over four years, and it concentrated on coastal storm risk. Uh, it looked at it in terms of economic, social, and environmental vulnerability. Um, there is an immense amount of information all easily discovered online. You can do a simple Google search for South Atlantic Coastal Study. It's all out there, including a web viewer that's a pretty interesting way to look at the data and break it down and visualize it in different ways. So if you're interested, it's definitely worth a visit. Um, obviously, the areas from North Carolina to Mississippi is shown here. Um, it was a collaborative effort with stakeholders. The audience for this is a little bit different than a typical core study. So typical core feasibility study, the, the target audience, although it involves the public and stakeholders along the way, the target audience is Congress because we want them to authorize a project. Target audience for this were decision makers at all levels, elected officials, municipalities, states, um, other agencies, right? We wanted to provide a common context for coastal risk now and in the future with climate change. And so this, a study of this type had been done in the Northeast after Hurricane Sandy came through in 2012. And that proved the value of it to set a common context regionally across several states to say, what, where are the most urgent areas where coastal risk has to be addressed and where the Corps and other agencies could focus or collaborate? It gets into the role of the Corps' authority and also the role of local, state and local governments to address issues. And, and as you heard from both Dr. Moran and Dr. Hirado, uh, there, is, there are efforts taking place at all levels um, to address coastal resilience. And this study definitely highlights the need for that to occur at all levels. Next slide. And so it does align with, I just wanted to show this as another, um, another uh, document that this board might be interested in, this committee might be interested in reviewing this R&D strategy for the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, the South Atlantic Coastal Study aligns with those highlighted items there to mitigate and adapt for climate change, support resilient communities, and ensure environmental sustainable and sustainability and resilience. So the study um, took significant time to look at the environmental vulnerability of systems in the Southeast to climate change and storms. Next slide. So the goals of the study are on the left and you can see a common, a common operating picture. This, was, this is what I was talking about. We wanted to provide decision makers at the federal level, state and local level with a common operating picture of coastal risk now and in the future. Identify the high risk locations, identify risk reduction actions, at all levels, uh, you know, promote and support resilient coastal communities. So the data was intended to help jumpstart resilience efforts where maybe there hasn't been much momentum, right? Certainly in Southeast Florida, there's a huge amount of momentum on resilience, right? But in some places, it's barely getting off the ground. Um, and that's what this study was intended to do is to provide a, a stepping stone or a first step for communities that might not have as much momentum. Sustainable projects and programs, so in order to evaluate coastal projects, we need a comprehensive storm database, right? It's the foundational element of any coastal storm risk management study. Is what are the storms and what are the climate scenarios? This provides a state-of-the-art, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, a state-of-the-art database on those storms that's publicly available and really um, it's a game changer for the way that we do our coastal studies. And then obviously leverage ongoing actions. So we have this, what's called the geo portal, which is the, the uh, site that I, I recommend you uh, poking around and looking at the data, um, providing the, the key data and products and incorporating the findings and ongoing efforts. So there are studies that are, gonna, that are coming out of this or that were recommended even during the study. So the, this uh, Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Storm Risk Management Study that's going on right now we already knew that there was high risk in this back bay area. So that study was started during, during the um, four years that this was going on. But there were now beginning study in Key Biscayne to look at the same thing um, and St. Augustine. So these are all areas that were highlighted in this study that are moving on for, for uh, full feasibility. Next slide. So we just, the point here is that, that we leverage data really from all available sources. There's quite a bit of effort put into looking at the available data and, and incorporating it into the analysis. 
Next slide. And so applying the tools and the, the steps that you see there, the, the one through nine, if you think about the one through five is how far we took this study, right? When we go to a full level of feasibility, we're going to go all the way to step nine, where you're, you're developing and implementing a plan. You actually construct it in eight, and then you monitor and adapt in step nine. So the feasibility studies are going to take that foundational information that we developed in step one through five with this and build on it to complete those final steps. On the right is a graphic um, that's from that um, GIS viewer of the data. And Southeast Florida, or Florida in general, had nine of the top 10 most vulnerable locations in all of Southeast, and that should be a surprise to no one in this room. Um, and like I said, several of those feasibility studies have already started. Next slide. And so the coastal hazard system, this is the storm database that I spoke about. I'm going to have two slides on something that took millions of dollars and years. And it's, a, like I said, a game changer. It was something that I had personally wanted to see us have after seeing this developed for the northeastern part of the United States. We've been asking for it. And unfortunately, sometimes the opportunity comes after storm events. And that's what happened here. So we now have the storm database. It's available, as I said, publicly. It's very robust. And, it, and, and boiling down what it does is it provides a set of plausible hurricane storm events and extratropical storm events, both with existing water levels and with future sea level change. And where that's really important is in bay and estuary areas where there's a nonlinear response to sea level change, where storm surge is going to be get greater, not in a linear fashion, but in a nonlinear fashion with sea level change in bays and estuaries. That's really important to know. And so that information being baked into this is very helpful when we look at our back bay studies. Next slide. And so this is just the coastal hazard system and, and uh, you know, how it was really developed. There's a storm suite development and hazard quantification. It goes through this data storage and distribution process and data application. Um, what's interesting is that last acronym there, we're the core, so we're very good at acronyms. Um, the last one, CHRPS or CHIRPS, is actually um, something that they're working on now, which would allow us to use the database. And when you have a storm coming up through the, the Caribbean, you'd be able to take a look and say, which one of the storms in our database are going to are statistically most likely to represent this storm when it comes through, or which set. And so you can provide quite a bit of information without actually making new model runs. So it's a, a way of operationalizing a database. Um, and, and that, as I said, is not quite online, but it's coming and it will be a, a pretty significant upgrade in terms of how we can you know, forecast storm surge um, operationally during events or previous events. Next slide. Okay, and this is where I'm gonna turn it over to Tim Geisen, who's virtual. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my sound coming through all right? Very well. Very well. Okay, great. All right, so as Jason said, my name is Tim Geis, and I'm the Resilient Senior Project Manager um, working out of the Ecosystems Branch in the Jacksonville District. Um, so this is the first time I'm addressing Sister Bond, something other than Lake Okeechobee, so I'm kind of excited. So next slide, please. All right, so I want to first try to kind of tie together everything that you've heard so far when we talk about resilience. Uh, I think this is a really important slide and everybody's kind of touched on the fact that it's a, a multi-level effort. There's no one entity that can tackle resilience, whether it be the sci science or the solutions, at one level. It requires a, a collaboration of all levels of government. Uh, we've heard what what both uh, what things are going on at the county level from Dr. Harado at the state level um, from Dr. Uh, Moran, and there's a lot going on at the federal level as well. So how all of these things kind of work together requires us to be very collaborative and communicative to make sure we're all going in the same direction and can fill the holes uh, under our, each of our authorities. Um, so it's really, really important, uh, this collaborative effort. And we're all working towards the same goal, which is a great thing to, to be doing uh, when we talk about resilience, and that's to build a sustainable community resilience. 
And when I say community resilience, that means all systems, both natural and man-made, uh, that are able to overcome events and adapt to changes over time. And that's what we all want to achieve is that, that community resilience across the, uh, the region uh, in South Florida. <clears throat> So next, I mean, our water resource infrastructure is that connector between all of these different systems, whether they be a natural ecosystem, a flood risk management system, our transportation systems, <clears throat> which include uh, roads, airports, ports. Um, all of that works together to, uh, to build a resilient community, which can then thrive both economically uh, and for the people in uh, flora and fauna that live in those communities uh, to live a happy, healthy, and productive life, which I think is what we're all trying to do. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about a little bit of a different um, kind of way of thinking, <clears throat> especially from the core side of things. We're very stovepipe oriented. We have business lines and ecosystem restoration, flood risk management, navigation, coastal storm risk, and we're very used to thinking about things just in those categories. But <clears throat> what we're kind of doing now through what we're calling project integration is really thinking about how all of the projects function together <clears throat> to create multiple lines of defense, and that's defense against changes, that's defense against events, uh, to make sure that those systems are adaptable uh, to change and resilient um, throughout time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what this graphic shows is kind of a cross-section <clears throat> from the coast to the inland areas. Uh, excuse me. So it just kind of shows linear, linearly how these projects really fit together and where they come into play. So we have multiple authorizations for coastal storm risk management, which Jason talked a little bit about. So that's beaches and back bays. And those things are kind of the first line of defense against coastal storms. And then you move and transition into that overlap area in the inland areas where we typically talk about flood risk management. And then finally moving into the further inland areas where we talk restoration, particularly SERP, which, um, I like to call the Comprehensive Everglades Resiliency Plan because it's a huge part of the resilience effort in South Florida. Now in this, between the dashed lines that you see here is really a transition zone where we have effects from inland flooding and coastal flooding. So that becomes a really important part of the evaluation of projects in these areas, whether they are coastal or flood risk management. So in order to try to think about these projects, how they work together, we in Jacksonville are thinking about things in a little bit of a different way. Uh, next slide, please. And that's through project integration. As I said, our projects, our authorities, our funding, our technical guidance, our tools that we use typically fall in a stovepipe under one of our business lines. But the challenge is because of all these things all work together, how can we really integrate them throughout their, their life cycle? So what we've started doing over the last year is really looking at uh, integration of all of these projects, whether they're in planning, construction, or operations, um, to really understand how they fit together. How can we talk about them working together? Uh, so that comes through two main areas um, or integration themes, and that's communication and technical integration. So communication uh, is really between the teams, it's be between our projects and our vertical um, reviewers through uh, South Atlantic Division and headquarters, and it's communication externally with our stakeholders, with our sponsors, uh, with the general public, so that we can all really be understanding how our projects function in the greater scheme in that pyramid to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction, to make sure that we are sharing data across projects and to make sure that a solution in one project isn't negatively impacting uh, potential solutions in other projects. But also to understand how the, how the benefits that we can see from all of these projects working together are, are really having a positive impact on the region. Uh, in building that community resilience. 
So that second part is the technical integration. And that comes from, again, the project team sharing data, utilizing data that um, other governmental agencies are developing, which we've heard a lot about, and employing that information into our projects in a consistent manner. And then also, as we're working through studies, making sure that the, the way we're looking at benefits, the way we're uh, calculating uh, benefit ratios, the way we're looking at comprehensive benefits is consistent so that we're all talking with one voice when we go to get authorization on, on projects. So it's kind of a new concept in, in a way that we're, at least for now, with our multiple authorities, trying to make sure that we are integrating all of our efforts. Next slide, please. And this is just a different way spatially to look at all of the projects we've got going on. Just in Dade County alone, we have six major federal actions ongoing right now. Uh, three big planning studies, or actually four planning studies, uh, and several construction efforts. So um, really making sure that we are coordinating between projects is more important now than ever before. Next slide, please. All right, so just I'm sure everybody's fairly familiar with the Central and Southern Florida project. Um, huge multi purpose project it's authorized by Congress that really is the water resource backbone of South Florida. And everything, uh, most of the things that the Corps does are related to CNSF in some, some respect. SERP itself is a modification of CNSF. The operations that we have ongoing are part of CNSF. Um, and then these tie into our coastal projects, uh, even though they're outside of CNSF. Um, but it's really important that this, this is the backbone, but it was designed, as Carolina mentioned, 70 years ago. And there has been a lot of change since that time, uh, which we now must try to account for. Which takes us to the first project I want to talk about, and that's our CNSF flood resiliency study. So next slide, please. All right, so I want to do just a quick overview of what this study looks is looking at. And I think both Dr. Harado and Dr. Moran touched on the needs in the coastal structures, the salinity control structures, which are the outlets to the CNSF system, and the impacts that climate change has had on those already. So this resiliency study is going to look at those structures in particular, those high risk structures along the coast, to try to improve the conveyance capacity of those structures so that they can handle increased runoff, uh, increased sea level rise on the tailwater side of those structures to make sure they can continue to provide their authorized purpose. In conjunction with looking at the structure capacity, we'll also look at the canal conveyance capacity of those primary CNSF canals that bring water from the inland areas to those structures. Now, one part of the, the overall uh, initiative that we're no longer able to uh, tackle under this particular authority is the volume of water, the changes in urbanization, the loss of storage um, over time that we've seen. More water is getting into the system and less storage is available to hold it back and keep it for the beneficial purposes um, that, that are needed across the system. So those, per, those that volume problem will be tackled under future efforts. Uh, so this one will focus strictly on the conveyance capacity of the canals and structures along the coast. Uh, our projected finish is in 2026 in time to get into a potential word of bill that year. So we're trying to move through this quickly because we understand the urgency of these solutions. Next slide, please. And this will be my last one. And this is a, a new authority that we just received in the last word of bill uh, for a comprehensive central and southern Florida study. And this one is pretty exciting because it's a, different than past studies. It's because it has multiple authorities. We can look at storm and flood risk management, water supply, ecosystem restoration, uh, and other related purposes, um, including recreation, navigation, and, and others. 
So planning for those all in one study effort, which is a different way to do things. Um, the integration effort is what we're doing now, but hopefully this type of study is the way we move into the future to really look at these water resource issues. So this will cover the entire CNSF area, uh, which is the entirety of the South Florida Water Management District, plus a portion of the St. John's River Water Management District. Uh, so we will likely be working with both of those agencies on this effort. Um, and it really will focus on that uh, strategic community resilience um, item, as well as long-term and short-term planning. So tackling things that are urgent, but also looking in the long-term to create that uh, resilient community. And we'll really look at comprehensive benefits, which is a, a, a newer thing for the core as well. <clears throat> so with that, uh, we'll likely kick this off in fiscal year 2025. So we're still wor working through the initial uh, discussions and looking at when uh, we would be able to get funding and line up all of our uh, scope and our sponsors and all that good stuff. So this is an exciting thing to keep an eye on. Uh, it would not have any negative impact on the ongoing work that we have, whether it be SERP or other projects. It will build upon all of the great stuff that's already going on. So with that, I'll go ahead and close out. Um, appreciate the, the invitation to speak today. Hey, thanks, Tim. Um, we'll move to our panel discussion and we'll devote about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for that. So if I could have all the panelists uh, to the front. If you avoid the two middle chairs, you'll avoid getting the light shined in your eyes. <laughs> If our virtual presenters can turn their cameras on, we'll spotlight you here in the room. <laughs> you don't think it's a lot. <laughs> think so. But yeah, sure. that's not Questions? Go ahead, Wendy. And I'm just looking at the last report and recommendation that the core and the district should proactively develop the district. This is a time process that the first minute to take advantage of all this stuff. Um, I don't really understand. The current relationship between each of these efforts and serve and how it would be I suspect that Dr. Moran will will talk a little bit more about it, but what I would say as a lead-in for her would be that we're very much engaged with the water management district's efforts that she outlined, right? So we have our own scientists and experts that are part of that. Um, we're very much looking forward to having those scenarios. Um, I think as Dr. Hirata mentioned, there's a desire to incorporate those into the 216. There is, we will certainly want to incorporate those into the comprehensive study that Tim talked about um, in his last slide. So those are brought to bear in those. As we obtain really actionable um, precipitation change scenarios, we can bring those into our operational studies, like the SEP operational study that's going to replace COP. You know, when when we when we have those scenarios, they can be brought in. So I would say that we're integrated and we can act on those. Um, we have our own climate community of practice. Um, we take the new science that's developed and pass it by them and get acceptance at the core level for that. Um, we've done that in the past and we'll continue to do it. I would also just add that. Um, as we evaluate Army Corps of Engineers projects, while we have guidance that says we shall um, evaluate the project for the three sea level change scenarios that the Army Corps has in our guidance, where we often incorporate the other scenarios. So we're not, you know, we're, we're not we're able to incorporate other um, work like Dr. Browder presented. Thank you. 
So when you say scenarios, are these the scenarios that Obi is talking about? Or are they the scenarios that Jennifer is talking about? Ultimately, um, the ones that we are concentrating on are the ones that the Water Management District is developing because that's our partner in SERP, right? And in operating the CNSF system. But I know that they are engaged. So I'll let Obi take over. Yeah, actually, scenarios work that I reported is sponsored by Water Management District. So I'm hoping they would look at our recommendations and, you know, uh, they will uh, use or develop the scenarios further for the region of modeling as a standard practice. I was thinking, for example, uh, decision scaling or stress uh, tests like what Casey Brown typically uh, promotes, I think. There's an opportunity to use these scenarios to look at future alternatives, um, not just using historical hydrology, like what is being done right now, for future conditions and use some sort of a risk-based framing. I am happy to end here. <laughs> After you, Dr. Fraser. <laughs> All I just say, you know, and Carolina, thank you. Um, I mean, from the flood hubs perspective, right, we're trying to coordinate with all of these folks, right? We certainly spend a lot of time with the district, uh, all these group, the USGS. I mean, we're fairly agnostic with what we're trying to do with regard to who receives the data. We just want to be able to provide the best of data available. And if the water management district in the partnership with the core or any other entity wants to use it, right, um, then, then they should, right? Again, the goal from our perspective is, is recognizing that everybody, whether they're in South Florida or not, has a need um, to better understand how rainfall patterns are gonna change, right? What is the, the likelihood of a, of a, you know, some type of a, a frequency event or something like that. And so knowing that, identifying all the partners, right? And, and just making sure we're, what we're trying to do is get people to recognize that we're all working in this space, right? And so we'll just provide the best information that we possibly can. Yeah, and what I was gonna add is three basic things. One is, as you can see, all of us are speaking about the same players. We have been coordinating in the region since the work started, I would, I would even recommend Broward County was the first one who really applied those future scenarios when we talk about rainfall. And of course, sea level rise has been incorporated in many efforts, but we are all talking. It's this, basically the same players and we are exchanging information so we can find as much consistency as possible. And this is great news. Like we are revisiting and working on the same data sets and the very same approaches so we can find more and more consistency. And all of us are speaking the same language, making the same assumptions and evolving in the process together. This is a very, um, I would say, we are still navigating with a lot of uncertainty. And the more we talk and the more we discuss and the more robust science we incorporate to that, the easier it will be for us to fully incorporate those scenarios. So the second thing I was gonna say is really the science. We need to be able to bring really robust science to be able to back up assumptions to help us on validating those scenarios. Uh, I think working with the USJS, FIU and other universities, we are now bringing uh, to the statewide effort, FSU, UM, um, other universities that are, are represented through the stakeholder um, panel, like the scientific panels that are put together through those work groups at the state level. So I feel uh, we are doing this part of science. We are doing this part of uh, collaborating between us. And finally, the third point is we are being fully transparent. Like all the data that we are creating, all the assumptions, all the codes that we are writing is, are fully available for everybody to review, to, to in, provide input, to help us make the right assumptions here and validate how we can really get to those scenarios. We have everything that we have done so far available in the website of the district. We are creating those tools that we can provide real-time access to the data as much as possible. And the main goal of that is also to get feedback, to get the, the information that we need the feedback that we need, the considerations that we need, assumptions that we need to be accounting as we evolve on those processes. So we are trying to build in a way that as we navigate in this uncertainty, we, we make the steps that are right to make, that we are all understanding, yes, that's the right 
step to do now at this point. We are feeling comfortable to move in this direction as we build those scenarios and not just feel overwhelmed and don't take any action or even don't do any, any, any scenario because we are feeling that we don't have enough data. We need to learn how to navigate on this uh, uncertainty, but also having the opportunity to review how we can make the best assumptions at this point and how we can all collaborate in, in, in building those scenarios without ignoring what you know, is happening there and what the data is beginning to show us. Hey, Helen, and then Margaret. No. Oh, sorry, Jennifer. Missed. Sorry, no, I, I raised my hand late in the process, so I think I appreciate jumping the line. I just want to acknowledge that I, I would agree. I think that there is a great deal of collaboration, information sharing, and intent to align scenarios, and, and just as we adjusted our work um, based upon updates, I would um, I would think it useful to ensure that we don't allow or you all would be very watchful to make sure like rainfall intensification isn't left out because someone said it was too expensive or uncertain to include. You know, when when decisions are made that um, overlook or um, exclude key opportunities that are represented everywhere else, you know, that would be a concern. Um, having scenarios that would be, uh, I think, artificially driven to a low scenario, like NOAA intermediate low, good to have for planning. But if somebody benchmarked a long-term project on that scenario, I think it'd be a huge misstep. Everything else is being aligned, you know, to higher scenarios. And, and we still have entities that will reference NOAA intermediate low as the basis for key infrastructure planning, which we all have dependencies. So I think it's a, uh, a watchfulness to make sure that you don't see outlier scenarios being the ones that move forward where everything else is aligning to something that's more capturing of a larger envelope of likely scenarios rather than the conservative ones. Um, thank you everyone for a really great set of talks. Um, I found it really interesting and um, horrifying at how much work you all have um, in front of you. Um, and this might not be the right panel to address this question to, but I'm wondering if you know the extent to which or if scenarios and these projections of rainfall, sea level rise and extreme events have been incorporated into ecological models and into consideration of what some of these ecological indicators of um, ecological restoration um, for the future. I'm not sure that was a complete sentence, but maybe you get what I mean. Uh, if, I, if I can chime in, uh, I think the LTER group uh, is looking at future climate scenarios for their work. And I think, and John Kamniski is here, they could probably respond, but they are already looking at um, some of the future climate change scenarios in their work. That's the only thing I could add. For South Florida, we have, um, so we incorporated three mat metrics so far in the way we look at the observe trends and shifts. Um, I mentioned the salinity in the Bay. I mentioned the peat accumulation, uh, soil subsidence, and I mentioned the migration of um, uh, mangrove and other uh, important um, communities that we need to be able to track in terms of ecological response. Um, th so we are tracking those. We did one assessment of the migration of those um, uh, um, communities <laughs> in the base. We did. We have a paper that we published along with the SERP team that is looking at climate change scenarios and how does that mean in terms of transitioning of those communities, vegetation communities there. Um, assuming different rates of soil accretion there too. Uh, I think we're beginning to look, but for me, the best example to, on South Florida of how we are looking at that is BBC here. Uh, I don't know, uh, Jason, if you want to talk about it, but this is definitely the first planning effort that we're doing, that we're accounting for silver rise, that we're bringing those scenarios. 
and are looking at some of those ecological responses and even building scenarios in a different way because of the way we wanna be looking at that. Um, there are very interesting metrics that are being brought to that. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit more, Jason, on that. Well, they, yeah, that's a good example. And the one that I was gonna bring up is so the, oh, yeah. So the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades um, SERP project is incorporating sea level change into the regional hydrology. Um, this is a first, right? So the previous projects, many of them were further inland, perhaps less affected, uh, arguably, but um, certainly this one needed to incorporate it. So we're bringing sea level change into that. And then the performance metrics, and I'm going to be out of my lane here a little bit as the engineer, um, the performance metrics on that BBC were likewise uh, adapted to, to be able to pick up on the changes in the hydrology through time. And so um, perhaps as a follow-up, we could give you more information on that. But um, we are making strides in that direction. I would say that was the first step forward was to get sea level change incorporated, right? Now we're talking about hydrologic scenarios when those are ready to be actionable, you know, and, and incorporated and we're, we seem to be there. And so I think the next studies are the ones that are gonna bring both. John has the, rant, the hand raised. Yeah, John, would you like to speak? Yeah, can you hear me? Here we are. <laughs> um, so th this is something just as an aside, uh, is that uh, part of this work that we're doing with the Flood Hub and with South Florida and Carolina um, is that as we've been looking at evapotranspiration responses in terms of the, the hydrology of um, and hydrologic modeling and so on. And what seems to be a big and important part of that is stomatal resistance. So uh, just to bring this up is that that is something that we're trying to incorporate is that, you know, temperature change can affect evapotranspiration, but uh, when you get more CO2, those stomatic close and you don't get as much water loss. So just to bring that in is it's kind of an ecological thing, but that is being considered an important part of the, the, the water budget. Margaret. Um, thank you for those presentations. My question actually goes back to the coordination uh, question that was brought up before. So you, you all, as you said, work together and collaborate. Um, has there been some effort at coordinating who develops and hosts what kind of format? Has there been some effort at standardization uh, formats and forms and so on so that, um, for example, modelers are not having to struggle with how they're going to uh, uh, format the data or how do they use data from whom and so on and so forth, just making it easier uh, for those who are doing the modeling to use those data. And then related to that also, what's the timeline and, and process for uh, providing updates on those data? I mean, I just speak from the Flood Hub's perspective. Again, I think we recognize that there's a great deal of kind of variability out there and how people approach different projects, right? And, and we recognize that, you know, one of our um, kind of most important stakeholders are the water management districts, including South Florida, but we've got Southwest Florida Water Management District, we've got St. John's, Suwannee, and, and Northwest, right? And they all have different uh, ways of, of kind of carrying out their, their business, all, how they do their modeling. Um, and so what we're looking for is to coordinate and work with those groups so we can understand kind of what the common needs are uh, and to the extent possible, try to provide tools uh, with some standardization. We can't standardize everything. I think we recognize that, but to the extent possible, I think we're trying to, to make some of those tools interoperable um, moving forward. So um, so that's, I guess, my answer. I think Bobby wants to chime in as well. Yeah, I think uh, Flood Hub would be a, you know, a great entity for, for you know, sharing data, archiving data, and you know, those that are being worked on by the Flood Hub efforts. But in terms of modeling coordination, you know, perhaps uh, you may be aware that there is something called an interagency modeling center at the water management district. That's there's a collaboration between the SIP water management district, Army Corps, and I think BOI. Uh, so that's where the standardization of the modeling, the same version of the models are being used and the data sets are basically standardized. 
So I think at the regional scale, that level of work is being coordinated. Even at the sub-regional scale, USGS is involved in many of the modeling efforts. So there is some good coordination among the mo modeling for various applications, but I think Flood Hub would be a good place to um, also standardize, not only data, maybe also models when we get into the modeling. Uh, can I add something here? Um, just quickly, um, on the district side, we have a portal. So for the data side, we already show you all the data and how we are bringing the information with the same goal that you highlighted here. And sorry, I couldn't pick your name. My, my, the mic here is not so good. So I apologize for not addressing the, the name of the person who asked the question. But uh, from the data side, we have the, the portal and we are hoping we can achieve consistency on the way that we all look at the data and apply them to build scenarios. Um, from the modeling side, the district also has a repository of modeling tools and results and input data that's called SMMS itself for the modeling um, system. I'm missing a word there, but it basically every model that we develop is made available there. And we can, and any user can download, get the input data and get uh, the modeling setups to be able to reproduce analysis. But I wanted to touch one piece because I think it was very interesting and it was one of the slides presented by Jennifer. So um, we, we, the district had um, advanced the future rainfall uh, work with the USGS and FIU. We published out the, the results of the data, all the change factors, all the assumptions in the portal. And then the local governments start looking at that and said, okay, I wanna be able to use that as part of my resident Florida vulnerability assessments. However, some of them do not have an edge and tool that they can use when they are doing their vulnerability assessments. So the compact that uh, one of the, the, the partnerships they're doing now at the level is to produce this document that is going to be uh, really uh, helping a, a local government to make some assumptions on how they can still translate rainfall intensification into their vulnerability assessments when they don't have an age and age readily available for them. So I, I think this is a great example of how we can collaborate and kind of really help all of us to make assumptions. And thanks Akin, he put the whole link there. I, I didn't know you were here, but I knew you would be happy that we mentioned the SMMS system there as well. Okay, our last question for the session is gonna come from Charlie. So thank you. I had a question for Jennifer. Uh, could you give us a little bit of uh, information on the feedback that you get from the local communities and businesses about your work? I I just interested in how they're responding the, to the type of work that you're doing to just give a little perspective on, you know, the local engagement and yep. concern about these issues. Yep, absolutely. And I did just want to acknowledge on the modeling side, I, I mean, I don't want to talk about hyper-local things, but 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 there is a, an extensive amount of uh, sharing. All of our work is um, made available to all the cities who then apply it at the very local level. So we're trying to make sure that all the boundary conditions are correct when we, you know, scale things to different types of applications. And then just reiterating that the county's model reflected decades of development. The district took our model, improved it for application in their work. FEMA took our model, improved it for application in their work. And then we've always taken that same model back after they approved it and improved it further. So we're all very familiar about the tools and the resolution at which these types of models can uh, work and apply and continue to enhance them rather than starting at ground zero every time. So I think that's why we're so well positioned is we've developed shared confidence in a model that reflects everybody's enhancements with time. And then on the, um, on the local issues, you know, the, the most controversial was when we were starting out with the, um, the, the, um, the groundwater table map. And it was the first time we were talking in the community about new standards. And uh, there was a response from the development community and some of the engineers that were working and saying, um, you know, we're going to push back hard on this. And uh, they wanted to, um, though, I think challenge some of the scenarios uh, with the assumption that maybe we were being very extreme in, in what was being painted. 
But we came back and had said, look, we worked with the USGS. These are all the scenarios we looked at, and this is the one that we're advancing. And we went further and evaluated, what does this mean to development projects? How would you have taken this exact same project and developed it under these future conditions? And we were able to bracket that the cost increase was about 0.6 to 1.6 increase in the total construction costs in order to really do the same project, but in but design it for future conditions. And with that, it was a quiet conversation and we moved forward with all of our recommendations to the county commission without any opposition, actually. And um, the business community as a whole has ha had said early on, just give us the number. We don't wanna have a competitor who's getting a sweeter deal because they're not being held to the same standard or we don't want every other project to go down to Miami-Dade, for example, because they don't have the same requirements. And so it was about creating uniformity and certainty in which they could make investments. Subsequently, they've also appreciated quite well, and we have a very strong partnership with the business and economic development community since about 2016. And we've incorporated and we've brought that whole community to our uh, regional action plan planning process. The recommendations developed in there were developed with the business community, not by you know, like just ourselves. And uh, what they've appreciated is that there is such a dependency in the economic circumstance in our region as to what the global perspective is of risk in our region. And our real responsibility is to take our hydrologic models and everything that we're doing locally and make them relevant to the global risk assessments. And so right now, a major part of this resilience plan is that translation. It's to take all of the work and translate it to economic benefits, risk reduction, and communications that are relevant to risk rating entities, you know, the finance community, and the business community has said in the end, give us a plan with metrics that we can have confidence investing in and we'll pay for it. So that's what we're working on now is this organized plan because so frequently they've said, you know, show me something with milestones. And we're like, oh, that's not really how we work. <laughs> so, so we've really had to refocus and develop something that communicates to them. And, and, and it is a very rich conversation. And, and uh, we, when, even when we, I didn't include it here, we went through seawall standards. We updated the seawall standards to require a minimum top elevation across all of Broward County. In some communities, that mean, meant that they'll be designing from one foot and ABD to four and five feet, you know, it's a, it's a sizable jump. Even in those conversations, the acknowledgement was it's flooding and we need to have certainty and nobody wants to make the investment and then be compromised because the neighbors aren't being held to the same requirement. So being able to say emphatically with time, everything will be brought up. And when it does, this is how it's gonna operate provides a huge justification to moving forward in an organized manner and being able to deliver the flood reduction benefits that everybody wants. And we also tie it back to insurance discounts and, and all of that whole. So it's been a process with really good partners, individuals as well, right? I mean, you find the right people who, who end up being good advocates within their peer group as well. Thank you. Okay, many thanks to the panel for a very informative session. Um, I hear the stomach's growling. Our next stop is lunch. Um, Emily's going to tell you about lunch, but before um, she does that, I just um, want to notify you that we want to be back here at 150 sharp for uh, session three. Thanks very much. So this is session three on SERP adaptive, adaptive management and science to inform decision making. Um, so leading us off is Gina Ralph from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Amanda Khan, Amanda Khan, Khan from the South Florida Water Management District.
Okay. Oh, yay, you can hear me now. Yes. Okay, so if somebody could bring up my slides, um, that would be helpful. Um, but I am Gina Ralph with the US Army Corps of Engineers. I am the lead scientist in the Jacksonville district. I am also the restoration coordination and verification program manager. I'm going to talk with you this afternoon about SERP adaptive management. Um, I know it's after lunch. I know you're all probably feeling a little sleepy and I've been asked to talk about policy. So this is gonna be a riveting conversation. Okay, um, Amanda Khan is gonna follow up um, on some of the additional um, items in the agenda. So whomever is um, actually running the slides, all of our slides are in one. So you don't need to like stop in between presentations. So if we can go to the first slide, please. Okay, so I've been talk asked to talk about policy and some of the guidance that we have for SERP adaptive management. And so, um, Adaptive management was first authorized in the 2007 Water Resources Development Act, or WERDA. And from that, any time we have a Water Resources Development Act, the Corps of Engineers will enact guidance. So two years later, we received guidance on how to implement adaptive management. And so there's two sections, and um, I'm not really going to focus on uh, section 2036. That is more for wetland mitigation plans. Um, but uh, section uh, 2039 provides guidance to the Corps of Engineers on how we implement adaptive management in our ecosystem restoration uh, projects. So with SERP, we have to take that as our overarching policy guidance. So that's what guides the uh, Corps of Engineers and how we implement and how we plan in our feasibility level studies for adaptive management. And there's all sorts of policy and guidance associated with that. Um, but we need to know what, what do we need to do for, for SERP? Because we were working in SERP long before we had actual policy guidance on adaptive management. Um, so in the 90s, <clears throat> we developed the Science Foundation uh, for SERP adaptive management. And then when SERP was authorized in 2000, um, within that yellow book that I think Carolina showed on screen, um, we actually have the provisions for this adaptive assessment and monitoring. Um, how are we going to uh, monitor for uncertainties? How are we going to monitor for success? And how does that look on an ecosystem system-wide basis so that we can understand whether the goals and purposes of SERP are being achieved? And then of course, just like with the past WERDA, we get um, regulations or guidance on how we're going to implement. So in 2003, we have these SERP programmatic regulations um, that required this development of this adaptive assessment and monitoring program. And there's very specific guidelines that we follow, but it is flexible enough to allow interpretation. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So there's lots of technical guidance out there. So um, because uh, SERP and everything that we do is multi-agency uh, with multiple partners um, in the restoration coordination and verification realm, there's 10 federal and state agencies and two federally recognized tribes. So we have a lot of people with a lot of different knowledge, experience, and their own guidelines on how we can implement adaptive management. And so as we talk a little bit later this afternoon about some of the challenges in implementing adaptive management, fundamentally, it comes down to authority for the Corps of Engineers and what we can do within our authority to implement adaptive management how we can take lessons learned um, and apply them to future projects. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, please. Okay, so our science framework. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen this before in various forums. Um, this is the framework for SERP, where we start with conceptual ecological models that we use as the guide for connections within our ecosystems. Those were initially developed and published in the 2005 version of Wetlands. And recently, within the last year, uh, they have been updated 
and we have revised conceptual ecological models that now take into account things that were not originally considered or not considered to the detail in which they are now, including climate change and invasive species. Um, and we've uh, taken all of that information that we have learned um, over the past uh, 20 years of SERP science and integrated that to update those conceptual ecological models, which led to these, uh, these ecological premises and hypothesis clusters. And Recover just hosted a workshop, I don't know, last week or the week before, um, where we work to identify monitoring needs uh, that we have uh, current monitoring needs and future monitoring needs as part of these new hypothesis clusters. All of that information we use into our performance measures um, and our monitoring, and all of that is lumped together to inform um, and adapt. And this is where adaptive management comes into play. And we um, look at the principles of adaptive management during the planning stages of a project, because again, with the Corps of Engineers, it all goes back to that authority. So if you can be forward thinking enough to identify um, uncertainties and potential management actions that could be taken, then you have the authority to move forward and integrate when you get or reach a certain uh, trigger or threshold that was previously identified. But you know, we wish we had a crystal ball. In Recover and in all of SERP, we do our best to make predictions about um, what we may need in the future. And so it was nice to hear all of that information that uh, Carolina and um, others were talking about in the, the last panel of the climate change. So, you know, helping us to forecast so that we can be proactive in putting that in a project implementation report so that we can gain authority for certain adaptive management strategies. Um, and so, you know, we have this very structured management approach uh, to address uncertainties by testing hypotheses. And one of the things with adaptive management, it's not just putting your uncertainties to try to minimize risk in an adaptive management plan, but we like to also include all of the monitoring that's needed in order to measure project success. And so if we reach a given threshold that says, you're probably not really getting all of the benefits of a project that you could, we have strategies to address that as well within that adaptive uh, management plan. So moving on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this was part of your read ahead. I'm sure you all have seen this. Um, I'm not gonna go into any uh, detail about this, but we do have this adaptive management integration guide. And with that, it helps to kind of give advice to different project delivery teams during the planning of a um, SERP component, how to incorporate adaptive management. And it matches it up with the core's planning framework it's that beehive that you probably have all seen how the core plans its projects. It also crosswalks it to the National Environmental Policy Act um, documentation process of when we need to consider uh, different things. So it's, it's a good read. Um, this is actually part of our five-year plan that Recover will update this um, in the fiscal year 2025 timeframe. Uh, so we're going through several precursor steps right now where we're looking at existing uncertainties, um, trying to identify, is it still an uncertainty? Um, if not, then can we remove it from the list because we uh, learned uh, sufficient information to say it's no longer uncertain? Um, or is it something that we still don't have enough information on? And then what are our priorities for trying to address those uncertainties? So the adaptive management team is currently undergoing that process now. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things, and I'm gonna turn this over to Amanda after this, but we have SERP adaptive management, and then nestled within that, all of the project delivery teams um, have an adaptive management plan. And some of our, we call them our, our generation one projects, like Amanda's going to tell you about, like Picayune Strand, 
didn't have an adaptive management plan because it was pre-2007 word of guidance, right? So what are we doing in that circumstance? But the whole idea of this overall SERP adaptive management strategy is to have a team nestled within restoration, coordination, and verification in which they do the uh, communication and coordination across all of the SERP projects to understand how information within an individual SERP project adaptive management plan can be leveraged, can be used in a future plan, what type of information we already have available. Um, so it's kind of that overarching umbrella. And then all of the green circles are all of the project plans, which will have, you know, we have 68 components, we don't have 68 projects, um, but they're all supposed to be talking to each other as well. And, and sharing that information. And again, it's uh, you know coordination and communication, which is uh, the foundation for us to be successful. Because things that we learn in Picayune may be very valuable to a future project such as Southern Everglades, where we may be looking to um, undertake uh, some you know, similar types of restoration initiatives. Um, and I think from now, I think Amanda's gonna talk about uh, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands. So next slide, please. No? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. She's not going to talk about that. She's going to talk about project level adaptive management. Thanks, Gina. So I'm going to kick off from the program level adaptive management system wide and talk about the project level. So um, I work at the South Florida Water Management District. I mean, I'm part of a new exciting team of um, scientists who are working with the SERP project managers and the scientists and PIs who do the ecological monitoring and write the ecological monitoring plans and adaptive management. And so a liaison of assisting with contracts as well as communication to make sure we're reporting the responses of the ecosystems effectively to inform management and the policymakers. Next slide, please. So adaptive management. So first of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about communication coming up, but to kind of have a common grind where we're all starting is recognizing that adaptive management is iterative and we have adaptive management in place at the project level to decrease uncertainties or to address uncertainties, to conduct science, to gain knowledge so that we know we reduce the risk of uncertainties. And by doing so, we increase how effective the restoration activities are going to be and the effectiveness of design and operations. Next. So you're going through this process of gaining new information, redefining the problem, assessing, and just a continuous loop. But we recognize that while we're working in the framework that Gina mentioned of um, federal projects with a federal state partnership, that should there be something identified that requires a significant design adjustment or additional constructed feature, that does need to then go off for reauthorization. So the reformulation um, component up there so it kind of a little veer off the circle um, and hopefully get back in, but we can learn ways to work within the framework. Next, please. All right, so in some of your readings um, of the adaptive management guidance, you may come across the terms active and passive adaptive management. So first of all, let's talk about trial and error. Not very effective for efforts that have a high degree of uncertainty. We're dealing with large scale ecosystems and ecosystem human interfaces. And there's a lot we don't know yet and that we need to learn. So passive adaptive management occurs after something is constructed in operations and you learn something from it being fully operational and then you can make a refinement. Then active is field experimentation. You're gonna hear from a couple of our amazing scientists from the DPM um, science team about that field exploration of learning before implementation or helping refine a design based upon the knowledge you gain from science to make it more effective and to do the best you can. Next, please. So like Gina, I'm throwing some CGM at you. So CGM is SERP guidance memoranda. And I wanna um, emphasize that it talks about that AM activities occur in the life cycle of the project, answering those unanswered questions 
and it's a stage for decisions and activities to ensure restoration success. It's integrated into project planning and implementation, and it's required for all ecosystem restoration projects, as mentioned before, post 2004, 2007, because of the guidance. Next. In SERP's adaptive management guidance, there are three types um, or approaches that can be followed for implementing adaptive management or having adaptive management options. So informing implementation, as I mentioned, this can help with um, informing preliminary design or design, um, phasing of construction. Um, if you have knowledge that something may occur in one part of the system, if you fill the levee this way versus you know, build the levee or um, this way or fill the canal in a certain direction. So that helps inform um, implementation process. And then operation. So forming operations, that can be interim operations or complete operations, because as you'll see, these are so large scale that some components are coming on board at a certain time and others are coming on at another time. So you can help inform operations all along the way to have the best ecosystem responses. And then the contingency options. So those are the ones that go in place um, after it is built and finished. Next, please. So as you saw from the previous presentation, there was a lot of guidance and guidance memoranda that came along over the periods of several years. Adaptive management has evolved. And I think a lot of that has to do with our concept and um, gaining more knowledge of what works, what doesn't, having more science behind understanding the ecosystems and the um, interconnectivity, having refined uh, PMs, performance measures, as well as modeling um, improvements. So it has evolved. And later um, in my next presentation, I'm going to talk about a couple ways that that's dealt with how the previous earlier projects didn't have structure structure in place. It is intended as an iterative process. As you'll read in the documentation, it mentions several times that the AM plan and monitoring should be updated according to new information available. And so we want to make sure that that's living documentation and iterative process. Because some of these PIRs were written almost 20 years ago now. <laughs> so we want to make sure we're staying um, current. And we have to recognize too, we don't have all the answers because this is still fairly young. There aren't the large scale projects fully implemented yet. We're learning as we go, doing the best um, we can to inform things along the way, but it is a young, and so the process is also too evolving. So we just hope to learn as we go and implement the best knowledge we can. Next, please. So, and I think um, Dr. Fred Sklar, who's not here for a conversation that we had and for a couple of these slides, um, <laughs> communication is cornerstone. Not just making sure you're communicating clearly, but we want to co come to a common ground and terminology. So that's another thing. We need common ter terminology on what adaptive management means, how um, implementation is framed, and also understand, have everybody understand that it's an adaptive process. It's flexible. We have to be able to be flexible while maintaining within um, the framework of the policy. We're also working with people across disciplines. We have engineers, we have geologists, we have chemists, we have biologists, and we have um, management at certain levels who are helping to make these decisions. And we really need to make sure that we're communicating across those different languages, so to speak. And also when we communicate with our public as well to let them know what's going on and what we're doing. Across projects and components, so adaptive management can't live in a vacuum within one CERT project because the CERT projects aren't within a vacuum. It is part of an entire system. So we also need to make sure that if we're learning new information in one project, can that help inform a different project in how design or operations is put forth and how is their inter um, activity and interconnection between any adjacent projects or upstream projects? And then, this is what we're trying to work on. It's important to have really effective communication and conveyance of knowledge to get through to the implementation. 
So as I said, we're, it's a learning process and um, these are some key attributes we recognize. Next, please. All right, I'm going to hand it off to Gina for a couple of slides. She looks puzzled. Okay. Okay. Pause for Q&A. Any questions from the committee? So I wanted to hear a little more about the exciting new team of scientists and what exactly you're doing. Okay. Sorry, you'll be hearing from them next. Thank you. Can, can I ask what projects don't have adaptive management plans? based on either timing or other reasons. Picking and strand and in interval gain sites. And C111 spreader canal does, Biscayne Bay does. Mm, BBCW does. And I'll mention Biscayne Bay coastal wetlands and I'll talk about how we're approaching it in picking and strand after this Q and A. But C111 spreader canal does not. <laughs> it has operations, yeah. It's... So it's not the traditional SERP um, adaptive management plan. And again, it's one of those foundation projects, um, but it did had, have a provision for changes in operations um, as part of an adaptive management strategy. Uh, but C-111 Spreader Canal is um, currently, um, although it's in the yellow book, it's being, uh, it was constructed and is now operated by South Florida Water Management District as a a component. Does that mean, well, I know it was, it was <clears throat> expedited. Does that mean it's being taken out of SERP? That does not mean it's okay. being taken out of SERP. Currently, there is no project partnership agreement, which is more the legal document for cost share, um, but it is still considered a SERP component, and it was done under a permit to South Florida Water Management District. Another. So I had another question, um, just for clarification. So the yellow book also had this figure with four boxes that was supposed to be the adaptive management plan, and and you were supposed to be a system um, planning and operations team that would produce option reports and assessment reports, and that was kind of key this key structure for doing system level adaptive management. Has that been, that part of the diagram been replaced by something else? I wouldn't say it's been replaced. I would say it's been absorbed. Um, okay. And I think it's absorbed under the recover, under recover. Uh, okay. umbrella where we had, you know, evaluation and assessment, uh, those, those teams way back when, when recover was first organized. And now because of the integration of, of everything, it, it didn't make sense to have those specific teams. Uh, it's all under the recovery. All under recovery, okay, thanks. Go ahead, Matt, and then Dave. Yeah, thanks for the overview. And I appreciate a couple of your slides, particularly slide 12, where you talked about informing project operations as falling under part of the larger adaptive management umbrella. This is what I was sort of speaking to at trying to capture the lessons we learned from the COP report. Um, so I was really happy to see that, particularly as it, as it relates to communication. Adaptive management isn't, excuse me, isn't really a circular process. It's actually a helical process. Over time, we still want to work on a trajectory, right? So it's not just simply stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here. And so from a helical perspective, Finding ways to communicate and document, like you mentioned in your last slide, and sharing that is going to be really important. So I was glad to see those slides. Uh, first off, thank you. That was very helpful. To, to After going through and reviewing the document, to actually have it explained it has been very helpful. Uh, my question is, in having looked at adaptive management programs in multiple complex places, uh, situations, is... Am I correct in assuming that Recover is the primary responsible entity to implementing and managing consistency across the adaptive management process? So I, I don't want to, um, Recover handles the system-wide, right? It's the overarching umbrella and 
all of the the projects, um, and and I'll speak to this actually when I get to um, how Recover has developed a process for inter various interaction points during both the planning and the um, construction design and implementation phase of a project where we can insert ourselves to act as that body to share the lessons learned. But each individual project team um, is responsible for development of an adaptive management and monitoring plan for their individual project, which again, Recover will help facilitate the conversation and the lessons learned and the the knowledge gained from other projects to impart to that team, but it is the, the project delivery team that ultimately comes up with that individual project level adaptive management. Can I ask one follow-up question to that? So whose responsibility is it to make sure that gets done, I guess is my So it, it's a shared responsibility, right? Each individual project is managed by a, a project manager. And in order to um, you know, be policy compliant, they have to include the provision of a, a monitoring and adaptive management plan. So the ultimately, they're responsible at the project level, at the system level, that's the responsibility of recovery uh, to go ahead and do that interaction with those individual teams, as well as to continue to bring new science gained to those conversations. Thank you. Can I follow up on Dave's question to, to ask, does that mean each project is open to its own timelines in terms of reporting? Because past CISRP reports have been concerned about the lack of it, the kind of reporting that we saw earlier where there are very clear project objectives, there are clear monitoring results, there were clear comparisons to modeling. In many cases at a project level, you just see data and, and you don't see those comparisons to objectives. So it, is there any kind of expectation that's consistent across projects in a timeline of reporting? Because COP has set its own timeline, but Sure. Lovely to see on a project level. So, as part of um, Amanda mentioned, um, the SERP guidance memorandum number 55 or 56, where uh, Recover in 2018, um, and I'll talk to this again in my thing, um, we created this SERP guidance memorandum number 66, which is the Recover interaction. And there are actually uh, interaction points that speak to that, how the information from the individual projects gets reported at the system level and how individual projects and recover will go about reporting information uh, in terms of project success or uh, adaptive management or status and trends. Um, so all of that is also captured in that. But in terms of, um, because some of our SERP projects are so large, there are various contracts, right, that break them into smaller, more manageable components. Um, and so uh, like Central Everglades Planning Project, for example, we have um, a contract for SEP North and that's broken into what, five or six contracts or more to just get that portion of the system done. So there has to be that connection of what is required to implement in the adaptive management and monitoring plan based upon the construction elements that are in that individual contract. So you're gonna have various starting and stopping points. You're going to have that collection of that before construction um, information that you're going to need for, for your baseline in order to assess um, the, the, pro, uh, the project success afterwards. So to say there's one size fits all, I can't say that because of the number of construction contracts we have and the need to collect that baseline information based upon when a certain component may go into operation. And also for a couple of the projects like BBCW and Picky and Strand, there is a chapter in the South Florida Environmental Report that covers primarily the water quality for compliance. However, it does include also some additional ecological information. And um, and again, like Gina said, there's multiple contracts for construction, but there's also multiple contracts for various PIs doing the monitoring. And of course, they always have a reporting requirement for those as well.
If there are no more questions, I guess uh, we can go on to the next phase. Okay, so um, just to kind of set the stage before Amanda gets into um, some of the Generation One projects, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that active adaptive management. Um, Amanda showed uh, on a continuum, trial and error, passive, and then active. And so we wanted to highlight a couple of examples of active um, adaptive management strategies and understanding the need to address uncertainties far in advance of when you're actually going to need the information. So this is just one that I wanna highlight. And then we will have the uh, decomp physical model is another example of um, active adaptive management. And then I'll have one more to, to share with you. So I, I think some of you in the past have been out to Lila. Um, I see some heads are nodding, um, but this is in Water Conservation Area 1 or the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. And so this was created years and years ago where they created uh, tree islands to um, tree islands, ridge and slough communities to understand a variety of different um, interactions and, and how Everglades restoration um, could, but, or how this could be used to inform Everglades restoration. So um, lots of different manipulations that they can do out there with changing uh, water depth. Um, and they did some different elevations of tree islands. They did some different types of plantings. They did different planting densities. And recently, uh, last year um, in July of 2022, Recover hosted a workshop um, because part of the Central Everglades planning project, we are going to build these hammocks within the Miami Canal to not only act as um, wildlife um, uh, habitat, but also to be a hydrologic speed bump to help slow the water down for the portions of the Miami Canal that are going to be backfilled. So we got together with scientists, with modelers, with engineers. We sat up in West Palm Beach for two days. We all visited Lila and we worked with the scientists to understand what we know about uh, tree islands from these created tree islands that were developed in Lila and how we can take those lessons learned and apply them to the hammocks that will be built within the Central Everglades Planning Project. And I'm calling them hammocks as opposed to tree islands because tree islands have a very culturally significant meaning to our two Native American tribes. And so we know we could never create recreate a tree island, but what we could do was put in a hydrologic speed bump, which was vegetated, which may serve as wildlife habitat, as well as to help um, slow the water down. So we sat in a room for two days and we took all of that information to apply it to a recommendation to the project delivery team. Um, so we um, adjusted uh, you know, the transition zones. We uh, looked at the orientation of the tree island. We looked at the density of plantings. We looked at the species to be planted. And we came up with uh, several courses of action um, that we could uh, ask the engineers to consider during the design of the SEP North uh, project features. And so um, about, I don't know, maybe two months ago, I saw a preliminary drawing. This, this is what Recover recommended. I saw a preliminary drawing and it looked really similar to what we, what we suggested. So it's just a good example to share of how this adapt active adaptive management, the lessons learned and the science gained is being used to inform an actual feature within a CERT project. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, and so uh, the proof of concept physical models, um, again, uh, decomp physical model will be talked about by a couple of South Florida Water Management District scientists. Um, I think Carolina put in a plug for this as well but this is the Everglades Mangrove Migration Assessment or EMMA. And this is actually exploring the use of um, RSM techniques, regional sediment management te techniques, where we would actually look to apply 
a thin layer of sediment to key locations within uh, the Southeastern Everglades to see if we could jumpstart the internal processes of accretion and where we may be able to build mangrove islands to improve habitat, as well as to increase resiliency. So this is a, a proof of concept. We're still um, hoping to get funding from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to implement this. We've chosen a site within the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades footprint, uh, very close to the S197 structure, which Melissa Nasuti talked about earlier today, um, that is uh, right at the, the base, if you will, the outlet of the, the CNSF. Um, so those are our active adaptive management, and now I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. Next slide, please. So, so you mentioned before, a couple of the projects were in place and the project implementation report was authorized prior to these guidance um, memoranda on adaptive management. So one example I'm going to provide for that is picking strand restoration project. So you'll see in the, in the yellow book as, as the Golden, Gate, Golden Glades Estate Project. And as you can see, the PIR was um, finished in 2004 and it was authorized in 2007. So that means it's probably written around 2002, 2003. And the point is to, um, it was this estate that was almost developed, kind of a con artist type situation, um, selling parcels of land in very flooded area, but they had already put into place roads and canals. And there were also logging tram um, roads there as well. So three pump stations were built at the north end of um, this diagram. So those green, er, green little arrows up top. And then these canals shown in blue um, are in the process of being plugged. So the one um, Prairie Canal all the way to the east has already been plugged. And we're in the process of finishing um, some of the others as well. Next slide, please. So as I said, it, an adaptive management plan was not within the PIR, but there was recognized that there is some adaptive management guidance from 1999, 2000. So in 2009, um, the monitoring and assessment group, the MAG for Picky and Strand was formed. It's a multi-agency um, team of people, scientists and uh, managers from various agencies, um, including US Fish and Wildlife and um, FWC. And generally these um, specialists are expertise in the area of the Big Cypress and then 10,000 Islands estuaries as the plugging of those canals and the de degradation of the roads is going to affect obviously the downstream hydrology in those estuaries, beneficially affect. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I'm just going to mention a couple of the acts that the MAG has been able to um, implement. So in 2016, there was a reauthorization to implement what we call a Southwest protection feature. And this is basically a levee and you see it in pink down there. And that's to um, prevent water from going into areas where um, it's not wanted at this time. And so they recognize, okay, now we have a new feature. None of this area was in our monitoring plan under the idea that this feature was there. So they were able to develop both water quality, rain and ecological monitoring attributes and put a plan in place and propose it. And so now we can um, get all the good data that we need in this area, specifically to um, look at how that feature is affecting the area. Next slide, please. Secondly, um, a couple of years ago, um, there was a discussion on the fact that there were federally listed red cockaded woodpeckers, RCWs, in one of the project footprint areas. And in looking at the hydrologic models of the project as it would be completed, um, scientists and wildlife biologists recognize, hey, that hydrology is not super beneficial for the habitat of these RCWs. So we looked at additional modeling on a little bit smaller scale and looked at potential options for an improvement in that area for those um, RCWs, while not negatively impacting other larger areas of the project. So the MAG put together a proposed road removal plan because they're looking at Miller, um, Miller Boulevard, so that's along the Miller Canal, 
and talking about instead of degrading it the entire way, only degrading portions or degrading it to a certain height so that you maintain a different type of hydrology and not as deep of water across that pine pineland area for those RCWs. Next slide, please. So Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Phase 1, um, it does have an adaptive management um, plan in it. Um, it was authorized in 2014. And the purpose of the project is to redirect flows in more natural hydrologic, hydrologic movement across the wetlands and into the estuaries and reduce that canal type discharge into the estuaries with the fresh water, therefore improving the salinity regimes and the habitat. It includes pump stations, spreaders, um, ditch plugging and conveyance features. And as you can see, it's on Biscayne Bay. Next slide, please. So um, the folks working on the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetland Phase 1 project um, made recommendations that they should um, install a temporary pump before putting the, the full permanent feature in so they can understand operations, help inform the capacity direction placement of the pump to have the most effective outcome for the restoration activities. And then they recommend that when, this, when the permanent feature is in place, that temporary pump can be used elsewhere in the project footprint to design or to help inform other features. Next slide, please. Then in a portion of the BBCW footprint um, is called Deering Estate. And the people on the ground recognize, hey, this is drying out a little bit too much to maintain a healthy wetland. Well, at that time they were doing on and off and on and off pump operations. So it was recommended that a continuous um, pump operations be implemented to maintain that um, hydration. Also in other areas to better um, encourage more sheet flow, it was recommended to incorporate a shallow spreader feature so that the water is spread more evenly over the wetland. Also, in order to attain the best data to inform um, success, the, they have updated the water quality monitoring plan to have more effective characterization of the downstream effects of the project. And a key part of the adaptive management plan as written in BBCW phase one project implementation report is that the data and knowledge gained from this phase one can help to inform components of the BBC or the Biscayne Bay Southeastern Ecosystem Restoration. Holy cow, I'm glad that has an acronym. The BBC or project. So um, that's another key component is that, that information and I really thank you also for saying that it's, it is helical. We do want to get off the wheel eventually. Okay, I'm back. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the recover support to projects and specifically about these project uh, interaction points that we have. So as Amanda just said, um, back in 2017, there was a you know, folks on the ground were, were looking at BBCW and said, I think we have an issue here. And the request then came through Recover to change operations so that we had this continuous pumping. And so at that point in time, Recover was thinking, well, gosh, you know, we're actually moving on now to projects that are in operations and we need to lay out a process for recover to have these interactions with project delivery teams outside of the planning phase. Because let's face it, for years and years and years, we are concentrated on what's going on, how do we inform planning of a project? And then we actually had things on the ground that were starting to operate and now recover needed to um, have a process for conveying that information to decision makers and to project managers to actually take a, a change or a, you know change direction or understand um, information that we were seeing on the ground and how that could be best used to inform a project. So um, next slide, please. So um, again, uh, back in uh, 2018, Right after um, BBCW, Recover uh, started development of this uh, SERP guidance memorandum number 66. 
And so I think 66 is the latest that we have. I, I don't know that there's been one since, um, but it, it actually speaks to these uh, recover and project interaction points. It establishes standard operating procedures and it very clearly defines roles and responsibilities of the recover um, team for our project managers. And then to get core speak, if you will, we have planning technical leads, we have environmental leads, and we have engineering technical leads. These are all of the folks that um, comprise the, the project delivery teams. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, again, going back to SERP guidance and these programmatic regulations, uh, there are very specific um, roles and responsibilities that Recover plays. And so I'm not going to read it, but just highlighting that Recover was formed and developed and specified in the Water Resources Development Act, in the Yellow Book, and in the programmatic regulations to continually to have science inform SERP planning, SERP design, and SERP operations. And so uh, we have these guidance memorandum that we use to kind of outlay the process so that us, our non-federal sponsor, South Florida Water Management District, and all of our partnering agencies understand how we're going to implement uh, this recover assistance. So going on to the next slide, please. All right, so as I said, for years we were so focused on planning and this process was really well laid out. Um, and it just starts at the scoping phase. It goes all the way to the chief's report, which then goes to Congress for authorization. There are seven key engagement points uh, for recover. And each one of those seven have a, um, a standard operating procedure that outlines the rules, of um, and responsibilities. It also includes a schedule so that it's very clear because we're very schedule driven in the core um, when Recover needs to, to interact and how long that interaction is going to take. Um, and so you'll see that um, Recover um, does review uh, the monitoring plan as well as the adaptive management plan. Um, and we also look at, you know, an evaluation of all of the alternative plans. So coming up in Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Project, we are going into our third round of modeling. That modeling data will be given to Recover. At the same time, it is provided to the project delivery team for Recover to do an independent assessment and to make recommendations as to what should be the tentatively selected plan for that particular study. So those are just some examples of what Recover does during the planning phase, but we're more interested in how do we take information that we're seeing from operational testing and use that to uh, better inform. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is the one, this is the new uh, SERP guidance memorandum. I think I provided it to Stephanie with the SOPs, but if I didn't, I apologize, I'll give it to you after the meeting. Um, and so again, it starts during scoping and scoping in this instance is not the traditional scoping where we go out as part of the National Environmental Policy Act. This is when we know that we have money now available to have a project delivery team with our non-federal sponsor to help um, inform the design of a project. And so we're going to be with you right there when uh, at the first sign of money being available, we will come on in and, um, you know, be part of that team and, and have a, a dialogue. And so as Amanda indicated before that some of our projects, when we first develop them, put a project implementation report, sign a record of decision uh, as part of our National Environmental Policy Act, and then it just sits until a Water Resources Development Act and an authorization. So using SEP as the example, we finished uh, the report in 2012. In 2014, it was authorized. And then we started talking about design of some of the components probably in the 2018-19 timeframe, right? So anywhere I would say three to five years later. But there's a lot of information that had been gained since 2012 that could be used to inform uh, the design of various components of the uh, construction. 
So, you know, Recover is collecting data on an annual basis as part of our monitoring and assessment plan. And that information we um, is updated within a, a system status report. It's uh, reports that we get on an annual basis from those pro um, principal investigators. All of that information can be brought to the study team, to the project delivery team to help ensure that we have the best available information included as we're you know, initiating design. Um, and then what we'll do is we're gonna have to do a crosswalk um, with the individual project monitoring plan, as well as the monitoring and assessment plan. Because um, if we did it right during planning, there's a lot of leveraging of information between the two. But as everyone knows, um, you know, the core gets money through the president's budget, and there's a certain amount of money that's allocated to the monitoring and assessment plan, as well as to individual projects on an annual basis. So there could be some differences in the model and the monitoring that was envisioned and the monitoring that is currently being implemented. So we always want to do that crosswalk um, to make sure that um, we have the appropriate monitoring to not only look at what's happening at the project level, but is it consistent with our system-wide analysis? Um, and then the next step is um, we will uh, review the analysis for ecological monitoring. There's always that operational testing, right? You put something in the ground and then you have to test it to make sure it works. And you're collecting data as you're doing that. So could that data then uh, again, iteratively be fed back in to better manage the operations of that? Um, and then, Stephanie, I think you asked, how, how is that information reported, right? So we have a very clear uh, standard operating procedure for how we are going to gather, how Recover is going to gather information from the project teams to roll that up into our um, system status reports that occur on a five-year uh, basis. And then there's also other reporting mechanisms, as uh, Amanda noted in um, the uh, SPEAR report, uh, the Waiting Bird report. Uh, so a lot of that information is being shared uh, among agencies. Um, and then again, you know, this recover and the project level monitoring data, how that feeds into adaptive management at the project level and then at the system level. Have we learned information from the project level which could help reduce some uncertainties that we identified at the system level? And then, um, you know, it's again, it's that, that feedback loop. It's that constant process of um, information sharing. And so um, this, uh, although the SERP guidance memorandum isn't new, that's from 2018, all of these standard operating procedures were uh, completed in, I don't know, May of this year, um, and they are available. We've been giving presentations to all of our project managers, our environmental leads, and next up, will be our engineering leads. Uh, so I think that's it for me. Next slide. Oh, that's just what they look at. You can't, you can't actually read that, but there's a lot of information. And again, the roles and responsibilities are, are bulleted and very clearly laid out. Um, next page, please, or next slide, please. That's it. Um, and with that, I think we're done. Thanks to you both. Uh, any questions from the committee? Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so I guess one question I had about CGM 66 is, is that in part clarifying roles and responsibilities, is that also streamline the process? So like the decision to make the pump change at Deering Estates actually took a while, yeah. right? I mean, that was, not a, that was not a, let's fix this in two weeks kind of thing. So um, how does CGM 66 sort of streamline it in addition to identifying the roles and responsibilities and the appropriate points of intersection? So I, I think prior to CGM 66, nobody knew where to provide that information, who needed to play into that, you know, because it was um, the folks on the ground give it to Recover, Recover um, gave it to the Recover Executive Committee, which ultimately signed out a, a memorandum for the record, which then went to you know, the, the two implementing agencies. But I think by having this close, um, closer relationship all through the phase, you, you never have to go back through this memorandum, right? You're, you have somebody there 
having a conversation with the team and with the project manager and with the operators to then, you know, be, have a, a more rapid response where you don't have to go up and down, you know, searching for the right person. You all already are talking. Yeah. Um, again, thank you. This has been very helpful in explaining some of the concepts that you're going through. My question is, WERDA is an authorization bill. It only authorizes the core to do certain things. To actually implement, you need an appropriation. How do you, how is that appropriation identified? Do you have, do you have a line item that says this is the adaptive management part that goes into the appropriators? So um, the short answer is yes. And the longer answer is we have Kim Vitek who will be on the panel, who is um, really more of the money person that can help you uh, address that question better than I can. Well, second, just the second part of that then, as you pivot from planning to operations, again, is it, and I'll get to Matt's point that he just, as you develop the guidance, it's a different type of adaptive, it's a different type of research or science or monitoring that you're doing to actually assess operational impacts versus what it might be. Is that again articulated in the guidance documents to allow that to happen? Um, so, so yes and no. Um, I, there, there's some of it, but I think we need to drill down a little bit deeper um, for when we um, plan a project, and, and I think a really good example is Melissa Nasuti this morning when she talked about construction of the Mod Waters project, construction of the C-111 South Dade, and when those were complete, we formed an operation plan to take advantage of both of them. So that's a totally, you know, it's a different beast, if you will. Um, and so what I've been thinking about is that Recover really needs to come up with an SOP for those operation plans um, to, to really dig down um, and, and put a little bit finer uh, point uh, to the process. Thank so, you. yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. This has really been informative. I feel like I understand how IAM works in practice uh, much better than I did before this. Um, the one question I have is, is about, um, authority what what authority goes with <laughs> um do you, you present things as recommendations or like how does that interaction go do you have some kind of authority that um people have to listen when you come with this so, or so just... when i speak authority i mean congressional authorization that's what i mean by authority. oh i know i'm, I'm just talking oh, about okay. like if, <laughs> how does it get done if you yeah if you see something that would suggest a change in operations or something um kind of what's is it just a recommendation that people can take or leave or maybe walk us through picky and strand with an example of like who, who talks to whom how how many times do you go up and down in communication is there a clear pathway you want to <laughs> so, so I think now there's a clearer pathway than what there was with BBCW. Um, and, and again, if Recover is making a recommendation similar to what we did with the uh, design of those hammocks in the, the SEP uh, North um, in, in Miami Canal, we offer that as a recommendation. We don't have, Recover doesn't have authority, thou shalt do this we work together to make recommendations and whether or not we present those to the implementing agencies and then they work together to decide what may or may not be implemented um, is, is kind of the, the short answer for that one. Any follow-up or additional questions? Okay, thank you. So next, um, we have Colin Saunders and Sue Newman, both of, from the district, and they're going to begin by, I believe, talking about DPM knowledge gained with focus on impl implications for SEP. DPM is decomp physical model.
Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out before I get going is the success of the DECOMP physical model project is due to the extensive multidisciplinary, multi-agency group, some of whom are represented here. And so Carl and I are kind of given our feel here, but I just want to acknowledge that this is a much bigger group than you were seeing here today. And it's even bigger than this, but these are the people who really contributed to the efforts we're presenting today. So what is the DECOM physical model? I wasn't sure if Amanda was going to be presenting this or not, so I put it up there just in case. <laughs> um, many of you may or may not have heard of the DECOMP or the decompartmentalization of 3A, which is uh, part of the SERP projects, one of the original Yale book projects, often considered the heart of the Everglades. Um, well, there were a lot of uncertainties associated with that project. Well, what kind of flow should we restore the Everglades to? None of us were here back then. We don't know what the velocity should be. Should we fill in the canals all the way or partially? What would be effective? It's a very expensive process. Is there a way that we can do that better? How much velocity we, do we need to have a ridge and slough landscape versus moving sediments? These were a lot of the uncertainties that were preventing decomp from moving forward. So part of that was the development of this active management plan, the DECOM physical model or DPM, or sometimes as I call it, the damn physical model because of the frustrations. <laughs> but um, that's an English thing, I'll take that back. Uh, so anyway, the project is what is considered the pocket. It's between the L67A and the L67C canals separating 3A, 3B. It's a before after control impact design study, Baki design. Um, and so originally, actually, we started work in 2010, where we started monitoring background information prior to construction. And the idea behind the project is that we are restoring flow. We have a series of 10 five foot gated culverts that discharge water across the landscape. And then to look at the effects of canal treatments, um, the levee was removed from this side of the pocket. And then we had different backfill treatments where we had complete, partial, or no fill. And we could compare what we observed in those environments. So in looking at the system, we monitored within the flowway, those obviously are the treatment sites. And then we monitored outside the flowway, the controls, so that we could see how things changed over time. And one thing to be aware of is that we did not discharge water into the system unless the inflow geometric mean TP was less than or equal to 10 ppb, which is very important. That's the Everglades phosphorus criterion. So before we get into, well, how is this information used? It might be a good idea to kind of tell you some of the stuff we learned. And so to kind of get you a little bit um, there. The first thing that we observed, and it was a, a bit of a surprise, was the water actually didn't flow where we expected it to. It didn't follow the historic ridge and slough pattern. The second thing we observed is that we got a, we got a little bit of a handle on what velocities we needed to rebuild the ridge and slough topography. And that was in the order of 1.5 to three centimeters a second. And the significance of that is, and it doesn't want to do that. If you maintain sustained flows within this zone, it's a positive. You increase slope velocities and you see sediment transport. But if you increase above these flows, the high flows, as you might expect, you end up with localized phosphorus loading, even if your phosphorus concentrations entering the system are less than or equal to 10, because the load is so high. The other thing we observed is that actually backfilling the canals can improve habitat quality. And then another observation we had was that if you use limestone to fill the canals, it actually can cap the legacy phosphorus. Obviously, the canals have quite phosphorus and rich sediments. And by putting that limestone fill on that, we can actually reduce sediment phosphorus transport further downstream. Okay. This is Colin. This is uh, my technical support. <laughs> yep. Okay. I just wasn't plugged in, apparently. <laughs> That's something new. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're breaking up the talk into two different sections. Colin and I will be alternating, so you don't have to listen to me drone on and on uh, as much as I might like to do that. I won't. Um, and the first part is how has the information that we have collected been used to inform set projects? And then the second part of the talk is, well, what's the potential for information that we have to inform and it hasn't been used yet? And we're gonna have this box. So kind of let me explain this box to you a little bit. Um, the idea is that what was the DPM product? Um, what can it influence? Does it influence operations? Um, can it influence design? And that's not just necessarily the design of the features. It could also be a design of the monitoring associated with the project. And then also, does it have an impact on construction? So one of the first things out of the box, as far as the DPM project was concerned, is initially we got approval to operate for only a handful of months, generally in the two to three month time period. So the first phase of the project through 2016, we could only open the gates for a very limited time. So obviously our understanding flow is limited to that time period. However, the data collection that we did during that allowed us to actually then create a stronger trigger. And our trigger for the DPM project is based on, well, what was the prior month phosphorus concentration in the L67 A canal? What was the stage difference between the canal and the marsh? And then also there were some restraints on, we couldn't flow if the L29 constraint was in place. We couldn't flow if one site had a, a value of 8.5 feet, because you just, you wouldn't want to be flooding the canal. And then you also had water levels in the canal that had to be a certain height before you could discharge. So with all these parameters in place, we actually were able to improve our confidence. And we have a monthly, actually, S152 trigger, which predicts whether or not the phosphorus that following month is going to be less than or equal to 10. And so using that information, we were able to get a permit to extend the flow to year round flow. So the first thing out of the box with the project was actually to increase from a very limited flow period to the potential to flow year round. So the, to give you an idea of what that trigger looks like, um, this was actually earlier this year. Um, and so what the trigger is doing is predicting the next month's phosphorus concentrations. And as you can see here, it was increasing. Our forecast was that it was gonna increase. And so therefore we recommended keeping the S152 close. Now we make the recommendation, ultimately it's not our decision that is up to the operators, uh, the core and the district. So moving on, one of the next things we observed within the project is that there were restrictions as far as restoring flow. A structure, flow coming out of a structure gives you a radial discharge and it only impacts or increases velocities within a certain footprint within the marsh. If you kind of think of half of a target, that's kind of the zone that we're looking at. And so with that in mind and looking at the operations of the S-152, Originally, the S-152 structure was supposed to be removed. It was a temporary structure. But if you look at the components of SEP South, you can see these structures. This is the, the blue shanty flowway. You have two in the downstream section and really not much going on up here. And so it was decided that in order to actually give us optimum ability to operate the system, to have greater flexibility as far as hydrating the area and also to potentially expand the zone of flow as well as improve water quality, the S-152 was actually incorporated into SEP South and is so now a feature within the SEP South project. So that was another finding that was helpful. This was the very first finding that was a bit of a surprise. The flow was supposed to follow that arrow. The actual layout of the monitoring was in that direction. Um, so of course we rapidly went out and established some new monitoring sites within the flowway. Um, but what you can see is that the flow headed east. Um, it didn't head in that south uh, direction. So, but if you look at the landscape, it's pretty obvious. This is dense vegetation. You actually have somewhat of a pathway for it to flow here. So that was one of the first things we started looking at. You know, well, there's a resistance to flow. There's also though a landscape topo gradient, which would have expected it to, to flow. So 
um, our colleague, Christus Weig, um, she took a look at the historic imagery, and this is the 1940s imagery for that spot. And what you can see is way back then, there are a lot more sloughs in the landscape. Now we've done a lot of work looking at actively managing vegetation. We call it Amy, active marsh improvement. Um, and so we had experience of, of basically changing the vegetation community for benefit. And so we felt that we could do that. And then along with some modeling that Krista did, we were able to feel pretty confident that if we went in and we managed the vegetation, we could actually create a flow path that would improve how water would move through the marsh. And so we went out, we created these polygons on the landscape, sprayed them, and here you can see the end result. And yes, in fact, we did. We had a significant effect on velocities in the marsh. At the beginning, this is pre-Amy. This is 250 uh, meters from the inflow heading east. You can see uh, most of the flow went there. However, post-Amy, you get equal distribution of velocities. Uh, and most importantly, those velocities also travel further into the marsh. And so creating these sloughs has been a very huge benefit in terms of restoring this degraded ridge and slough landscape. And the significance of this is that, let me go back one second. It's not going back there. The significance of this is that by restoring flow direction and velocity, we, we have gotten a really good handle of what it would take to do landscape restoration, but only at this scale. So is there a way to scale it up? And so this is something that Judd Harvey and his group are looking at at USGS. They have what they call the biofree model. And this is a biophysical flow model. It's predicting velocity using hydraulic flow theory, measured vegetation, and then the slope and roughness of the landscape. And what that model is showing is here we're using the data from the DPM. If you look on the y-axis, we have flow velocity and on the x, the distance from the S152. Within certain zones, you're gonna get the entrainment and the downstream transport of sediment. And this is based on real data that we collected in the field. However, in this nice middle zone, you get slew to ridge redistribution of sediment, which is something that we're targeting for restoration in terms of creating that topography on the landscape. However, below that, you get very little sediment. And so for us, we're trying to understand the velocity and its effect on sediment transport and topography is very important. So if we look at this in terms of this is pre and post Amy, what you find is you have very similar uh, sediment entrainment zones, redistribution zones, and similar water depths. Despite the fact you've had a 11% you know, increase in slough area, so you have the benefit of increasing the habitat and no potential negatives as far as the amount of sediment you're moving or the average water depth. However, if you increase the amount of area of slough restored, say in this case to 58%, you see you end up with this significant reduction in water levels, which is not something you're trying to do within the slough landscape. Now this model is based on in situ field data, but it doesn't account for seasonality associated with SAV and parafine. It doesn't account for vegetation feedbacks, topography feedbacks, but it does provide an interesting observation and provide some level of support for the idea that there's this optimum envelope of velocity and slough areas that would be good for restoration. So recognizing that Amy is a good feature, we want to be able to improve this degraded landscape. The district actually implemented creating, extending, this is where the original Amy was in place and we've now extended it and we're about here with the idea that we're gonna create multiple sloughs following this entire pathway. The Corps of Engineers also agreed this was a good method and um, has actually agreed to fund creating these slew pathways as part of downstream features with the S63X structures. Originally, we were hoping that we would be jump-starting this process and that as part of the 
contract one, we actually had approval for putting in temporary pump stations within the L29 canal, because right now you can't jump water out of that area. So basically it's gonna hit the bottom and stay there. But by putting in these temporary pumps, and like I said, it, it got written into the document, we are good to go. Um, and now we're not. So anyway, that didn't happen, but the concept was, concept was there. Um, and hopefully that knowledge will, at some point um, will be implemented. There are also ecological feedbacks as far as um, restoration are concerned. And this was something that we were a little bit surprised about. And that is, if you look at the slough prior to flow, you saw this very obvious periphyton SAV map covering the surface. However, two weeks post flow, it was gone. And if you look down as you follow through the water level, what you see, it's sitting on top of the flock surface. Six weeks later, you can see that that mat is really just started to disintegrate and become incorporated within the flock. In 10 weeks, we actually had improved our camera, so we took a little bit more time doing the photography. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically, there's, you couldn't really tell there was a paraffin mat there at all. It's been completely incorporated in the flock, and we do have elevated flock levels. So one of the feedbacks associated with restoring flow is you lose your paraffin mat, and so therefore you're actually increasing velocity in the slough landscape because this SAV paraffin mat is actually blocking flow, and we observed that the flow then also within our Amy's plots extended further into the marsh once paraffin mat had gone. Um, and so that is influencing construction because we incorporated um, the Amy sloughs and actually the structures were moved slightly to align with those new slough locations with the recognition that having the downstream slough is going to be very beneficial as far as restoring flow to the landscape. And because you might not know what sediment particles look like, <laughs> um, Particles moves in multiple different ways. And we kind of wanted just to give you an idea of what does it look like in the environment. And actually, Jen Rehage, I think, is one of the reasons we show these types of videos because she does it with fish and it's always very exciting, but not quite so exciting when you see utricularia blobs flowing. Um, but the point really is just to show you that disturbance, you do, you know, under the natural system, you get smaller particles, but there are disturbance events, whether it be fish. Uh, structures that are going to kick up the flock and they're going to move even more. And so there is this, this tremendous ability to move sediments and actually transform the topography of the landscape if we can get the flow right. Moving on, we're now going to be talking about the canals. Hello, hello. Okay. So I am going to switch into the <clears throat> canal perspective. And I'm going to talk about the, um, how the canal findings from DPM have successfully informed SEP projects. Whoops, I mean, sediment transport was fun. <laughs> um, so the graph on the right, you can see, is the water TP in the L67A canal. And you can see that um, periodically it goes above 10 parts per billion, which limits culvert operations. So one way to lower the TP and increase those, the flexibility in operations would be to connect that water more to the marsh upstream, um, which has a slightly lower uh, water TP level. And flow fields that were measured in the canal just upstream of the DPM structure show quite clearly that there's not a lot of water moving from that marsh on the upper left-hand side of the, of the image, but most of that water is coming straight from the canal. That's been confirmed by mixing models. And the reason, um, one of the reasons is that there are these spoil mounds along the western edge of that canal. So um, spoil removal was already in the, the SEP PIR in 2014, um, but we had numerous uh, meetings periodically from, you know, really starting in 2017 and 18 with the DPM science team and SEP project managers. Um, and they asked the DPM team for um, their um, ideas for improving this. And so what we came up with, we recommended that we turn it into an experiment where um, we have treatment and control 
structures. And what this allowed us to do was essentially increase the actual physical spatial effect of that marsh, marsh to, through canal connectivity, as well as provide statistical power and a design that could provide um, more robustly um, confirm whether the successes in, in reducing inflow TP and possibly some unintended consequences. So marsh connectivity, um, you know, increasing marsh connectivity was also examined in the L67C canal component of DPM. And the hydrologic monitoring here, as you can see with these arrows, showed that connectivity um, is affected not only by what happens upstream of the canal, but what happens in the canal itself. So you can see from the water budget that those big arrows um, show there's a lot of preferential flow through the water in the open canal system. Makes sense, there's nothing there. Um, however, it becomes greatly diminished, not completely, but greatly diminished once it hits those yellow and blue partial and complete backfill areas. And as a result, we achieve what we consider marsh to marsh flow in the complete fill area. And we contrast this with what we call canal to marsh flow in the open canal. Um, but the presence of fill is not the whole story. The reason flow diminished in those filled treatments is because they became colonized with dense SAV beds, and that provides vegetative resistance to flow. Um, the SAV is also important because it improves habitat quality. The catch per unit effort of large uh, fish in these filled areas is much more, is much higher than, um, than almost non-existent in the no-fill. And I shouldn't say non-existent, but poorly detectable. Um, the benefit, so the benefit of connecting ridges and sloughs is an important part of the findings from DPM. So we then applied this concept to the backfilling of the agricultural um, ditches that exist in the Blue Shanty Flowey, which is this area in, um, bounded by the uh, L67D levee and the L67A um, levee to the to the west. So the original design, and this is where it is, and um, this is in contract one of SEP South. The original design for this backfill was basically a one size fits all where you, you move all the spoil material to the north of that ditch into the ditch and have it as one fixed elevation. The DPM science team does, uh, recommended a design that tied to, to um, historic vegetation patterns. So shown here are the historic sloughs from the 1940s aerial imagery, which were provided by Dr. Krista Zweig. Um, the blue ones represent the historic sloughs around that agricultural ditch. The yellow ones are the historic sloughs that we're planning on actively restoring with Amy. And we recommended then a two level uh, backfill design. One to marsh grade, where they're mostly dominated by sawgrass um, historically, and then one that is two feet lower that is in areas dominated by sloughs. And this gave us the opportunity then to make sure that the AME would be effective, but also increase the connectivity and consider microtopography at the same time. Um, as a footnote, what you don't see here though is all the iterations that the DPM science team and the Corps of Engineers, engineers and project managers had when we were given different fill estimations to work with. And it looked very differently two months ago. The other thing, we're not sure this is um, uh, how long this is if this is going to change. So just keep in mind this is a this is a kind of moving target. Now the um, the benefits of or the um, information from DPM is is being used to inform more than just SEP South. They're currently being used to inform um, project features in SEP North as well. And here we provided um, a sheet flow optimization criteria, which is basically discharge per unit width that you don't want to go above in order to keep the landscape um, benefits of flow. Um, and that's been used for, as a screening tool for the model-based designs for the L4 canal, spreader canal. Um, and I'm not going to go into those details here because it actually requires a bit more context. And that's going to be discussed in part two of this presentation after we pause for questions. So I'm just going to, before we go to the questions, I'm just going to provide a quick summary of um, these successes where we have informed the design um, for SEP and also provide some, um, just a couple more additional successes where we've informed elsewhere. So 
The information from marsh canal sediment dynamics has also informed the design discussions for reducing particulate phosphorus in the L67A canal as part um, and the S333 discharge structure. That screening tool that I just mentioned is also being used for the Western Everglades restoration project. Um, communications have also been critical for success. Early on before DPM was installed and constructed, we had numerous co um, communications between um, the agencies, um, the scientists, and the public um, stakeholders, which actually ultimately informed the objectives of and the hypotheses of DPM, especially in the canal backfilling um, component. Um, also, there were numerous meetings between the Water Management District, U.S. Army Corps, Everglades National Park, and Florida International Uni University, um, which were critical to making sure the ecological objectives and the engineering design were compatible. Um, and then finally, the timing in 2017, we were uh, um, S-152 operations were reauthorized, which allowed us to do phase two of DPM. And that was critical because that's where we were able to implement those year round trigger operations, provide a, a do a scaled up version of the active marsh improvement, focus on some effects of flow and phosphorus loading, which we're gonna talk about in the second part, and also focus in on some of the canal marsh dynamics and, uh, and nutrient cycling in, in that area. And it's important because ecosystems take time to show you long-term trends and in particular provide statistically robust lessons learned. Okay, so that ends the first part of the talk. I think, is there, we were gonna have a time for questions or hope we run out of time for questions. Yeah, we have time for um, a couple of questions. If there are any. I'm interested, you're speaking a lot about success and how you use adaptive management to kind of guide what you do along the process. What I'm interested in is, were there spots where adaptive management, you didn't have the right parts of adaptive management to move forward? You were lacking either in funding or you were lacking in data or you were lacking in structured design or decision-making? Can you speak to that issue? Well, a lot of those things are the challenges, which are kind of part two of the oh, of the okay. presentation. Um, so you maybe hold that question. I mean, that's a great question. Um, from the DPM's perspective, um, it, one of the drawbacks of the experiment is that um, the canal backfill treatments, if you saw them, there was canal flow going through that open canal, and it just kept going into the partial and, and complete fill. Ideally, and in the original um, iterations of DPM, before, in fact, it was called something else, there were three different um, levee gaps and canal backfill treatments in different parts of the entire system. And that would have provided a more integrative look at, okay, what does an open canal look like? What does a partial canal look, partial fill canal look like? But we had to, you know, can we live with a 3,000 foot gap with adjacent backfill treatments? Yes, we can learn some things. Um, one of the things that we'll be talking about in part two is using modeling to bridge those gaps too. So I don't wanna, yeah, I just totally scooped, I scooped myself. Thank you. So my question probably isn't as prescient as Dave's was. So um, multiple iterations on figuring out the backfill design. Um, you talked about, you know, waiting, waiting for the next calculation on how much sediment that was actually gonna generate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from a science enterprise perspective, did that essentially move as fast as it it could, given sort of the structure that you all were approaching this 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 planning and design process? You mean, did the iterations move yeah. quickly like, enough? If if you did an agile sprint exercise, would this have solved your questions? You know, six months earlier, that kind of thing, relative to what your what the current structure is. Um, I mean, if I understand the question, it's could we have could we have focused in on the issue and, and come up with an answer right away. And really, one of the uncertainties that was causing that iteration was really about how much fill do we have to work with? And also, how do you get it into that back into that ditch if you need more? Um, from the science team's perspective, that wasn't something we had much control over. 
And I know there was a lot of time being spent trying to figure out how much fill is needed for all the different components of SEP South. It wasn't just for the agricultural ditch. It had a much broader integrative um, problem solving going on. I think that question though is probably better answered um, from someone from the core who was um, you know, looking at, at that. On, at that okay, uh, fair enough. Thing. But uh, the, the DPM team, you know, whenever we would get information uh, you know, from the core about how much you know fill is reasonable. Um, you know, we would gather the forces and, and come up with a plan. Like the 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 one that we have now, the one we I just showed you, we turned it around within a week. Okay. Um, once we were told, okay, you got all the fill you need, go for it. So and that was over Fourth of July. So thank you guys <laughs> for working on that. Bill and then Al. So, so if I understood correctly, and I wasn't clear on the timeline in terms of when the AMI was applied to create those new slews, um, have those, that looked like it was low flow in terms of the behavior that sort of surprised you in terms of where the flow was occurring. And I guess I'm wondering if, um, uh, have those been subjected to extreme events and were there any lessons learned or surprises in terms of how those behaved under extraordinarily high flows? Yeah. You can feel free to correct me, Sue. Um, but actually, once those um, areas have been sprayed and they were subsequently run over by airboats to smash down the, the sawgrass because it was just standing in the way, um, the first flow that we got once it was smashed down, the, the picture that you saw with the open sloughs from the helicopter, that was the highest discharge we had ever gotten because it, it actually happened in a high a high water event. Um, I think there was some tropical storm or sub, something like that. So we almost got the maximum capacity discharges from the S-152 um, right away. And that those are the velocities that, that Sue showed you. Those 15 centimeters per second rarely ever happens. So we immediately got a good handle on what's the maximum capacity right away. Thank you, nature. Um, <laughs> but but, and then since then, we've been dealing with much lower discharges just because, you know, nature. Um, but so we have, a, we have a pretty good idea. But the bottom line is that we're still getting those elevated velocities about a kilometer or more away from the structure, whereas before it'd be within 300 meters. So we know it's, it's been effective. Thank you. Go ahead, Al, if you're out there. Yeah, I'm here, Jim. Thanks. Um, and thanks, Colin and Sue. That was interesting. Um, my question is more technical, I guess, than the previous ones, less about AM. So the spoils that are being added back into the canal in those areas where you're doing that, are those originally what was um, dredged from the canal itself? And were they analyzed at all in terms of what their implications might be for the water quality in the canals as part of this project? Um, I think, are you referring to the agricultural ditch? Um, referring to your experimental design where you had areas that were filled with spoils and areas that weren't, if I remember that correctly. Um, if it was actually, it's, okay. it's the partial fill and yeah. the complete fill, I think is what he's talking about. Oh, the, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Let me just, um, sorry. It, it kind of helps to make, make sure. Oh, believe me. It helps me too. It's difficult when you're doing this remotely. And not that one, but that one. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, this, the, the fill material was from the levee. So yeah, where you see no levee now, that's where all that fill material came from. Um, and it was pretty much lime rock. Okay. And well, <clears throat> excuse me, will any kind of, um, as part of the analysis, post design analysis include habitat quality or is this strictly um, in order to change the flow patterns? Um, it was a bit of both. I mean, we were interested in, in fact, I'm sorry, this is going to actually be well, way more um, uh, explained in part two of this presentation. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Didn't mean to be premature. No, no, no. It, it's confusing to everybody. But yeah, the, the habitat quality, though, that you see in these pictures with the SAV is something that we do want. It definitely has um, benefits. And like I said, it's the large fish uh, uh, catch per unit effort definitely increased with the fill. Thank you. I'll, I'll provide some more tidbits. All right. Part two. Go ahead, part two. All right.
So uh, now we're moving on to the potential. Um, we have hope that some of the information that we have has more use um, than it's currently being used. So getting back to our little box on the left, um, one of the things that we recommended from the DPM project is that when we discharge through culverts, we need to have spreader swales or energy dissipators. And I know that may sound odd for people who think, um, you know, the velocities that we see in the Everglades, you know, the two to five centimeters per second were, I think that's phenomenal. And I'm sure people working in other parts of the world think, oh my God, that's a drip. But once we start getting up to the 15 centimeters per second and things like that, we have a significant negative impact on the ecosystem because now we're loading phosphorus. And so even though we're providing phosphorus at concentrations that are within the criteria for the state, that by combining that with a high velocity, we're having a lot of local loading. And so what you can see here is a slough downstream from the structure in 2015. You can see it was a nice open water slough with water lilies and paraffin. And just a mere five years later, it's overrun with cattail. And the thing to be aware of here is this is not continuous discharge. The structure from 2013 to 2017 was only open two to three months a year. And from 2017 onwards, while I think at one point we had a maximum opening of six to seven months, we're not talking about year round flow. So what we're saying is that when we have high velocities, this site is one of the sites that had the higher velocities, we need to think about how can we dissipate that flow? And why do we say that it's um, a loading? Well, as many of you know, one of the causes for cattail abundance in the Everglades is phosphorus. And so we look at the phosphorus in the flock um, downstream of the structures. And over time, what you can find is the flock TP concentration at these higher velocity sites increased. I mean, they started out close to 500 and have now tripled during that shorter time period. And so again, you know, even though we're adding concentrations of phosphorus to the geometric mean of less than or equal to 10, we're seeing a dramatic increase in flock TP. Now, why is this line here? Well, the 500 milligram per kilogram line is there because that is what is considered by the Florida statute as being impacted. So once that sufficient soils, in that case, it was the top 10 centimeters of soil, is above 500 milligrams per kilogram, that is considered an impacted site. And so what this is suggesting, this is a significant impact locally. However, at sites further downstream, you're generally not seeing that same relationship. Now, the thing to be aware of, though, is how do we hone in? How do we hone in on what the velocity should be then? I mean, wasn't the purpose of the DPM project to actually come up with a velocity? Did we not do our jobs? I mean, isn't that kind of embarrassing? Um, but the problem is, is that we're a phosphorus limited ecosystem. And so when you add water to the system, you're also going to have a phosphorus uptake gradient. So where you have your higher velocities, you're going to have your higher phosphorus, and your lower velocities, you're going to have your lower phosphorus because the phosphorus is going to be taken up. It's just to, to very low levels. And so while it may enter at 10 here, once you get down here, you're at four. And so it's not something that you can, you can ever look at, well, what's, what would I have if I had a high velocity but low phosphorus concentration? What if I had a moderate velocity and a moderate phosphorus concentration? Those are relationships we did not see by looking at monitoring along the gradient. So as part of understanding, well, what should we be looking at as far as load and flow and concentration, we created this Bloom project, which we implemented in 2021. And so basically we had um, visqueen type screening, clear screening, we pushed it into the sediments. Um, we have, it's about 60 meters long. And the way to look at this is we're not, this is not the area of concern. What we're looking at is the flume, the flowway. We're funneling flow outside. We're using this to funnel and increase velocities with this sawgrass edge. And so this is actually in one of the Amy sloughs. And so our goal was is to increase phosphorus um, flow velocities from the one centimeter per second to two to maybe three as it narrows coming past the, the uh, flume. 
And then what we did, so we took measurements of velocity here and measurements of velocity here. We measured phosphorus concentrations in the soils. We looked at enzyme activity, looking at phosphorus um, limitation. And, and what we found is, first of all, we did in fact get the two to three centimeters per second here, which was good, it's meeting our design criteria. Um, whereas when there was no flow, we had one centimeter per second when the S152 was closed. So we were having equal distribution of flow, which was really good. Um, unfortunately, we've only had one flow event so far because last year it was too deep. For this past quarter year, it was too deep. We couldn't actually operate the S152 structure. So we've only had a few months of data during that one flow event. But during that time period, what we were able to show is that we did in fact see changes in enzyme activity just during that short six month period that the water column suggested that we were reducing phosphorus limitation in the flowway. So we are seeing a biological response and hopefully we'll be gearing up to flow hopefully the end of August this year and we'll be collecting more data. And so hopefully this project will allow us to hone in on, well, what should the velocity phosphorus load concentration B and what would that recommendation that we could then take to the set projects and say this is kind of how we recommend that you operate the system using these guidelines. And Colin is doing the fabulous job of actually bringing all this stuff together. I am not a modeler and so continuing with the marsh stuff before he moves on to the canal, Colin is going to explain to you what he's doing in integrating this and synthesizing it. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, so there are actually several uh, synthesis efforts that are ongoing to really scale up all the findings from the marsh that Sue has talked about with respect to phosphorus loading effects, um, ecological feedbacks to flow, and those sorts of things. Um, and so this is just one of the, the modeling efforts that we're doing. And in this case, we're calibrating landscape phosphorus budgets um, to accomplish several objectives. Um, and two of those budgets for extreme and high flow are exemplified here. Um, but they're basically, first of all, to um, take all the data and summarize the ecosystem phosphorus stocks and fluxes across these extreme high and low flow areas um, in DPM so we can understand what are the major players in what's moving phosphorus around or how much is it, is it leaving or staying or accumulating. And obviously with the models, you want to use them because they can extrapolate the impacts of things like flow on ecosystem dynamics over larger um, temporal and spatial scales. And in particular, one of the things we're using these is to assess how quickly sediment phosphorus and that front of phosphorus enrichment is going to be moving downstream. And because it's a model, we can also, and we'll use it to evaluate scenarios of different water management and vegetation management options with the ultimate objectives that we're trying to figure out how best to can we maximize the benefits of flow and minimize the harmful impacts. So that's just a, a kind of a quick taste of, of things that are ongoing, but they obviously have um, real impacts on how we recommend uh, management of the system. Okay, I'm going to switch back over to Canal. That was my little marsh time. Yeah, it was fun, everybody. We're going to go back to the marsh. <laughs> and this is um, talk about the, how the canal findings have the potential to inform restoration or set projects and SERP. Um, but it's important here to provide a bit more background about the restoration uncertainties that were addressed by DPM, um, specifically um, on canal uh, sediment and phosphorus dynamics. So the first uncertainty was to figure out to what extent do canals reduce the natural transport of sediments? And when we add flow, to what extent are we mobilizing phosphorus and rich sediments that are in the canal presently? Um, third, when we add backfill and limestone caps, are we effectively burying those high phosphorus sediments? And then um, to answer your question, Alan, yes, we were <clears throat> interested in understanding how backfilling can, can alter habitat quality. And the SAV was a big, was one of the big findings. And like I mentioned, the, uh, the fish results as well. Um, so one thing, even before we had backfilled any of the canal, done any of the construction is 
we use sediment traps to collect sediment across the entirety of the L67C canal in control areas, in areas that were going to get impacted. And one thing we saw right off the bat was that canal sediments everywhere were and highly enriched, above 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. But in the years after construction and at least three flow events, while the open canal sediments remained enriched, as you see on the right, the ones in the field treatments remained unenriched and resembled values that were more similar to natural marsh sediments. Now, if you look at the sloughs downstream of the gap, what you found is that the sediments, the benthic flocculate sediments, became enriched in phosphorus downstream of that no-fill site, which exhibits the canal to marsh flow. And in contrast, the sites downstream of the fill treatments remained low in phosphorus, although it is important to note that they do increase over time. So looking at that no-fill site close up here, just like we saw with the um, sites that were downstream of the S-152 that were getting high flows and loading, phosphorus enrichment was followed by invasion of cattail within a few years. So this result brings up the suggestion that canal flood plugs and backfill may have ecological benefits and might be needed for SEP South to be successful. But it is a good question and it came up like, can we extrapolate these results to the larger SEP South footprint? What are we missing here? Um, and certainly this is because, whereas in DPN, we had a small gap, but still a large amount of levy in place to, to funnel flows, in the Blue Shanty Flowway, the entirety of that levy is going to be removed. So the hydraulics are going to be different. So we addressed this uncertainty with two efforts. The first one, which was, um, I guess, would go in the success category, but it's here, um, is that we recommended that contract one, the northern gap south of the 631 structure, be relocated south of the 633 structure um, for a few different reasons. But first of all, because it provides a more immediate look ahead to the current SEP South configuration where you have levy removal and no backfilling. And because we are still monitoring at the DPM gap, we can compare it with um, the DPM gap, which is um, mostly backfilled. So we have a, a basis for comparison. The second effort um, to get at this uncertainty is the is a model, the Blue Shanty Flowway model. And this is a hydraulic model to assess flow conditions in the, the Blue Shanty Flowway with a focus on what the flows are in and downstream of that L67C canal and degraded levee. The map here and the arrows show our collective best guess about how flows may look in the completed and current SEP design. We expect uh, canal flows to accumulate and reach a maximum somewhere in the southwest corner where it dead ends. And that would result, um, because of that concentration of flows, that would result in high velocities and loading rates to those marshes downstream in that area. And if those velocities and loads are similar to what we see in DPM, like in the gap or downstream of the structure, then phosphorus enrichment may occur as well. But what's more important is that this area, you may have noticed, is pretty close to Everglades National Park. It's within a kilometer. And so using the rough 100 meters per year advancement rate that Sue talked about earlier, the concern is that phosphorus enrichment could reach Everglades National Park within um, a decade or so. So the, um, the Blue Shanty Floyd model is being used to estimate um, flows and loads in the current SEP South design, but it's also being used to identify the most cost-effective cost options for plug and fill that can minimize that canal flow and achieve a more evenly distributed um, sheet flow and loads as originally envisioned in the SEP. So I'll just give you a brief overview of the model. Um, the model domain is shown in blue here. And running the model requires using the regional systems model to provide inputs, including structure flows, seepage, and uh, surface flows along the boundaries. Uh, a model of uh, one version of the model is configured to present day conditions. And this is so we can use it to reality check or reality check it against actual DPM data to make sure the flows in the canal and the marsh are 
um, consistent with what's actually observed out there. And then we'll run a number of scenarios, including a future without modifications, and also um, scenarios with different designs of plugs, fill, and levy elevations. And this work has been deemed um, creditable and cost shareable between the South Florida Water Management District and the US Army Corps of Engineers and um, is generally considered critical to inform SEP adaptive management. Okay, so that actually is the entirety of the talk. I will just, um, again, this table like the last time summarizes the potential ways that DPM is, can, can inform CERT projects and close that feedback helix, or yes, you can say helix of the AM cycle. <clears throat> um, these actions thus far have not been realized. And the reasons for those, I guess, are the, we're going to talk about that in the panel discussion. Um, but I'm gonna list a few of those challenges that we've seen um, and just talk through that, or just list them here and we can discuss them more in the break if they're, if they're useful for that discussion. The uh, first thing is timing, incorporating, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a recommended um, action item is a lot easier and faster if it's considered a design refinement versus a major requiring a major amendment to an adaptive management plan. Another thing that's a challenge is whether uh, something like adding a spreader swale or canal plugs requires additional NEPA coverage, um, whether funding was anticipated for these things, um, and if it was, is it sufficient? And something that those two things have in common is that, and another, another um, aspect is that there, we are constrained by the 2014 set PIR. We couldn't think of everything in 2014 because DPM hadn't even flown when that document was you know, drafted and, and authorized. So, um, so there are things that we've learned, um, which I guess are part of that helical um, uh, paradigm that you spoke of. And there's also differences interp in interpretation about what that document authorizes, I believe, um, between um, different agencies, including um, the extent and type of downstream water quality monitoring that can be done, as well as sediment chemistry monitoring. And then finally, it always comes down to communication and while we pointed out the benefits of communication from DPM and different aspects, the rapid and effective communication within and across partnering organizations and stakeholders is a challenge. It takes a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of time to reach um, agreements or um, not agreements. And, and one thing that the DPM team has always felt as we were um, talking with project managers from SEP and trying to see how our lessons learned could be adapted into construction features and things like that, we always felt like the design and construction train was either about to or had left the station. Um, so aligning the timelines of adaptive management, things like this, and implementation is, is the tricky part. But communication is key. Thank you, Colin and Sue. Um, I think we'll go to break now for 10 minutes. And um, what time is it now? And yeah, we'll come back at four o'clock or and we'll pick up with panel discussions. Well, you can stay where you are, but we're going to change the agenda a little bit and we're going to have public comments now. And I think there are two of them. The reason we're doing that is because we didn't tell those members uh, that we were um, going to move off the four o'clock slot. So our first, uh, first speaker is Davis. Oh. You can stay. Well, first of all, I want to um, just Thank you all on the committee for your service. Uh, this is a really, uh, from the standpoint of an organization like mine, by the way, I'm Steve Davis, Chief Science Officer of the Everglades Foundation. Uh, what you sort of provide back to us every two years in the biennial reports is incredibly valuable. Uh, as a science-based organization, 
we use that information to help inform our own science internally, but we also use it to help drive our advocacy efforts because uh, coming from such an esteemed body and realizing that you're sort of digesting all this information over years from both state and federal agencies, local agencies as well that we heard from earlier today, uh, it's, it's really a powerful tool. And just to speak as an example, um, you know, the progress that we've made, particularly at Tamiami Trail and Northeast Shark River Slough, COP being a focus of the conversation this morning, it's, it's easy to sort of lose sight of how far we've come in such a short period of time. I, you know, my stomach still turns when I hear eight and a half square mile area, but we're actually overcoming that as an obstacle to flowing water south. And, and with removal of that constraint, Tamiami Trail within the next couple of years, we really have the opportunity to send restoration quantities into the park. And, and that's a big deal, but we also know that there's science that's still informing the process with Colin and uh, the, the presentations that we just heard about the decomp physical model, the considerations with phosphorus that we need to make sure that we're taking consideration of. Um, so great progress. Uh, obviously, science still needs to be central in driving restoration, implementation, operations moving forward. Uh, I, I want to just take a quick note and speak to the, the level of collaboration and engagement that we've seen over the last five years or so. Uh, it's really been incredible at the federal level, at the state level, uh, the Water Management District and, and Army Corps of Engineers working together, but also working to engage the public and groups like the Everglades Foundation. I think that's really been mutually beneficial because, again, it helps to, to support our efforts in advancing restoration, but I've also seen how our work from a technical level has helped to inform restoration planning and implementation just over that brief period of time. Uh, so I think the, those uh, feedback opportunities are beneficial. Lastly, I want to point to the fact that, um, you know, uh, I think Jennifer Harado mentioned earlier that they never expected that they would need to consider a one in 1,000 year rainfall event in their, their uh, resiliency planning. Uh, I think after this past month, many of us are realizing that we need to consider extreme heat perhaps a little bit more in our understanding of the ecosystem and, and across the ecosystem from, you know, biogeochemical cycling of elements, how that impacts water quality, potentially uh, plant and animal physiology was mentioned earlier about how heat uh, affects uh, plant physiology, ultimately evapotranspiration rates. I think if we sort of consider this, it's not that restoration or, or water management can mitigate extreme heat, but I think we need to understand how that feeds into our assessment of Everglades restoration success and how potentially extreme heat could affect many of the variables that we're tracking in response to restoration, just so that we understand its contribution to those outcomes. So I'll leave it at that again. Thank you for your service, uh, particularly to the new folks. Welcome to the committee. Uh, your work's incredibly valuable to us. Thanks. All right, and the last speaker, Eve Samples. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Eve Samples, Executive Director at Friends of the Everglades. We were founded in 1969 by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. This is <laughs> my first meeting of this type and I'm really um, delighted to be here and want to pay tribute to all of you for spending so many hours in a windowless conference room examining the science of Everglades restoration. Um, we think about it every single day. It's daunting and it can also um, be misrepresented in the public eye. So what you do to make sure we're staying on course in terms of having science guide our work and our huge investment in this effort is really important. Um, so from some perspectives, we're very encouraged at Friends of the Everglades. I've been in this role three years and we see some progress, um, not just in the SERP realm, but also in terms of water management. Lowsome, for example, is showing signs that um, we're acknowledging the threat of toxic algae blooms in our water management system. 
also Losum for the, the first time in any lake management plan acknowledges that Everglades National Park needs more water to the south, so that's incremental progress. Um, but we're also concerned still about looming challenges, particularly for water quality and the EAA reservoir. Your committee uh, provided a great service in the last biennial review published in December in um, articulating those water quality concerns, especially as it relates to the STAs. I think you characterized those challenges or those water quality concerns as challenging, a daunting challenge looming on the horizon. And of course, we know that the EAA reservoir, um, arguably the biggest financial investment and investment in terms of effort in SERP relies on the success of those STAs performing in terms of water quality. So in, in the uh, biennial review published in December, you articulated four very sound recommendations in terms of how we can make sure we stay on track in terms of water quality. So um, near-term monitoring, I won't go through all four of them. They're in your report. You know them better than I do. Um, we've amplified those recommendations to DEP and others. And I would just encourage you to make sure that um, those are looked at again when you, in two years from now, publish the next biennial review. It's After listening to the adaptive management conversation for the last hour or so, I'm sitting here wondering how, if we build a $4 billion reservoir with 37 foot high embankment walls that doesn't address water quality, how are we going to adaptively manage our way out of that? So it's it's a question in layman's terms. I'm not a scientist, you are, but I hope you'll lend your, your um, immense expertise to that question. So with that, um, I just want to thank you again and um, let you know that we'll be following your progress and eagerly awaiting your next report. Thanks. Thank you. So now we'll go back to our panel discussion. And this is a discussion on SEP challenges incorporating new science into decision-making. And in addition to our in-person panelists, I think we have Angie Dunn of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers joining us virtually, and also Jenna May, uh, same affiliation, also joining us virtually. Any questions from the committee? Thanks everyone for um, really interesting presentations right after lunch. Um, and this is a general interest question that kind of reflects my ignorance of everything that's going on in the Everglades. Um, so when we have these really big extreme events, as we seem to be having more often, um, what does that do to these experiments, these adaptive management experiments? Does it destroy the experiment or does it provide an opportunity for new information? And, and if so, does the process that was laid out work quick enough or efficiently enough to shift gears in those situations? <laughs> Um, well, the, uh, the the question that came up before about the extreme event, I think that was an example of when, um, for the DPM experiment, we were able to take advantage of it um, as long as we had folks out there quickly getting getting data. We couldn't get all the infra, um, all the equipment out there in time, so we actually, when we had our biggest flow event, we couldn't get our sediment traps out there, so we couldn't measure sediment transport um, doesn't to say that we we missed a huge opportunity but we could have learned something uh, pretty valuable there um, and and some of that comes from the fact that the t it all comes down to timing again when we had high water events and big rain events and gates need to be opened the dpm team will can say well can you wait two weeks you know can you give us more time but if the gate needs to be opened it has to be opened that hasn't happened all the time. We have we have had a, a, a some successes in making sure we can open gates accordingly. But yeah, high water events present um, some some difficulties and challenges for sure. Um, I will say though, um, and this is not so much extreme events, but sometimes nature doesn't 
give you equal conditions for the entirety of your experiment. So once we had that big water event when we just opened up those big Amy sloughs, ever since then, we've had high waters, which ironically have prevented us from flowing because it always went above that high stage mark. So we did miss some opportunities like that. As a result, we've only been able to monitor discharges that were below the averages pre-Amy. So ironically, most of our flow is actually slower since Amy, but the USGS folks in particular did a really good job of parsing out and controlling for different conditions and looking at relationships of velocity versus discharge. And we're able to look and get those, um, measure those effects through more like robust and in intricate statistical analyses. But, you know, that's one way we try to work around it is to read into the data a little bit more, but there's nothing like having a a, a nimble field crew that can go out there um, within a matter of days and, and collect data when you need it. But could, could I just follow up on that quickly? But you had a Bakke analysis. So wouldn't that Bakke design mitigate problems with extreme events? Because presumably the extreme events are um, affecting your control too. Yeah, um, that, that extreme event wasn't really... Um, it didn't really affect the Baki because all the other events were were fairly similar. Um, had we had we had sediment traps out there, we probably would have just had a bigger average to compare to with the with the controls. But yeah, that is one of the powers of the Baki and the and the need for the Baki experiments to have a control. Um, but um, but one thing that we learned with the Baki experiment is that you may think you have your controls in the right place but you may actually get flow going to one of them more than you expected because the landscape flows east and not south. So um, that we, nevertheless, the statistics were pretty robust even with that um, spillover of a flow going, going east. But, but yeah, that's, that's right. The, yeah. I think Charlie, Charlie's next. Can I just add one point to that? If one of the things was, was there something else that we also could have learned? Um, one thing we couldn't take advantage of some of these big flow events is the fact it actually ended up being a big sediment moving event or a big terrifying slough clearing event. Um, and what we found is you would go out into the ridges and you would see this dense paraffin mats, these racks just coating the edges of the ridges. And so it kind of did reinforce that concept of sediment transport and actually also the role of nature in slough clearing and um, creating sediment transport opportunities and topography. The dilemma, of course, is we didn't have me measurements before that event occurred, so we couldn't go out and say, well, a catastrophic event or a, a historic um, wet condition would create this much of a landscape topographic change. So because we didn't have the data beforehand, we couldn't then take advantage of, of the data we could have collected afterwards. So I know the theme here is adaptive management, but I have a technical question about the um, uh, decomp uh, experiments. And I may have missed this, but you talked about these increases in uh, paraffite and phosphorus, long-term decreases, particularly in the open channel. So what's, I, I have two questions. First one, do we know what the mechanism is behind driving that? And the second question, is about, you talked about mitigation by fill, adding uh, calcium carbonate. And I know down here, calcium carbonate is very abundant, but if the goal would be to immobilize phosphorus, would it be useful to look at other types of fill material that might be fairly effective at immobilizing phosphorus? That, I mean, I guess that adds another experimental dimension to it, and maybe you don't want to go there, but it seems to be, a, it might be something worth considering so two questions sorry well i'm gonna um <laughs> i'm gonna boot the phosphorus immobilization question to sue she's a way better chemist than i am um but your question was about the disappearance of paraphyton with flow like was that the question what, what's the mechanism for that no i thought you talked about the fill right would mitigate the mobilization oh, of, of phosphorus. canal phosphorus and right you, i think you specifically mentioned uh limestone or calcium carbonate mm -hmm. 
and you know that's a possibility but there are other possibilities as well that you could use uh, now maybe they're not maybe they're too expensive but there are other materials that can potentially effectively be more effective than than limestone at immobilizing phosphorus if that, if it's a if it's a chemical mechanism um, the whole chemistry of phosphorus immobilization has been an interesting and complex discussion that's been happening for many, many years in the Everglades ecosystem, um, dating back to times where there was questions about marsh readiness of any water that would come out of an area that you would had chemical amendments. Um, there's a big concern about, um, you know, would you have aluminium leaching? Would you have other things leaching? Because we are a very sensitive system. So the the premise behind the limestone was the fact that it is naturally abundant here it is is part of the ecosystem and we are seeing that you know it, it, it can act as a cap um, however the concept of um, different things to immobilize the sediments and immobilize the phosphorus in the sediment is currently being explored as part of the s333 working group um, with the idea there that um, we're seeing periodic spikes in phosphorus before it enters everglades national park and some of the questions associated with that is how much of that is attributed to the resuspension of the canal sediments. And um, ideas that are currently being floated around are include looking at mechanisms to, to keep that in situ, but also approaches to maybe absorb that phosphorus onto other things, whether it be um, using some kind of biochar or something like that. But again, that also has its own chemistry concerns um, and what it the unintended consequences of that would be. Uh, so uh, as far as looking into it, we are, but we didn't do that within this project, but they are considering evaluating that as part of the S333 initiative. Yeah, I think it's Stephanie, then, <clears throat> then Tracy, and then John. So I, I think I have two related questions, but I, I want, so, so the fundamental question is really related to SIP. What factors dictate the successes of adaptive management versus the challenges of adaptive management? Like which pieces go through well versus which pieces don't go through well? And the related question is how much is it based on what you put in the plan in the first place? So when I went back and read the plan, plan on the plane, like there's nothing in here about canal filling that I can find anywhere. Like you did this huge DPM experiment and there's nothing about canal filling. Does that matter in terms of your ability to go forward with canal filling? Was that like, can you explain how that happened? And, but, but then that's just part of a question on successes and failures. Go ahead. Or I'll take a quick stab and then and then run away. <laughs> um, one of we had these discussions with um, multi-agency discussions as we were finishing up DPM and SEP was in the coming online design phase, trains leaving the station phase um, about how to translate our lessons into action items and. You mentioned the spreader swales or the, the canal backfilling and the spreader swales. Those met with um, a lot of um, challenges because one, they, the requirement for NEPA was considered to, re, to I mean, I, I might have my facts wrong, but people were expecting that that would just take too many years to uh, allow, say, a backfill to be part of a current SEP contract. I could be wrong. Um, but that required a lot of time. And also, I think that, like I said, it comes down to these things are expensive too, um, to backfill a canal where, especially when it wasn't planned for. Why canal backfilling wasn't in the set PIR in 2014, I think is the, the big question. Um, and I can't explain why it wasn't. Um, I wasn't privy to the whole writing phase, but... Um, I, I do remember we were having conversations, uh, I think in 2013, about um, choosing between the different alternatives, uh, modeling alternatives that would, you know, basically say SEP has to have the blue shanty flowway. And it did come up that we know the DPM experiment hasn't even flowed yet. 
and that we may learn some things. But um, if I could go back 10 years, you know, I, I would say, whatever we need to do, put some flexibility in there, put some flexibility in that language that would account for that. I'm not sure that that would do the trick because you would also have to have, you know, some, maybe some funding set aside as well. Um, but, you know, I think that that would have been a big part of it is to have that language in the, in the PIR. So but, if it was in the adaptive management plan, would that have counted for NEPA? But it would have had to have been budgeted for that? Too? Okay. So I think the most direct answer is for the core. It all comes down to authorization. It comes down to cost and it comes down to schedule. So if it was a um, component, a, a management measure within the original SEP PIR, you have authorization, you've already budgeted for cost, and you've already done the National Environmental Policy Act compliance, right? So it's already built into the schedule. So, um, and as I was talking about earlier, it'd be nice to have a crystal ball during the planning phase. So you can anticipate everything that you need so that it could be a very streamlined, straightforward process so that you check off all of the boxes and, and you move forward. Um, but with the decomp physical model, and I have to say, I'm in this process at the 11th hour with decomp. Um, I, I think the conversations um, that we learned, right? Part of the adaptive management process and especially active adaptive management, we're supposed to take those lessons learned and incorporate them into our plan. But the challenge is how do we do that if we don't have the authorization for it? So. We can do it, but it's a lengthy process because you have to go back for additional authorization. There are some certain things that could be considered design refinements. Um, and those design refinements, if they're within our chief's discretionary authority and we have you know, budget for it, then sure, then that may require additional National Environmental Policy Act compliance or documentation. And as a former NEPA writer, I, I never want that to be the thing that stops something, right? It may make it take a little bit longer, and that's when you bump into the schedule issue, right? Because as you were talking about earlier, we have congressional appropriations. So you have a certain amount of money that goes to a certain contract, and it has to be spent within a certain amount of time because funds expire, right? So it's the Anti-Deficiency Act, all of the things that go into the, the budgeting process. So again, another factor. Um, and so I think those are some of the challenges that we truly have with adaptive management because we want to take lessons learned from other parts of SERP and apply them to inform design. And I think that was easier to accomplish in SEP North when we were talking about lessons learned from Lila to help inform design of those hydrologic speed bumps, those hammocks within the Miami Canal. But those were already in the Miami Canal. Those were already part of the authorized project. We all knew how much fill we had available because in the authorized project, they planned, you know, you have this amount of fill available from the backfill of the Miami Canal to create these features. This is the cost associated with it. Yes, it was cost in 2012, but you factor for inflation and they have a way of doing that where you come up with a new project cost. So there's lots of different um, factors that, um, you know, are definite challenges, right? Um, but also we want to try to find a way to get around those challenges so that we can truly incorporate that information because we know we need it for project success. So can I just clarify, was that Ag Canal in the PIR? That was filled in the PIR, but it wasn't, okay. So it's just refining the design of how that was filled, but the actual canals. Yeah, Stephanie's actually asking my question. Um, yeah, Stephanie asked my question. Um, but And you sort of addressed um, my broader question based upon you know, how the decomp physical model is being used um, for adaptive management in a broader sense of, is this going to be a major hindrance to adaptive management down the line for all of the projects? I sure hope not. Because, <laughs> you know, this honestly, this is the first one. Yes, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands has adaptive management, but that's operations, right? And, and so there's not 
a cost involved with that other than if we need additional National Environmental Policy Act documentation, right? That's something that's within the flexibility we already have. But this is the first large scale implementation of adaptive management in CERP. Right. And so there's a lot of bugs that we have to work out. Right. There's a lot of process um, issues and, and challenges and, you know, just the the different interpretations of, of guidance. You know, we may interpret something at the Jacksonville level where as it has to go all the way up our chain to headquarters, if you're going to change the adaptive management plan. And that was part of the, the issue with that is it's not just Jacksonville wanting to make a determination. We have to go ahead and do that vertical coordination. One quick follow-up question. Sure. So what makes the determination for you to actually go through the lengthy process of chain of you know going through the NEPA process and starting to fill canals based upon new data that suggests that there's many benefits to doing that? So are you asking what what would be the process? So um the, the yeah. process, I'm sorry. Sort of a trigger for deciding it's worth going through the lengthy process. Um, I'm always up for, you know, if it's worth it, let's fight for it. But, you know, it comes down again to to schedule and, and to the cost associated with it. And is it within the approved authorized total project cost, right? Is, is there room and contingency for it? Um, so those are the things that have to be very well defined in order to make that decision of, yes, it's within our authority. Yes, we um, have, um, you know, the, the cost is appropriate for that, then let's go down that process. But if you're asking to add, you know, a lot of money above what we have for the entire contract, it, it's probably not going to happen in that contract. Could it happen in another one? Sure, but we have to go back and ask for more money. I wanted to go back to the um, active, the active adaptive management and the experimental design. You guys highlighted the value of the Baki approach, but it seems like there's really not any replication because it's just you know individual sites. So have you thought? And and I understand doing landscape scale experiments is definitely a challenge, um, and some of the projects I've been involved with have had similar limitations. But what about trying to incorporate some replication? across, you know, not necessarily for this project, but for future active adaptive management efforts so that you you don't just have single treatments, but a mix, you know, replicate. Unfortunately, that comes down to funding. I mean, as Colin mentioned, the original design for the DPM project had replicated flowways, um, not just replicate canals, but also replicated flowways and it just became cost prohibitive. So I think if we can, we would always go for replication, um, but we're not always financially in a position to do so. One thing I'll, one thing I'll add to that is um, we, we also, even though there was a Baki design and that was the heart and soul of the data set, we realized that we, I think it was the year before we flowed, just in case flow does something that we don't know about, let's make a spatial sampling design. And so we had, as part of Recover, in fact, we worked with uh, Mike, Dr. Mike Ross's team at FIU to come up with a, uh, some sampling grids that we could look at the spatial coverage of flow and at least look at the, you know, have a, a surface, a response surface of flows and, and loading. And so we, we kind of used that to, you know, so that we wouldn't be saying, this is our control site, this is what it's doing. Is it acting like the rest of that landscape way out west or way out east? So we, we did feel comfortable with both of those sampling designs. I'm not sure the field crew liked having two sampling designs. Thank you, Q. Marla? Thanks. <clears throat> so I just wondered if, yes, try not to, Popolit again. Um, I wondered if cultural resources and tribal interests are uh, criteria within the adaptive management framework as a whole or within individual projects in particular. And if so, what would be the best sources of information, either documents and or individuals for the committee um, to learn more about that? Up to this point, 
cultural resources themselves or um, are not part of the adaptive management plan. They are part of the cultural resources assessment in the project implementation report. That being said, on our PDTs and also our eco sub teams, we have significant involvement from um, tribal representatives and scientists um, to help and subject matter experts to help us inform those monitoring plans and adaptive management plans. Um, so that's a really great resource for, um, for us for those plans when we're writing them, um, as well as there, um, there is significant involvement from various um, individuals when we're also having uh, PDT updates and talking about what next, or now that we're going into this next um, step of SEP, um, there was involvement at the workshop that Gina mentioned so that we gain all perspectives possible out there and all knowledge base um, is very welcome. And we really appreciate the participation with that to help inform. So hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, thank you. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, I think it was Kevin that was mentioning earlier, the new recover module, the Southwest Florida module, in which we have um, active uh, tribal representation um, in that and where we're trying for the first time to have a, a performance measure uh, that includes that um, indigenous uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so the idea is to um, listen and let the tribes guide us to where that information um, belongs within uh, our SERP footprint and how we can best uh, utilize information that they would like to convey. But uh, again, over the last couple of years, uh, Recover is kind of uh, taken, I don't want to say a backseat, but we want the tribes to share with us what they would like to share, and we'll take all information provided. Dave and then Wendy. Jeff, if you're next, <laughs> you've been waiting there politely. I miss you. Trying to protect you, buddy. Well, it reminds me of the Jerry Seinfeld routine where it's good to be next for a while. So I might pass it on, but I'll go, I'll go ahead. Uh, my question's a little, a little bit of a tangent. I, I wanted to ask about these um, management options matrices, which are, you know, a big part of the SEP AM plan and their Picayune Strand has some and they're, they seem to be uh, cropping up everywhere and look like they're going to be an important AM tool in the future. And I realize it's early for SEP, but do you have any, because none of the examples we heard today involve those, are there any examples yet of those actually coming into play anywhere at a project level or anything? Or is that just something we can expect to see down the road when things have been up, projects have been operating longer. I'm trying to sort through all the PIRs I have in my brain right now. Um, I believe for the most part, the management option matrices. So what those are is it says um, what the uncertainty is, it, what attribute is being measured, frequency of measurement, and then a threshold or what we want to see um, with improvements and what would be bad if we saw something else. And then there's um, the management option is in the last column. And a lot of them are operational because we can do so much with operations um, to help benefit the system. Um, some of them are to, some of them are definitely going to be put in place after things are operating. Some of the, so there is some language to help inform design as well in there. Um, but again, I'd have to look at it um, again. It's been a couple of days. Okay. But they do play a very important role. And um, it's also important that we are able to have some flexibility within there because that's again, had canal backfill potentially been in the um, set mom, then that might have been a potential option. So we're learning. And also I it was not part of the set PIR, but when um when I was talking about how the DPM team was talking with set project managers about making adaptive management happen, right? The DPM information, we ended up turning this um, eight to nine month period of weekly meetings into a recommendations document. It was more like an active, you know, action item of lessons learned. This is what you can do to fix it. 
And just when we thought we had finished that document, um, somebody had recommended that we make a management options matrix um, to codify this stuff. And so we did, and it added about 20 pages or something to that document. But um, but we, you know, we we it forced us to kind of put these the lessons that we've learned into thresholds. If you see this much, you know, enrichment here, then you need to do basically the um the things that we that Sue and I talked about. These are your options. Um, but it also requires that you have monitoring in place that you can detect those thresholds. And that, you know, that monitoring may or may not be sufficient but, but yeah it's clear that adaptive management has been happening outside of that framework i just wondered if it had started to happen yet uh inside of it like picky and strand red cockaded woodpecker wasn't in in their any of their moms um, um so that was kind of out something that happened outside of that process but i guess we'll watch for that in the future yeah, and we're looking um, right now, the partner agencies are working through the process by which we can update these adaptive management plans. As I said, they're intended to be iterative and um, living documents um, built off new knowledge base so and information even from baselines that are gained. So we're working through that process of how to then take and um, take the information and new management option matrices with recommendations and being able to incorporate them into an updated document. It's it's an interesting challenge when you're working with an authorized document to try to have a component of it that's intended to be iterative and um, changing and updated. My question is is um, more process oriented. It follows on Tracy's question and what you what you presented on SEP, because I think it's a great example, first off. Um, my concern is or my question is is as we gain knowledge, and SEP clearly has brought us new knowledge on flow, on phosphorus, et cetera, and it may point to a different approach in terms of broad scale, where do we want to put our priorities, our focus, et cetera. So my question is, is as we gain this knowledge, and, and the other thing is, is that I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that SEP was initiated pre-recover. Is that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was it was kind of initiated outside of the recover. No, it wasn't. Okay. So it is in the recover process. Well, we were talking a little bit earlier, and the the point is is the the recover mechanism to take the information from the project and take that forward that did not exist when DPM okay. was first created. That's that's where I'm going towards. Yeah. Because now, as we gain new information, that may require a May, may provide us an opportunity to look at where we're prioritizing our efforts. How will we capture that? Is that in the annual recover process? Is it in the five-year report, Gina, that you referred to? You know, how do we, where is the place that we can now go back and say, should we be doing more of what has now been identified through the SEP process? Or, you know, I'm just trying to get a sense of how would we take knowledge and apply it adaptively to making better decisions on where we put money. So I'm gonna see if Angie or Jenna would like to speak. Um, I most certainly can answer the question, but I honestly, I forgot Jenna was behind yeah. me. <laughs> I, I do wanna give them an opportunity to say something. Um, so I think um, there are opportunities throughout that uh, POC interaction point process that uh, Gina uh, covered earlier. Um, that's just one way that we can feed the project information and make sure there's integration um, throughout the, the program, the CERT program, and um, feed into the lessons learned. Um, there's also other things that Recover is doing to um, assess uh, So can you repeat your question one more time? I want to make sure I'm going down the right, <laughs> right tangent. My question is, My question is, is, is sorry for the feedback. How do we incorporate more in the decision process? Um, and if it may require a kind of a reassessment of where funding and initiative is going, I guess in the broad, in the broad context, not individual projects per se, but it could be an individual project, but it's just 
How do we use information that's coming forth? Okay, so through that um, POC process, um, that's where we pull the individual projects. Recover also conducts um, system-wide assessments through uh, what we call our system status report, is something that we've used in the past to actually um, assess across the system kind of how things are performing. And through um, that assessment, we can document recommendations for uh, things that we're seeing in terms of how things are responding and make recommendations uh, to project management on what we think needs to change in order to get to the ecological goals that we've set. Um, we also conduct um, modeling exercises that uh, can give us the same kind of information, um, but in a, a modeling framework um, where we can also document those kinds of recommendations um, to provide to project management. Um, and so I think there are a few places that we can make the make document, we basically capture that information and document it and share it through the program and, uh, and point to areas that need improvement um, based on those kinds of assessments and, and modeling exercises. Um, it's kind of a general uh, response and I can go into more detail, but I'm, I'm trying not to get too into the weeds. Thank you. budget constraints associated with conducting a replicated experiment for DPM. And I was just wondering, like how much is too much money to spend on an active adaptive management experiment? Who decides that, who pays for it? Is it some percent of estimated construction costs? Is there some cost benefit ratio? How does the budget come together? It's my understanding, and I hopefully you guys will correct me if I'm wrong, that um, an active adaptive management plan cannot exceed 20% of the project costs. And in the case of the DPM project, initially it was going to be reliant on other projects for funding, but then in addition to doing the science, it also had to pay for the construction of the structure. So that took away a significant amount of money that could be used to use to conduct the science. And it's like 90% of the project, something like that. So the PIR has an estimated I have to say, I'm still struggling with the phosphorus dimensions of the decomp physical model. And I'm wondering if you can kind of simplify it in terms of implications for different pathways. Because one implication seems to be you don't plug the canal and lots of phosphorus pours into Everglades National Park and now you're violating the Appendix A criteria. So when I hear examples of like adaptive management that works well, it seems like there's a hammer somewhere like the Endangered Species Act that says you can't go down this path, you have to go down another path. Seems to me it's a big hammer to violate water quality. Is that raising, did I interpret that correctly? And is that raising alarm enough to think that maybe plugs are required so you don't get down the path of pouring phosphorus into the park and then saying, oh, we actually knew that that was going to happen, but we didn't have the right element in the plan, and now we'll change it 20 years later. Help, help me understand. I may have misunderstood. Yeah. I mean, when we kind of extrapolate those results, like I showed you, to the Bush anti-flowway scale, from the ecological perspective, that was our expectation, is that where you're going to get that much canal flow you're going to be stirring up those in your sediments. And on top of it, you're going to be getting high flows, which in and of themselves create enriched conditions just by how they change the system. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and that, that kind of brings up the question um, that you brought up, David, too, is that we, the DPM team, was realizing this was a potential issue or like as early as we could, like 2018 is when we started talking about this and actually sending memos around about the benefits of canal backfilling. 
Um, so part of that is, you know, when you talked about what changes, what communications have to occur, part of that is the project people, you know, the, the scientists themselves have to be aware when they see something that they think needs to be elevated. And that was, you know, basically communication has to be organic as well. Um, but yeah, the, what would be very helpful though, on top of this extrapolation, this kind of intuitive extrapolation is when we can have some model simulations showing, will the plugs work? Do we need to backfill? Where is the best place to put them? You know, I think that kind of concrete information would maybe help guide the, the conversation or focus the conversation a bit more um, so we can get a handle on those things. But as much as we are trying to um, keep it on track, there's a lot of modeling going on. Um, so, yeah. Um, to to what extent can or e, are future scenarios being incorporated into the AM? For example, we just talked in the morning about um, rainfall and extreme rainfall. So, to what extent are those being incorporated into the process, or can they be incorporated to the process? Right now, um, it will be very actively incorporated, I believe, into the BBC, which hasn't been written yet, <laughs> but um, in developing their performance measures and the other uh, modeling efforts and that is ongoing and the sea level rise scenarios that they are running to attain the um, preferred alternative, it will be incorporated into that plan. As far as previous plans, um, I'm not sure there may be some if we were to update them. But at this time, other than stochastic storm events, there's nothing because they they try to focus around what the project can actually do, right? what the project is in is um, can handle. It it can't it can't do anything about temperatures getting hot. But like somebody said, it's like, well we can look at how the ecosystem's responding instead. So I think we're taking oh. really great strides forward in the BBC or study effort to really you know in the future look forward um, and to get that captured. That also reminds me of um, what we, when we were in our third flow event in DPM, we were facing a, a strong El Nino condition, which was gonna be bringing a lot of water into the Everglades. And I believe there were conversations about opening up the structure, even though we had just closed it, that it would need to be opened up again because of water coming down the system. And we worked on a revised trigger. I think it was called the dynamic trigger, the weekly trigger that we could look at TP from every, every data point and make a projection every two weeks. So we could actually op reopen the structure. We had, sorry, some of those memories are, are buried deep, but now that you remind me, like we actively worked to, to get um, a mechanism to open that structure because we knew that the high water events were really important to capture. And I think that's kind of speaks to the importance of trying to make your experiment, your on the ground field measurements adaptable to get those high water um, conditions. And that actually was, we got such good data from that, that we were able to kind of stop some of our sediment transport monitoring and move on to the biogeochemistry because we had such a great response surface, the data was robust, and then we could move on to other uh, mechanisms, but it does point to sometimes scientists have to scramble. And fortunately, we work with operation, you know, water managers and, and project managers to get that, you know, operational trigger in place in time to open the structure. Kind of tangentially related. But... Any more questions from the committee? Okay, we're going to go. Thank you, panel. Um, we're going to go on to our last panel now, and this is how to improve the process for adaptive management and science informing decisions making in SERP. Okay, the last panel focused on SEP, all right, Central Everglades Planning Project. This is system wide, and we have a different cast of characters up there for our panel or who, who uh, look across these systems. So do you get it? <laughs> some coffee or... no, <laughs> yeah. 
talking about the first direction. <laughs> And I think we should have Kim Baltech and Leslie Guo Wong online. Oh, we're we're right into um, the Q and A. Any questions from the committee? We have a half an hour left. Buck up, folks. <laughs> I'm going to jump in if nobody jumps. Oh, you, you're I'm going to yes. open. I'm yes, I'm going to open. Hi, I'm Kim Vitek. I'm with the Corps of Engineers, and I'm here wearing the programs and project management hat. And I wanted to respond uh, to your question earlier regarding um, how we budget. So for uh, the quick answer, uh, Gina already kind of mentioned it. For our um, South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program, we do typically have one budgeted line item for construction once we have an authorized project. So that was one of your questions initially. Um, and our budget process is two years long. So like right now, we're getting close to the end of our fiscal year, right? So we're in FY23. We just submitted our budget request for FY25. Yes. So two years out. We said, here's what we are gonna be doing. This is our need and our capability. And then at the same time, we are also justifying and defending what our budget request is for the very next fiscal year, which is FY24 coming up. And at the same time, we're also executing the current year, you know, money that we have in, in delivering. So um, one of the things that's unique about our program is that we have one, um, non-federal sponsor, the Water Management District, South Florida Water Management District. So we're 50-50 project uh, sponsors with them, and we share all the costs, 50-50, all the way from start to finish. So with that, we have a uh, much more flexibility within the program, which is why we have that one line item budget um, from Congress versus having to uh, budget for every single individual project. So once we have um, our line item uh, that we are appropriated for a given year, we have work that was already planned. Um, but as you know, that plan was made two years ago and things do shift. So we have a, a little bit of flexibility within our program um, based on need to be able to kind of reallocate within our program in a given year. So um, if something slips, something um, can get accelerated, we do have a little bit of flexibility to make some adjustments in our funding and move money around. Um, small dollars amounts for what's already been authorized. And we do do that. But for future work, we've been using um, SEPA as the primary example. That particular project actually had a very robust um, monitoring and adaptive management um, plan in the PIR. So um, when, that, when that report was approved, um, we had a total project cost, the 902 limit, which I think a couple of people have also hit on. So that 902 limit gives us flexibility because it's already taken into consideration some of the unknown risk factors that we're talking about here related to adaptive management. Um, and as Gina mentioned, it is updated regularly with inflation. So that number does grow a little bit as we go. And so for the stuff that we know that we've already planned for, we are going to plan for it two years out and we're gonna budget for it. So with the intent to execute the monitoring or what may um, already be built into it. Now, if something additional happens down the line, that's where there's been a little bit more discussion here. And Gina mentioned there's, you know, a little bit different interpretation, but we do have already existing guidance on what to do. If it is something small, like maybe we just want to do a little bit more monitoring, that could be something that we could adjust just within our uh, program allocation ability. However, if it's something larger, like a design change, we already have uh, processes in place to uh, do engineering reports, packers, and there's a variety of them. So based on what the scope of work of that change is, uh, we would then, assuming it was approved, whatever that was, we would then defer to the technical team on what type of uh, post authorization change report would be required. Not all of them require going to Congress. So it just depends on what it is. 
Um, and that would be developed through the technical teams to determine that. And that would also determine, um, you know, if NEPA would be required also, if a full uh, reformulation was required, if NEPA was gonna be impacted, and then we would plan accordingly. And generally, if it's something new, we would have to then forecast out in our budget planning and get approval for that. So it would not be an overnight change. So hopefully that covers some of the questions some of you guys have had. Marla? Thanks, Jim. Uh, it's, uh, maybe I'll just give voice to the question that's went on the list here, which is, um, are there opportunities for incorporating iTech into SERP? And then um, rephrasing the question that I've already asked, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing, but, um, but we have a job to do. You know, we are tasked with uh, assessing uh, inclusion of cultural resources and tribal interests. Um, and that's a relatively new task for us. And so we just need to know what documents do we need to be looking at? Who do we need to be talking about? And really appreciate your help on that while we have the benefit of your presence in the room today. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Craig van der Heiden. I work for the Miccosukee tribe. I think there aren't any documents and I think that's the problem. And to kind of preempt that, the Miccosukee have been collecting traditional ecological knowledge. Um, recently, we submitted a paper, a, a letter to the US Fish and Wildlife talking about some of the traditional ecological knowledge that describes how the water used to flow through the S12 A and B gates, before there were gates, right? How the water used to flow. The Miccosukee used to have a state reservation that occurred from 41 all the way down to Cape Sable and Everglades National Park. They existed throughout the landscape. And so they know how the water flowed. They know what brought the birds in. So Western science has caught up to that in a sense. There's been studies that have shown that with water flowing through Western Everglades National Park, it stimulates the prey base, most likely the Procambarus and Alani crayfish. Um, it also has to be a fishless area, so it does dry down but it's an area where there used to be sloughs and ridges because the Miccosukee used to canoe through that area. They used to go from island to island. And so I think we are trying to preempt what you guys are doing because there isn't any documentation on it. And so we're trying to provide guidance. There are certain things, as Kevin mentioned, that are culturally, we're not able to share. And so we do proxies. So, for example, when we're doing fire management, fire might stimulate the growth of a particular species of, of vegetation that is important to the Miccosukee. But we're not going to tell you what that plant is. We might just say, you know, um, wetland prairie, something like that. So we're not going to tell you exactly what's going on, but we will give guidance as it goes ahead. And I think a positive guidance that we did have is when Gina was doing SEP North and we're looking at the constructing of the, the hammocks. And um, she did approach the Miccosukee and we did give guidance on that. Thanks. Could I ask a follow-up question? Um, so while there may not be any current documentation of you know, active pursuit of this, um, there are definitely documents that are effectively authorizations to engage in this. Um, and places where it's it's flagged as something that's important and and it would be a valuable to the committee to to be able to look at those to to know what those are and um, to review them and so again if I could just ask for your help in identifying those I'd really appreciate that sure absolutely and and what I'd like to add is you know back in 1999 when the yellow book, the SERP um, environmental uh, impact statement was written, um, you know, Recover was specifically set up for 10 federal and state agencies and the two tribes to guide restoration. So although there may not be any formal documentation, um, we've been coordinating under the Recover umbrella since the implementation of SERP.
Hi, so I'm Laura Brandt with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I also am a member of the Recover Executive Committee, and I also have a few opinions about adaptive management, which are potentially three different hats. Um, but from the from your question about, I, I'm I'm not sure I'm quite getting it what you're looking for, but might be because the Department of T Interior now has a wash a, a memo from the, the White House saying thou shalt now think about these things that we didn't think about. So if that's the kind of stuff that you're looking for, we can help you track down those different pieces of things. And the bottom line is there's something at that higher level that's pretty general. And then each department and each agency has their own way to go forward with it. That's the short answer. So we can help you find where those things are because they're all in different places. Thank you. Okay. okay. Would greatly, we would greatly appreciate that. Okay. So um, we heard a little bit in the last uh, the last session about uh, ecological responses, and so while we have some of the ecology thinking folks up here, I want to ask this: um, We heard just a little bit about ecological responses and how that was being utilized in adaptive management. I wonder if you could offer your opinions on where you see. Uh, opportunities for ecological endpoints to be used more uh, in current science, like some of the things you talked about earlier, uh, Andrea, how that might be used in decision making in terms of future planning. And, and, I, and I'd really like to hear both low hanging fruit in terms of things that you, you know already exist and you'd love to see actually utilized for decision making, and then also maybe aspirational, like wouldn't it be great 10 years from now if we're at a point where we can be doing it? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we've got a pretty good set of indicators. There were, there was a lot of monitoring that was cut back around 2011, 2012, that it would be nice to, you know, be able to um, uh, re-include. So we've had a lot of cutbacks in the monitoring program design and in some places we're hurting because of that. Um, I think where I'd like to see things go is to develop better. Okay, so I'm the quantitative ecologist. I like reporting. So I want to see us connect the feedback loop so that we can very quickly turn around the monitoring information on the ecological side and the hydrological side into information that is useful to managers. Um, and as much as possible, start streamlining those reporting processes so that. Um, that our, our PIs, for example, are not having to recreate things for three different reports that are slightly different. I mean, that's annoying. Uh, so wanting to create, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, create the code to help the PIs so they can turn out the graphics and work on developing graphics that are as informative to the, the water managers and the different project managers as possible. Um, and, and there's a little bit of art to that as well. So, um, so connect, you know, smoothing out that connection of, of channeling that information back into decision-making and making the communication happen. Um, so funding, get, get the monitoring up to speed and, connect those feedback loops and so start developing more our tools that are useful to you know help I mean we got some of them already so you see it with the cave stable sea size sparrow everybody's looking at you know the percentage of the you know discontinuous hydro period and the in the in the different subpopulations we can calculate that every day um, there's other you know metrics that we we're starting to work on calculating every day uh, and and that way that information it makes it easy to get it in front of the water managers and help explain what the story is. Uh, so that's my two cents worth of other. <laughs> yeah, I think the reporting is important, but I think also looking at the system as a whole. I think too often in SEP and in SERP, we, we look at these, just these compartmentalized projects and we don't look at the whole. And sometimes we miss the forest for the trees in a sense. So I think that 
the managers and the people in charge should start looking at the whole and how modeling will integrate into another part. For example, Western Everglades restoration. It hasn't even started yet, but because it's not part of anything, none of that modeling gets, inf nothing infers the modeling from future projects or projects that are outside the realms of that particular entity. Can I jump in on a follow-up to what Andrea said and, and just ask what would you need to get to the point of more streamlined reporting? Is it just like developing a process that people can follow? I mean, COP has tried to forge some new ground in its biennial report, though it's not SERP, so someone has to embrace that and it may be incredibly labor intensive. Or is it a staffing issue? Is it money? Is it all of the above? Okay. If I was in charge of the world, which I am very <laughs> clearly not, and my boss is in the back there, uh, I would like to have you know a di data scientist that I could basically target uh, to you know sit down with the different PIs and help develop some of this reporting, and then we start experimenting with it and trying out different ways of presenting the data, putting it in front. I mean, we're already doing this to some extent, but everybody's overloaded. Um, so, Put it in front of the ecosystem-based management calls. Put it in front of the you know periodic scientist calls. What do people relate to? What do people you know say? Oh, I like that, but it would be better if you know. So having somebody who you know is really good at R coding or Python coding and can take this and take it to the next level and make it so that it's. So that the PIs, it, it becomes all, it, something that the PIs, um, the various different principal investigators could, you know, pull out of a library and very easily use. And so, for, for example, um, during uh, one of our, our recent workshops, it came up that, you know, DASIS dry down is, very, is actually at different water depths for a hydrologist versus a fish person, which is five centimeters, versus an alligator, which is more like, I think, 15, cent 15 centimeters or inches. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so if they have the code and they can just modify what that depth is, then they can rerun the same code and then correlate it to their data. But we just need to have you know somebody we could assign to doing that kind of task, as well as provide the direction on where to go first in order to start making this happen. My two cents worth, I'm not in charge of the world, so. So if I were in charge of the world. <laughs> now, uh, a lot of what Andrea said, but I would go back another step and I would think about it too in the context of what we had originally set up as a vision for what Recover would, would help to facilitate. But it goes back to a comment that was made about the monitoring. And this ties into adaptive management because in order to do adaptive management, you have to do monitoring. And you have to do enough monitoring to actually be able to answer the questions that you're trying to answer. And, and I don't think we're doing that right now. Um, in addition to that, you need to have the people that are thinking about what those questions are in a way that then you can then frame them so that they are the questions that are going to help you understand um, whether or not understanding that uncertainty would change your decision. So we talk about uncertainties, but we, we're not all talking about things in the same language. And some of that is because we're in different agencies and we have different guidance, as Gina pointed out, for what adaptive management is. Um, we're doing way better than we were doing before, so don't get me wrong on that. But we still have that communication of what adaptive management is and what it's not and is adaptively managing an operation schedule adaptive management and maybe in the context of SERP it is, but in other contexts it might not be. And But it's also the difference between the language of engineers and ecologists, because the level, what you mean by certainty is a whole lot different in, in those realms. And, and beyond that, there's the, if you're talking about cubic feet per second through a structure, that doesn't mean anything to an alligator. They want to know how much depth. And so I'm more like the alligator than the, than the looking through the structure. So it's working through some of those kinds of linguistic uncertainties that, that um, are, are challenges in our getting the data and 
synthesizing it and presenting it because we're looking at it in different ways. And we need the resources to be able to have people who can dedicate their time to doing that, not have it be another duties as assigned or simply a task. So it's in when Recover was originally thinking about how our modules would work, one of the things was we were, had these vis this vision of module teams where there was a coordinator of the module team. The module team would be made up of, of engineers and hydrologists and ecologists, and, and they would work together to synthetically look at the, the questions and analyze the data and, and pull it together. And um, so, yeah, if we, could, if we could get to that, then I think we'd be doing a whole lot it would be a lot easier to move some of this stuff forward. I'd like to add something too. I think it's important with the monitoring to consider traditional ecological knowledge as well, because that is on parity with Western science. And a good example, when I first started working with the Miccosukee, we had Hurricane Irma, all the tree islands were underwater. I went to the agencies and I said, tree islands are underwater, animals are dying, the vegetation's dying. They said, do you have data? I went back, I spoke to some of the elders and they said, these are the species of trees that used to be on here. We used to have a lot of turtles. We used to have a lot more snakes on the island. And they, it corresponds, the nesting season and the water coming up often corresponds. So there's no you know, cohorts, you know, progressive cohort survival. And I don't think we were heard. And so we started a, I started a, a research project, which we now have data for and a PhD student that's, that's working through it to show the data is comparable to what the traditional ecological knowledge said five years ago. So I think that's an important aspect to consider as we're moving forward. Okay, I think Dave's next, then John, and then Matt. Um, thank you. Um, SERP started 2000 identified adaptive management as a critical element of the process that was going to move forward. Um, probably took a couple of years to get actually get feet under to begin moving forward, et cetera. The initial focus, Gina told, told us that it was on planning, as it should be. You were planning projects, you were trying to implement projects, et cetera. A lot of those initial adaptive management programs were individual entities, project entities. So they were kind of scattered all over. Everybody was kind of doing their own thing. Recover kind of built a tent, built an umbrella, tried to assemble a lot of those together so you could have a consistency, perhaps some standardization of approach, that sort of thing. Um, the report that was released uh, here last year or this year um, identified that you addressed adaptive management super, superficially initially, looking at kind of the components of what makes out adaptive management. One of the charges that Stephanie has given us to look at, and we're going to talk about tomorrow, is do we need to dive into this issue a little bit more to help make it useful, to make it applicable, um, make it value added to the agencies, the tribes, the stakeholders, and everyone else who wants to see recovery of the Everglades occur? Probably not in my lifetime, but in a lifetime to be, to be determined. My, my question is, and so, and then Gina said, we're now shifting, we're pivoting towards operations. And I suspect it'll be a hybrid. It'll be adaptive management for projects still, and it'll be adaptive management for operational perspective. We've heard today from several of our presenters about climate change and some of the challenges that it is bringing to us, whether it's an extreme rainfall event, like you saw in April down here, whether it's the warming oceans that we're seeing right now, whether it's shifting dynamics of other ecosystem processes. But I guess my question to each of you is, of three federal agencies and, and the tribe, what I'm struggling with, and I see this across the country, is, is the adaptive management, the way we think about it now, conceptually, process-oriented, technically, is it robust enough to embrace the challenges of climate change? Or do we need to kind of step back at some point to be determined and reassess whether we need to relook at how we are prioritizing science, where we're doing it, how we're funding it? You know, what is, is there a logical point that we need to do this 
or are we, or should we not worry about it? It'll happen. Adaptive management will adapt to this. And I guess I'm just from an individual agency perspective, Laura, you're spot on with your comments. I would only add one more bucket to your group there. I would say there's cultural agency, cultural issues around adaptive management. It is different in the core, I tell you, than it is in the Fish and Wildlife, than it is in Parks, than it is in the Bureau of Rec, you know, or in EPA. They, they're different culturally. It's just agencies. It's what they are. So I'm just wondering, is, there, is this something we should be looking at in terms of climate change and adaptive management? And I guess I'd like to just go down the panel and see what your thoughts are. If there's not an issue, fine, great. One less thing for us to worry about and do. But if there is an opportunity that could help you do a better job in terms of managing the resources, maybe it's time we do talk tomorrow about putting some emphasis on this in this next review. I, I guess I'm just interested in your perspective. I prefer. <laughs> okay, so there was a lot in that question. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I'm going gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take one small part of it. Um, and I, I think the answer is, I think there are some things that we're able to handle through the adaptive management mm -hmm. process. And then there's other things as Jason Engel was talking about earlier and Tim Geisen, where, hey, we get to the lifetime of a, a, a project and we know we need changes. So the core has a process for that, right? So, you know, we started off with the original CNSF in 1948 and, you know, SERP has changed it. And now this new 216 study will change it. And then again, the resiliency study will change it. But I, I do think there are examples from around the country of a, adaptive management in which they are planning for climate change in which they're looking at something as the height of a weir, where you can have an adjustable weir, right? So it, you can plan for that full extent and you can adjust the weir as the, the water comes or if the water doesn't come. But there's always that balance that you have to reach between the cost for building that adaptation in um, versus you know the funding that you have available and what is the likelihood of, of that to occur. So I think in some instances, absolutely. Um, if you're looking more for the science of climate change informing future design decisions or where we should put our more robust measures, I think BBC is an excellent example of how the core has now um, and South Florida Water Management District are using those tools to, you know, as a feedback mechanism where there are performance measures that will be used to actually change the elevation in the model to for different alternatives in the future. So, um, you know, I think it's a, a mixed gamut of whether, I don't think it's a one size fits all solution, but I think you can be very forward thinking in your, um, in, in your writing, in your forecasting, because the core has a 50 year planning horizon, right? And so we need to plan for, you know, the life cycle of that project for the next 50 years. Um, so, Laura. Yeah, so, I mean, it kind of depends what you're meaning by adaptive management. <laughs> and also what would be the value of this committee looking into those questions compared to some of the other questions relative to adaptive management that might not be climate change and, and, and what would be the most value out of that. Um, from a Fish and Wildlife Service standpoint, absolutely we need to be considering climate change and we need to be thinking about it in the context that we can and say, are there things that we can do within our projects as we're planning them to make those into the adaptive management framework? Um, and I do think that looking at, you know, is the way BBC is approaching it, does that make sense? And so that might be something that could be a very concrete place where the committee could look at it and say, yes, this makes sense. Maybe this one, not so much. Maybe you could go that way. So in that more narrow framework of it, I think, I think that that um, is useful. Um, I, I think they, they've already hit on a lot of the key points. I mean, BBC, or we're, we're running up against this. Um, and already trying to make 
you know, recommendations of things like adjustable wares and, um, you know, how do you deal with, you know, is there any possibility of like staged implementation of some management measures, the need that we're going to have to change operations in the future as sea level rise comes up. Um, but I mean, in terms of, you know, uh, adaptive management, it, this is something I think the country's going to have to figure out because we're no longer in a static situation. We, and if we're planning for 50 years and we know that 50 years is going to change, then having an adaptive management plan that, you know, um, only deals with small stuff may not be sufficient. And how do we deal with that? From a recovery point of view at this point, I mean, we've had the project adaptive management plans, but then we also have this overarching umbrella of recover that's trying to pull in the science of this and, and, and see that it, it's being incorporated, you know, big picture. Um, whether, you know, we're effective or not, that's for you guys to evaluate, but um, we're trying. And, uh, Beyond that is also, you've got the Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. So if something is beyond SERP, it can be raised up to that next level and say, hey, we got this upcoming issue. Um, so the, that's very big picture adaptive management. But this is, this is uh, you put your finger on it, it's, it's gonna be an upcoming burning issue, I think around the country. And right now we're front and center with BBC here. And it's gonna, what do we learn in BBC is going to go into what's called the Southern Everglades study. Um, so, I don't want to forget Leslie, who's behind you. So, if Leslie, if you want to chime in. <laughs> um, no, sure. I don't have much more to add. You know, I completely agree with the what the rest of the panel said. Um, you know, BBC will be a good learning experience for us, and then you know, the challenge becomes how much flexibility we can really incorporate into the projects to be able to, you know, adapt to changing conditions. So I think that that might be the challenge on the future. Can I recap what I think I heard and maybe translate for some new people is that it seems like new information about climate can be used when planning new projects. Yes. Yeah. But now that you've planned and constructed projects, new information on climate is not very useful unless it, it's, it's within the operational levers Weeks. and the operational yeah. plan. So if you didn't build the adjustable weir, you're unlikely to go back and adjust the weir within the purview of SERP adaptive management. Is that fair? Or without, yeah, without, without some without kind of limit, like reevaluation yeah. report. Right. There would have to be, we'd have to go through the court process, as Kim explained. Yeah. yeah. Okay, John. So I guess I have a somewhat related question in thinking about uncertainties and how, how uncertainties are identified and addressed, and especially uncertainties that may come up in the middle of a project where you know, there's some new issue that you didn't think about. And uh, so just if you could talk about how, what's the process for identifying and prioritizing uncertainties uh, early? Well, I'll start and then you can correct me. Is that, so there's, there's different, there's, there's different levels at which uncertainties are identified and recover has an overarching adaptive management plan where there were a series of uncertainties that were developed at the quote system level. And those are in the process right now of being reviewed and and updated. And then when the projects are in the PIR stage, they're going through the process of identifying adaptive management uncertainties within that context. And that's where Gina also was talking about the interaction points between Recover and the project teams so that we're having that communication so that, that the teams know what the system-wide uncertainties are and then Recover knows what the project level uncertainties are. 
And I just want to add as part of that update in the uncertainties and the prioritization, um, there's also the effort to develop management options, um, active and passive management options to put in that management option matrix for those system level SERP uncertainties. So I, I think he asked a question also about like discovering new uncertainties. So it tapped into another question. So I'm going to jump in here. Um, to, to what, but to, what, what's the capability of adapting an adaptive management plan? <laughs> so like, you know, cause some of these projects are really long and you wrote this SEP adaptive management plan in 2014. And then maybe in 2024, you'll say, this really wasn't the key question. The key questions are X, Y, and Z. And is there a process for that? And, and it does seem like there's a lot of adaptive management that's happening outside of these plans. And if that's the case, how important are these plans? How central are they to the process of adaptive management versus just general new knowledge coming in? So, so first of all, for my my fish and wildlife service had in talking with folks in the service. And this was exactly one of the questions and the concerns that, that people had was the timing of when some of these projects, when we do the plan and we, and you know, like SEP was 2014 and now we're actually getting to it now in 20, whatever it is. So, so that is a, that is a concern and how do we deal with it? So, and then I'll let Gina and Kim answer the question about incorporating <laughs> new things into that from the core process. So the core process can pose somewhat of a challenge at certain, um, in, in certain instances, but we actually have guidance and I think I put it on my slide from the Engineer Research and Development Center. There is an adaptive management um, principles guide. Um, it talks about uh, changes to adaptive management. There are um, levels in which the adaptive management plan uh, changes to that can be improved. And, you know, again, as, as Amanda had said, adaptive management is supposed to be a living process, right? It's a living document. It's supposed to be updated in forms of new science. But in some instances, um, our procedures and approval chain is a little bit slower than, um, than we would like. Did you want to add anything? I'll, I'll just add to from from a tribal perspective, it's very difficult to get our opinion heard to have adaptive management. Um, the agencies have talk probably without us, I guess, in, in many instances. And so when we have an opinion on something, it's sometimes hard to get heard or it's never considered in that adaptive process. Not always, but sometimes. Okay, Matt, um, you have the last one. Two questions. <laughs> right, okay. So, <laughs> so in addition to talking about different agencies and different disciplines and different guidance and linguistic uncertainties and agency cultural differences, uh, we also have different reporting writing expectations for the different reporting mechanisms. And I'm not sure I'm seeing adaptive management interpretations being incorporated in all of those appropriate reporting mechanisms. So AMI and DPM results are reported in the SFER, uh, waiting bird reports on an annual basis, the system status reports on a five-year cycle. Sometimes they get into AM recommendations, sometimes they don't. The COP biannual report didn't get into AM sort of interpretations and discussions. So I think that's another potential difference and nuance that we need to sort of keep in mind. Uh, so my question, I guess, uh, is um, well, one of the ones that was prompted uh, uh, in the agenda, and I was curious if anybody here has actually had the chance to take a look at it. Um, so we've we've had an adaptive management program sort of ish for 20 years, right? So 10 years ago, a paper was published from South Florida scientist community about what we had learned in the first 10 years of adaptive management. Has anybody had the chance to look at that? Now that we're 10 years later and sort of figured out what would that list of lessons learned be? Well, 
So part of the challenge has been that we haven't had projects implemented and operational to actually try the things that are in a lot of cases. And I do think that some of the things like what they, was learned with DPM um, illustrate some of the challenges of going from the science to the decision-making. And what are the things that need to be considered there? And the being very clear about identifying things that are covered by NEPA, not covered by NEPA, would require different kind of processes and things like that. So, I mean, I think as we move into a realm where we're really trying to implement adaptive manage more actively, we'll have more lessons learned. But, and I don't know if it's really a lesson learned that it was going to be hard to make that loop between the science and the management. I mean, when we first started the adaptive manage stuff within Recover, we spent a lot of time having workshops. We had people from Meridian come in. We went through the whole thing of, you know, single loop and double loop learning. And we set out all of those documents in the whole ideal world of, well, one thing we learned is it was completely unrealistic to think that we were going to do assessment reports in two years. So, I, I mean, so those kinds of, of things, but we're not, I think we have the opportunity in the next eight years to, you know, really take a step on that. I think from that list of five things, to me, the thing that still stands out that needs work on is communication. Right. Yeah, I think communication is a, is a big, big issue that was then and still is now. I'm going to echo that. Um, I'm going to come at this from a cop perspective. I mean, what's been uh, so, you know, uh, lessons learned um, as part of COP, what we did do is we identified our uncertainties and we, as to which ones we agreed would be covered by this NEPA, which would require supplemental NEPA in order to address, and which were issues we wanted to keep in view because they were part of, for example, the SEP, you know, uncertainties, and people were just like, we want to, we, we don't want to drop them. We want to make sure that they stay in front of people. So we, we include them on the list, but they weren't going to necessarily be covered as part of top. And um, doing that division helped, um, but having those, those uh, ecosystem-based management feedback calls and watching the communication that is occurring between, you know, the, the agency scientists um, and uh, the uh, water managers and watching those recommendations be listened to, um, that's been really eye-opening. And it's something that at this point, you know, if we bring on new people, I want them sitting in on those calls so that they'll learn how the system is actually operating from both points of view. Um, we need to have more input from the, the tribes and have that, you know, part of the, the overall process. Um, but that's been part of my, my lessons learned with dealing with the waiting birds. It's been interesting to watch because, uh, and watching the water managers listen to the concerns of the ecologists and say, within the water control plan constraints, and these are people that they understand that if they change the, the, the size of a gate by four inches, it'll send water over here. I mean, they, they understand the system like crazy. And uh, they understand that they have that amount of flex in the water control plan. If they do that here, then that'll help add additional water over into Northern Water Conservation Area 3A. And so they, they understanding what the problem was they took it and, and they were able to flex the system and try and reduce the problem. They did not eliminate it. It's still a problem, but it probably would have been a lot worse. And so watching that communication occur was very uh, eye-opening. And then um, ultimately, you know, what we're trying to do is push this problem forward as part of the SEP increment one, you know, um, water control plan update evaluation and uh, see if it can also be addressed there. Um, so, but ultimately that communication, the communication between the ecologists, the water managers is gonna be, also need to be with the engineers, all of that's gonna be critical. I just wanna briefly add that 
although we've increased communication, I think many times we're still talking past each other because we have different uh, definitions that we're moving from. So one of the things uh, we recently learned uh, from a couple of different meetings in Recover is we need a standard list of definitions to put everyone on an equal playing field so that when we know that we're talking adaptive management, we're not talking about managing adaptively because I think we continue to talk past each other in that realm all the time. And because we have engineers, scientists, modelers, you know, project managers all in a room, we could all have the same conversation and everyone comes out with a different understanding. And so um, I, I think we have good communication now, but I still think we need to improve on not talking past each other. Fundamental. No. So do you have you have to provide you said the question was going to be quick. The answer was not. The answer. The answer is not. So. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. On, on, <laughs> on, on behalf of the committee, um, I want to express our gratitude um, for, your, for your thoughts and insights and, and the time you pres you've, you've devoted to this process. And also the people who have hung there for um, this long afternoon, um, we really appreciate your interest.